He pounded once more, trying for the same place. The hammer, slightly off target, nicked a half-moon of skull off the edge of the original hole, smacked up a quick spray of blood, and sank in deep. Roland left the hammer embedded. He slid himself backward to admire his work. Jason was seated on the floor with his back to the door, his legs stretched out, his arms hanging at his sides. His pants and the lower half of his shirt were sodden with blood. His head, streaming blood, hung forward, chin against his chest. He wore the hammer like a weird party hat. Though Jason didn't move, the amount of blood spilling out from under the hammer meant that he wasn't dead yet. Some folks don't die easy, Roland thought. The thought surprised him. After all, Jason was only his second victim, and Dana hadn't been a problem. But he knew there had been others, some who'd been very tough to kill. No big mystery, he told himself. The memories of the other kills had to be coming from his friend. Smiling, he rubbed the bulge on the back of his neck. He felt it throb. Small waves of pleasure tingled his spine. Get on with it, he thought. He skated closer to Jason. Hanging onto the doorknob, he squatted and slashed open Jason's throat. He stood up, tugged the hammer free, and jammed its handle under his belt. He closed his knife and pushed it into the leather case, but didn't bother to snap the case shut. Digging a hand into a front pocket of his jeans, he took out the handcuffs. Jason's weight was against the door. He tumbled onto his side when Roland opened it. Roland flipped off the light, stepped out, and shut the door. The soles of his feet were awash in blood. At first, every step he took had an added twist or slide, but with each step, traction returned. He stopped beneath the entryway to wait for his eyes to adjust to the darkness. As he stood there, he felt a few tentative beats of pleasure. They came from his friend. Hints of the maddening ecstasy it would blast through him just a few minutes from now. Licking his dry lips, he wondered why it hadn't given him a good zap for wasting Jason. He wondered. Then he knew. Jason had simply been in the way. An obstacle, not the real target. You just get a little boost for taking him out. The biggie is saved for when you deliver Celia. Makes perfect sense, he thought, and was rewarded with a small thrill. You don't know, he thought. Shit, maybe you do. This is just my thing. I've always wanted to pull this kind of stuff. Just never had the guts till you came along. I don't need your zaps to get a charge out of it. But the zaps are great. Oh, yes. And I'll get one soon. His heart was thudding, his mouth dry, his breath trembling, his penis growing hard. It was almost time. He could see a few things now. The vague shape of the card table with a few bottles and glasses on top, the long flat surface of the bar counter, and a corner of something dark, maybe Jason's blanket, caught in a spill of gray light from a window. He couldn't see Celia. She had to be there, asleep on the blanket. He couldn't hear Celia either, just his own heart and breathing. She's there, unless she heard us in the can, he thought. We didn't make much noise. Jason hardly made a sound. There hadn't been anything to hear, except maybe a couple of thuds. If she was good and plastered, she should have slept right through all that. Roland touched his knife case. The flap was loose. Beneath it, the brass butt of the knife handle felt gummy. He left the knife inside its case. He wouldn't be needing it for a while. He only needed the handcuffs. On the seat of his jeans, he wiped as much blood as possible off his hands. He held one bracelet in his right hand, letting the other dangle by its chain, 
and started forward. His bare feet snicked each time he lifted one off the floor. With each step, his heart pumped harder. His breath grew more raspy. Sweat stung his eyes and trickled down his sides. He walked with a slight stoop to ease the pressure of his erect penis against his jeans. He grinned. He felt so good, and he wasn't even getting any new surges from his friend. Those were yet to come. He halted at the foot of the blanket. He still couldn't see Celia. What if she's gone? Then he heard her. Long, slow breathing. Roland crouched. He reached out carefully until his hand met the blanket. He felt something through its softness, probably a leg, and realized that Celia must have covered herself after lying down. On his knees, Roland moved to her side. He searched with one hand for the edge of the blanket, found it, and lifted it. As he uncovered her, she mumbled something but didn't awaken. He could see her now, in spite of the darkness. She was naked, and enough light found her skin to give it a vague, dusky hue. She lay on her back. Her legs were slightly apart, bare except for darker wrappings at her knees. Her right arm, inches from Roland's knee, lay against her side. The wrapped elbow was slightly bent and her hand rested with curled fingers just above the jut of her hip bone. Her other arm was high, elbow pointing off to the side, hand beneath her head for a cushion. Roland stared at the small patch of darkness between her legs. She didn't have a bush like Dana. She must trim her hair down there, he thought. He gazed at her breasts. They were dim mounds tipped with darkness. They rose and fell slightly with her breathing. With his left hand, he reached forward and touched her left breast. Smooth, like velvet. The nipple, too. But the nipple seemed to squirm under his touch, rumpling and rising stiff. Celia's breathing changed. Hi there. What took you so long? Roland squeezed her breast, then took his hand away. Oh, God, he ached. The surges were growing, becoming waves that pounded through his body. He began to shake. Jason? Celia asked. Jason's not here. Jason? And Roland suddenly shrieked. Had some dying to do! He grabbed her wrist and snapped a cuff around it. In an instant, before Celia could begin to struggle or scream, he whipped the other cuff around his own left wrist. This audiobook has been broken into multiple parts to make the download faster. You have reached the end of a part, but not the end of the complete audiobook. So please check your library for the next part of this audiobook. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. Library for the next part of this audiobook. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. This is Audible. The following is a Dark Realms audio audiobook presentation of Flesh by Richard Lehman. Read by Maynard McKillen. Chapter 20 Allison woke up. There was sunlight on her bed. The warm breeze drifting through her open window smelled of flowers and grass. A raucous bird was squawking, as if annoyed by the pleasant chirping of its neighbors. The bells of a church, somewhere in the distance, pealed a tune. Allison imagined a congregation singing, In the Sweet By and By. Feeling good, she stretched beneath her sheet. Then she slipped the sheet aside and was surprised for a moment to see that she was wearing her new blue negligee. She had planned to save it for a special occasion. Maybe last night had counted as one, somehow. 
She remembered coming up to her attic room after playing Trivial Pursuit and watching the howling on television with Helen. Remembered sitting at her desk and staring at the snapshots of Evan pinned to her bulletin board, feeling empty and alone, wondering about him. He was probably making it with Tracy Moore Organ Morgan. The bastard. She had taken down all the photos and started to rip one into tiny pieces. The snapshot showed her holding Evan's hand. Celia had taken it two weeks ago, on the lawn behind Bennett Hall. Evan was wearing a T-shirt that bore the logo, Poets Do It With Rhythm. He had a silly look on his face because Celia, instead of telling them to say cheese, announced, Say, I'm a cunning linguist. By the time Allison had ripped the photo apart and watched its tiny bits float down into the wastebasket, she was in tears. She couldn't bear to destroy any more, so she had made a neat stack of the rest, put a rubber band around them, and dropped them into the top drawer of her desk. Hurting, she had taken off her clothes and opened her dresser. At first, she didn't care which nightgown she wore, but the new one, blue and glossy, caught her eye. There was no reason to save it, no one to save it for. She might as well enjoy it, so she put the negligee on, sighing as it slid over her skin. She wiped her eyes and gazed at her reflection in the mirror. Her breasts were plainly visible through the gauzy top. She shrugged so that one of the spaghetti straps slipped off her shoulder. Eat your heart out, Evan, she thought. You'd go ape if you ever saw me in this, but you never will. Tough luck, shithead. The memories brought back some of last night's pain. Stealing pleasure from the good feel of lying on the sunlit bed with a breeze sliding over her. Allison got up and went to the window. It looked beautiful out there. She needed to live, find a way to enjoy herself. Sundays had been fine before, Evan, and they could be fine again. This would be a great day for a long walk. Go to Jack in the Box for one of those crescent rolls with cheese, sausage, and egg inside. Forget about studying. Pick up a brand new paperback at the newsstand. A good, juicy thriller. Later on, head over to the quad with the book and a radio and spend a couple of hours lying in the sun. Or go to the park to sunbathe. Go down by the stream. You'd have privacy there. The quad was bound to be lively on a day like this. Would you rather be alone or have company and maybe meet someone? There'd be a lot of guys at the quad. Just decide when the time comes. Stretching, she walked back to the dresser. The negligee caressed her skin as she moved within it. A smile lit her face. What was that Hemingway story? A kid, probably Nick Adams. Went to bed at night feeling awful because he had broken up with his girlfriend. Saw her with another guy? The thing of it was the last line. He went to bed feeling rotten, and the next morning he was awake half an hour before he remembered that he had a broken heart. Nick Winston didn't know what he was talking about, dumping on Hemingway. Maybe drop by Wally's tonight. Maybe Nick'll be there. Do I really want to see him again? She peeled the negligee over her head, folded it neatly, and placed it in the dresser drawer. She rolled deodorant onto her armpits. A bath would be nice. Save it for this afternoon when you're finished sunbathing. She put on panties, went to the closet, and slipped a sleeveless yellow sundress over her head. Then she stepped into sandals. She took her shoulder bag from the dresser top and left her room. At the bottom of the attic stairs, she entered the bathroom. She used the toilet, washed, brushed her teeth, brushed her hair, and hurried out. She found Helen sitting cross-legged on the living room carpet, newspaper spread out in front of her, a box of powdered doughnuts on the lap of her rather tattered pink nightgown, and a mug of coffee on the floor near one knee. What ho! 
Helen greeted her, looking up. Morning. You're looking perky. Perk, perk. And how are you this fine morning? Fine, is it? God's in his heaven. All's right with the world. Yog, what's with you? A midnight visitor sneak into your room? No such luck. Helen lifted the box off her lap and held it toward Allison. Donut? Thanks anyway. I'm going to hike over to Jack in the Box and get a sausage crescent. Want to come along? Helen shook her head, her cheeks wobbling. Ah, uh, I don't think so. I'd have to get dressed. You could just throw on your rain gear. Har! Helen bit into a donut, crumbs and white powder falling onto the exposed tops of her breasts and down in between them. Seal you up yet? Helen shrugged. She chewed for a moment, then took a drink of coffee. Celia may or may not be up, but wherever she is or isn't up, it isn't here. She didn't come back? It would appear that she found a more suitable abode for the night. That bodes well for her, Allison said. Helen rolled her eyes upward. Spare me. She and Jason must have hit it off, Allison said. Not necessarily. They could have been in a traffic accident. Allison ignored the remark. I just hope it goes well. No doubt it turned into an orgy, Helen replied. No, I mean it. She likes to pretend she enjoys going through one guy after another, but she only got that way after Mark dumped her. Yeah, that's when she started screwing around. It'd be nice if she'd really get involved with someone. But a freshman? Helen asked. He must have something going for him, or she wouldn't have spent the night, Allison said. She almost never stays over with a guy. Helen grinned. Think they stayed in his dorm room with El Weirdo, Roland? Wouldn't that be the height of funsies? The height of vomitus, Allison said. Can you picture Roland hopping in, with them as bread and Celia as the meat? You're a very disturbed person, Helen. Think about it. I'm sure they didn't go to Jason's room. Not if that disgusting yuck was going to be there. They probably shacked up in a motel. Or maybe they just parked someplace. Or rolled out a sleeping bag in a field, she thought like Robert Jordan and Maria. The warm night would have made it perfect. When she gets back, I'm sure she'll tell us all about it, Helen said. She stuffed the remaining chunk of donut into her mouth and picked up the comics. See you later, Allison said. Helen nodded. Allison pulled open the front door. On the wooden landing stood a glass vase filled with yellow daffodils. An envelope was tucked into the flowers. She stared at the bright flowers, at the envelope. Frowning, she stroked her lips. They're probably not for me, she thought, but her heart was beating fast. Crouching, she lifted the envelope. Her name was written on it. Hands trembling, she tore open the envelope and pulled out the papers inside. They fluttered as she unfolded them. Three typed pages, signed at the end of the last page by Evan. Dear Allison, I am a loathsome scum, a worm, a maggot. You would be perfectly justified in spitting on this missive and flushing the flowers down the nearest toilet. If you are still reading, however, let me tell you that you certainly could not detest me more than I detest myself. There is no excuse for how I behaved on Friday night. It was childish and vile to show up at Gabby's with Tracy. What can I say? I was blinded by the pain of your rejection, and I desired to punish you. It was a foolish, contemptible gesture. Let me assure you, however, that the maneuver backfired. As much torment as I may have caused you, I caused myself more. Let me also make it clear that I have no interest in Tracy. The sole reason I invited her out was to rub her in your face, and, hopefully, 
to make you jealous. I do not care for her at all. Though you may find this difficult to believe, due to her well-deserved reputation and your opinion that I have nothing on my mind except sex, we did not indulge in any intimacies whatsoever. I even avoided a good night kiss when we parted. I spent last night alone in my apartment, wanting to be with you, but too ashamed to call or come over and see you. I thought about you constantly, remembering how you look and the sound of your voice and the way you laugh. I thought about the many good times we shared. And no, not just the sex, though I couldn't help thinking about that also especially how it feels when we are so sweetly joined, as if we are one. I even spent some time gazing at your photographs in the school yearbooks, but it was unbearable to look at frozen images of your face and know that I had possibly lost you forever. When I slept, I dreamed of you. I dreamed that you came into my room and sat down on the edge of my bed and took hold of my hand. In my dream... I began to weep and tell you that I was sorry. I said that I never meant to hurt you, that I loved you and would do anything for your forgiveness. You said nothing, but you bent down and kissed me. I woke up then, and I was never so sorry to wake up from any dream. My pillow was wet with tears. I realize that all this must sound maudlin, but I want you to know everything no matter how embarrassing it may seem in the light of day. Right now it is three in the morning. I got up, after that dream, and sat down at my typewriter to let you know how I feel. I am sure it is too much to hope for easy forgiveness. The dream was a fantasy, the wishful thinking of a tormented mind. I realize that my treatment of you was rash and abominable, and that you probably prefer never to see me again. I wouldn't blame you at all. If you wish to have nothing to do with me, I suppose I will learn to live with it. I suppose I will have no choice, short of shuffling off these mortal coils with a bare bodkin. Forget I said that. I don't believe I am that desperate. Though morbid thoughts along those lines have crossed my mind. Perhaps I won't deliver this to you. Perhaps I'll burn it. I don't know. I miss you, Allison. I wish that I could make everything right again, that I could turn time backward to Thursday afternoon when I started all this stupid, disgusting behavior. But life doesn't work that way. You can't just make bad things go away, no matter how much you may want to. There. I'm so distraught that I've ended my sentence with a preposition. Now I know that I'll burn this letter. I love you. I hope that you don't hate me. I am miserable without you, but it's all my own fault, and I know that I deserve the misery. If this is the end, it is the end. Have a good life, Allison. All my love, Evan. Allison's mind felt numb. She folded the letter, slipped it inside the envelope, and picked up the vase of daffodils. She carried it into the house nudging the door shut with her rump. What's the deal? Helen called. Allison shook her head. She didn't trust herself to speak. Her voice would shake and she might cry. Well, all right. Flowers. Told you he'd see the light. She ascended the stairs to her room, put the vase on her dresser, and sat on her bed. She pulled the pages out of the envelope and read them again. He wrote about a dream. This was like a dream. She almost couldn't believe that he had written such a letter. The anguish in it, the desperation, even a threat in the allusion to Hamlet of suicide, which he was quick to retract but which remained nonetheless. Allison told herself that she ought to be delighted. Isn't this what she had wanted? to have him repent and plead for her to take him back? But she wasn't delighted. The letter was almost disturbing. Could she mean that much to him? Did she want to mean that much to him? He sounded almost obsessed. Allison lay down on her bed and stared at the ceiling. Without realizing it, 
She was pressing the letter tightly to her belly. She kicked off a sandal, heard it thump, then kicked the other one free. She felt exhausted, as if she had just come back from a long walk. She took a deep breath. Her lungs seemed to tremble as she exhaled. You wanted him back, didn't you? Well, he's yours, if you want him. The ball is in your court now. Hmm. Evan's probably sitting in his apartment, staring at the telephone, wondering if you sneered when you read his message, or if you wept, and very possibly thinking he had been a fool to open himself up that way. It's cruel to make him wait. I should go downstairs right now and call him, or walk over to his apartment. Make it like his dream. Don't say anything when he opens the door. Just kiss him. Don't make it that easy on him. Maybe I don't want to go back to him at all. What should I do? Maybe pretend I didn't get the flowers and note. Go along as if nothing happened. Allison lay there, almost paralyzed by conflicting emotions. She was stunned, confused, hopeful, but a little bit frightened. She pulled the pillow down over her face. The dark was nice. The soft pillow felt good. Later, she thought, I'll do something about it later. Chapter 21 Roland couldn't understand. He had taken off the handcuffs that bound him to Celia before pushing her down the cellar stairs, and he hadn't put them back on. She was beyond struggling, and he needed both hands free. It didn't make sense. He knew that he hadn't reattached these handcuffs. Had she done it? No. Uh-uh. She's dead. Then how did... He felt a tingle of fear. As he dug into a pocket to get the key, he wondered vaguely why he was wearing clothes at all. Hadn't he left them upstairs? His pocket was empty. The key was missing. Don't worry. You'll find it. You've got to find it. Fighting panic, he searched every pocket. The key was gone. This can't be happening to me, he thought. Fortunately, he had turned on the overhead light before following Celia into the cellar. The bulb cast only a dim yellow glow, but it should be enough. Getting to his knees, he scanned the concrete floor. He and Celia's corpse were islands, stranded in a pool of blood. Could the key be hidden by the blood? He began to sweep his free hand through the wet layer. Out of a corner of his eye, he thought he saw Celia grin. No. He looked directly at her. She was scalped, her skull caved in, and brain gone, don't forget that. Her eyes shut, her face a mask of blood, and she was grinning. Her eyelids slid up. You're dead, he shrieked. Her jaw dropped, her tongue lolled out. The handcuff key lay near the end of her tongue. He reached for it. Celia's teeth snapped shut on his fingers. Crying out in agony, he jerked his hand back. The stumps of three severed fingers spouted blood. In horror, he watched her chew his fingers. The cellar suddenly went dark. He heard the stairway creak. Who's there? he yelled. No answer came but Roland knew who was there. He knew. He began to whimper. Leave me alone! Go away! In a mocking sing-song, a voice in the darkness chanted, I don't think so! Dana's voice. You are going to die now! sang Jason. The voices came from high on the cellar stairs, but something grabbed the front of Roland's shirt, Celia's hand, and tugged. He toppled forward, onto her, her legs locked around him, her hands. Why wasn't one of them cuffed to him anymore? Clutched his hair and forced his face down, down against her face. 
She pressed his mouth against her mouth. She huffed. Into Roland's mouth gushed the mush and splintered bones of his half-masticated fingers. He started to choke. And he woke up, gasping for air. For a moment, he thought he must still be in his dream. But the bulb still glowed from the cellar's ceiling. He wasn't on top of Celia's body. He was sprawled on the concrete floor beside it. Quickly, he lifted his trembling hands. Neither was cuffed, and he still had all his fingers. He glanced toward the cellar stairs. Nobody there. Of course not. Just a nightmare. As Roland sat up, his bare back peeled off the floor. But he didn't see the handcuffs. In a flash, he saw them upstairs with his clothes. Groaning, he struggled to his feet. His body felt tight and chilled. His muscles were sore. Why had he allowed himself to fall asleep down here? Had he slept all night? No. I've only been asleep for an hour or two. There's still plenty of time to sneak away under cover of darkness. He climbed the cellar stairs as quickly as his stiff muscles permitted, and then opened the door. The brightness of day stung his eyes. He cowered, shielding his face. Sickened, he saw himself shrivel and crumble to dust like a vampire. He wanted to turn away from the light, rush down into the comforting gloom of the cellar. But the warmth felt good. As he stood hunched in the doorway, the deep chill was drawn out of his body. As the chill diminished, so did his panic. Major fuck-up. Not the end of the world, though. Consider it a challenge. Right. He looked down at himself. His naked body was crimson and flecked with gore. A challenge. He was no longer cold, but he felt shivery inside, as if he might start to cry. If anybody sees me like this, I'll figure out something. Oh God, how could I have fallen asleep? How could I have slept till morning? He rubbed his sticky face, let out a trembling sigh, and stepped to the kitchen's bat-wing doors. He peered over them. He listened. Satisfied that he was alone in the restaurant, he pushed open the doors. Near the front, along with the stepladder, vacuum cleaner, toolbox, and cans of cleaning fluids, he found several rags and old towels. Two of the towels seemed reasonably clean. He took them with him. He stepped to a window and looked out. His heart gave a sick lurch when he saw the car in the parking lot. No need to worry. It was Jason's car. He turned away from the window. His shirt, pants, and handcuffs were on the floor near the rumpled blanket. Celia's neatly folded gown lay on top of the bar counter. Roland picked up his T-shirt. It was one of his favorites, orange, bearing the slogan, Trust Me, below a colorful, monstrous face. It was stiff with dried blood. He was about to throw it down when an idea came to him. Why not wear his bloody clothes? He could probably walk right up to his dorm room in them. With his reputation, anyone seeing him would just assume it was another gag. But he might be seen on the way back to campus. Townies didn't know about his reputation for bizarre behavior. Muttering, Shit, he threw the shirt down. He knew that he could wash the blood from his hair and body, no problem there, but he needed clothes. Jason's, he knew, were even worse off than his. Only Celia's gown was bloodless. No way. Talk about conspicuous. If he'd had any brains, he would have stripped before he opened up Jason. He felt trapped. There must be a way out. Think. Where there is a problem, there is a solution. There has to be. Problem. I can't leave here in bloody clothes. I can't leave here naked. 
I can't wear Celia's gown. Why is it a problem? Because if I'm seen by the wrong people, I might get arrested. Solution? Obvious. Don't get seen. Stay here. Until, say, three o'clock in the morning. Somebody might come. Like that guy yesterday. Roland shuddered. That guy yesterday. That guy knew. Roland had been inside the restaurant no more than ten minutes when he heard a car and rushed out to the window. Out of the car stepped a man in boots and leather clothes, a man wearing a gun on his belt and carrying a machete. The sight of him sent an icy surge down Roland's spine. Memories filled his mind of other men, in other times, dressed in protective garments and carrying sharp weapons, axes, scythes, sabers, long-bladed knives, other men who knew, just as this one did. Confused and terrified, Roland had fled out the rear door. He hid in the tall grass behind the restaurant. Lying there, he had waited until his panic subsided. Then he had crept through the field, keeping low, working his way around the restaurant until he could see the parking lot. Who was this man? A Cortez. What the hell is a Cortez? Roland wondered and his mind suddenly reeled with images of carnage. Bearded soldiers with swords and battle axes, slaughtering Indians beneath a blood-red sky. In the background he saw a stepped pyramid. As quickly as the images had come, they were gone. That Cortez, my God. He remembered reading an article in National Geographic a few years ago. His parents had a subscription, and he always used to look through the magazines for bare-breasted women. But this article had caught his attention. The Aztecs, he read, offered the hearts of their victims as sacrifices to the sun god. They also ate the captured warriors. The greatest delicacy was the brain, and it always went to the high priests. The writer of the article theorized that primitive cultures, such as the Aztecs, turned to cannibalism because they required protein but had no cattle. He was wrong, Roland realized, and grinned. Boy, was he wrong. The Aztecs had friends up their necks. And Cortez, with his conquistadors, hacked them to pieces. So that's why this guy who went into the restaurant with the machete is a Cortez. One who knows, and therefore threatens the existence of my friend. And me. Lying in the field, Roland understood why he feared this man so much. The man should be killed, but he felt no urge to attempt it. Better to remain hidden. When the man finally left, Roland re-entered the restaurant. He descended the cellar stairs. Behind the stairway, he found a gooey smear on the concrete floor and trembled with rage and sorrow at what the Cortez had done. I'll get him, he thought. No, he's too dangerous. Better to get far away from one who knows. Leave town, but not tonight. Stay tonight for Celia. What about her girlfriend? Yes, that one too. We'll see. She would be worth a little risk. He remembered how she had looked when he saw her at the mall. That lovely, innocent face. That jumpsuit with the zipper down the front. The way the fabric hugged the mounds of her breasts. His friend gave him a quick surge of pleasure. Roland came out of his reverie and found himself standing over the blanket and bloody clothes. His penis was stiff, but it shrank quickly as he once again confronted his plight. If he stayed here to wait for dark, he would be risking a return of the Cortez. I must survive, he told himself. 
he spread out the blanket, tossed his T-shirt, jeans, and Celia's gown into the center, rolled it up, and carried it into the restroom. The air in there was heavy with odors of blood and feces. He shook open the blanket, letting the clothes fall, and then spread it over Jason's corpse. The sink had a mirror above it. Except for pale skin around his eyes, as if he had worn goggles last night, Roland's face was painted with dried blood that had turned a shade of red-brown. Locks of hair were glued to his forehead. A bit of something clung to one eyebrow. He picked it off, but it clung to his finger. He flicked it with his thumbnail. It stuck to the wall under the mirror. He turned on the faucet, bent over the sink, and began to clean himself, using one of the towels as a washcloth. He didn't like the noise of the splashing water. It deafened him to other sounds. A car could drive into the parking lot. Someone could sneak up behind him. He shut the water off. As he listened, he straightened enough to see himself in the mirror. His face and neck were clean. He turned on the faucet again and resumed washing himself, this time standing back from the sink, flooding the towel with warm water and slapping it against himself. The water spilled down his body, sluicing off blood. He rubbed his skin vigorously, wrung out a pink residue, wetted the towel again and repeated the process. Soon, he was standing in a shallow pool of water and blood, but the front of his body was almost spotless. He turned off the faucet, listened, fought an urge to venture into the bar area for a glance out a front window, and turned the water on again. He began the task of washing his back. This was more difficult. Restaurants ought to have showers for occasions like this. A crooked grin crept over his face. When he supposed that he must have rinsed away most of the blood, he splashed across the floor until he was standing by the restroom door. There he looked over his shoulder. He was far enough from the mirror to see his back all the way down past his rump. The green-yellow bruise ran down his spine and angled across his right buttock, but he saw no blood. He used the other towel to dry himself. Now that he was clean and dry, he was very careful not to slip on the tiles. He skated slowly along as he worked at his few remaining chores. He spent a few minutes at the sink washing his knife and handcuffs. He retrieved his shoes and socks from the space behind the toilet and carried them, along with the knife and cuffs, to the restroom door. Opening the door, he tossed everything onto the hardwood floor outside. Next, he crouched beside Jason's covered body, flung the blanket aside, and took the car keys from a pocket of Jason's trousers. His hand got bloody again, doing it, and he sighed. He found Jason's wallet in a rear pocket, removed the student ID, and the driver's license with its phony birth date. Rifling the wallet to make sure that nothing remained in it to identify its owner, he flushed the cards down a toilet. He picked up his jeans. The day before, in his dorm room, he had removed everything from his pockets that might identify him. He remembered the Skid Row Slasher. The idiot was caught when he lost his wallet, driver's license and all, on a hillside while fleeing a break-in. Roland took the handcuff key from the right front pocket and suddenly froze. Hmm, these jeans don't look that bad. They were wet from lying on the floor. They were matted with blood, but they were blue jeans. He spent a while at the sink, scrubbing them with hot water and wringing them out. When he shook them open, he found the stains not especially noticeable. Leaning against a wall by the door, he cleaned his feet. He stepped into the damp, clinging jeans and pulled them up. You're in business. A warm, sunny day like this? Nobody would think twice about seeing a guy shirtless and nobody except the Cortez would react to the bruise up his back. 
Roland put on his shoes and socks. He folded his knife shut and pushed it into the case on his belt. He stuffed Jason's car keys, the handcuffs, and their key into a front pocket of his jeans. All set. Wait. He had left the spray can of oil in the restroom, behind the toilet. It would have his fingerprints. Fuck it, he thought. I've already got my shoes on. I'm not going back in there. His prints were probably all over the restaurant. Big deal. The area in front of the bar looked okay. There were some smears on the floor, but no large pools of blood. He picked up the empty champagne bottle and set it on the card table. Was he forgetting anything? Probably. Who cares? They won't begin to suspect me until they identify the bodies. By then, I'll be on the road. Roland shut the door behind him, saw Jason's car, and went back into the restaurant. He walked quickly around the corner to the dining area, crouched before the toolbox, and lifted its lid. There were several screwdrivers inside. He took out the largest and went outside again. It took only a few minutes to remove both license plates from Jason's car. He took them to the edge of the parking lot and sailed them into the weeds. Then he returned to Jason's car. He opened the trunk, looked inside, and shut it. He opened a back door and looked along the seat and floor. Fine. He got in. Sitting in the sun had warmed the car's interior. On the floor in front of the passenger seat was Celia's purse. In it he found her wallet. Rather than taking time to search it, he stuffed the entire wallet into a back pocket of his jeans. He found her keychain and pushed it into another pocket. Then he inspected the rest of the purse's contents, making sure that nothing remained to identify its owner. Leaning forward and to his right, he searched the car's glove compartment. The registration slip was in Jason's name, so he put it into his pocket. That appeared to be it. Jason's car was now stripped of everything that might lead to a quick identification of its owner, or of last night's passenger. Roland drove away from the Oakwood Inn. Yesterday afternoon, he had parked Dana's VW Bug on a residential street and hiked the final mile or more to the restaurant. Now he drove back to the place where he had left her car. It was still there, along a lengthy stretch of curb between two expensive-looking ranch-style houses. Across the street, an oriental man wearing a pith helmet was rolling a power mower down a couple of boards leading from the tail of his battered pickup truck. Otherwise, the neighborhood looked deserted. Roland turned down a side road and parked near the far corner. He stuffed Celia's purse under the front seat. Then he pushed down all the lock buttons and got out. He strolled back to Dana's car. It was unlocked, just as he had left it. Feeling around beneath the driver's seat, he found Dana's keys. The engine turned over without any trouble, and he drove away. You did it. You pulled it off. He let out a deep sigh, rolled down the window and rested his elbow on the sill. The warm air came in, caressing him. He liked this neighborhood. Finding himself in no hurry to return to campus, he drove the peaceful streets. The homes along here must cost a pile, he thought. Inside, they were probably nicer than any he had ever known. Not now, but someday, I'll take care of a family and spend a few days in a really nice house, like one of these. Do it over a holiday, when the father won't be expected at work, and the kids don't have any school. Really live it up. Up ahead, a girl stood at a corner. A real beauty, no older than four or five. Her blonde hair, blowing in the breeze, looked almost white. 
She wore a pink blouse and a lime green skirt that reached only halfway down to her knees. A mini mouse purse hung from her shoulder. Even though Roland had a stop sign, the girl waited without attempting to cross in front of him. She was alone. Roland felt a pulse along his spine. Slowing the car as he neared the stop sign, he looked all around. He saw nobody, just the girl. No, this is crazy. Take her back to the oak wood. It's too risky. But he was breathless and aching, and he suddenly didn't care about the risk. He steered closer to the curb, stopped, and rolled down his window. The girl's eyes widened. They were very blue. Hi, Roland called to her. I'm sorry to bother you. I'll bet your parents told you to never talk to strangers, but I'm lost. Do you know where Latham Road is? The girl frowned as if thinking very hard. Then she raised her right arm. In her hand was a small dingy doll. It looked like it might be a kitten. She shook the kitten toward the east. That way, I'm pretty sure, she said. What's your kitty's name? he asked. Clo. He's cute. Clo's a she. I had a kitty named Celia. Celia had beautiful green eyes. What color are Clo's eyes? Blue. Would you let me pet her? Well, I'm feeling awfully sad. Cause my kitty, Celia, got run over yesterday. The girl's face clouded. Did she get killed? I'm afraid so. Was she all mooshed? Yeah, it was awful. I'm sorry. I'd feel a whole lot better if you'd let me pet Clue. Just for a second, okay? Well... Please, pretty please, with sugar? She shrugged her small shoulders. Oh, beautiful, young and tender. Roland's spine pulsed with need. Chapter 22 Jake, driving his patrol car along the streets of Clinton, felt helpless. This was getting him nowhere. Earlier, he had taken the vodka bottle to headquarters, dusted it for prints, lifted some good latents with cellophane tape, and mounted them on a card. He had then spent a while comparing the prints with those of juveniles and the few college students in the department's files. He had expected no match, and he had found none. Nothing to do then, except spin his wheels and wait. The creature and its human host had either gone off seeking greener pastures elsewhere, or they were still in the area and would strike again. So it came down to waiting for a missing person report, or for a body to be found. By then it would be too late for someone. But we might get lucky. Jake hated the waiting. He wanted to do something. But what? Where do you start when you've got nothing to go on? The Oakwood Inn In spite of the warmth inside his patrol car, Jake felt a chill on the back of his neck. No reason to go back out there. You searched the place thoroughly yesterday. The thing left its eggs. Yeah, but... Yeah, but... Face it, Corey. You know you ought to be out there. Should have been there all last night, staking the place out. You just let Barney talk you out of it because that place scares you shitless. There's nothing to find out there. Sure, keep telling yourself that. You're doing nothing now but wasting time. The thing left its eggs in that place. Maybe it'll go back to them. I don't want to. Besides, I'm not dressed for it, and I haven't got the machete. That's no excuse. The thing isn't slithering around. It's in someone. Probably. There's no point. It won't be there. 
If it won't be there, what are you scared of? Even as Jake argued with himself, he was circling the block. He returned to Central Avenue, turned left, and headed in the direction of Latham Road. Okay, he thought. I'll check the place. Won't accomplish anything, but at least I'll have done it and I can stop condemning myself. He started to drive past the campus. A lot of students were out. Some strolled the walkways, others sat on benches beneath the trees, reading or talking. A couple of guys were tossing a frisbee around. Quite a few coeds were sprawled on blankets or towels, sunbathing in bikinis and other skimpy outfits. Jake pulled to the curb and stopped. Hardly a back among the whole bunch, males and females alike, that wasn't bare. Through the broad gap between Bennett Hall and Langley Hall, he could see into the campus quad area. Even more students were gathered there, most of the men shirtless, nearly all of the women in swimming outfits or halter tops. Jake considered leaving his car and wandering among the students. Sure thing, he thought, in uniform. Go home and change into your swimming trunks. Then you could blend in. Check them out. Ask a few questions. It didn't seem like a bad idea. Anything to avoid going out to the oak wood? Whoever has the telltale bulge up his, or her, spine won't be showing it off. Maybe not, but that narrows the field. He'll be one of the few wearing a shirt, if he's out here at all. You'd have nothing to lose by conducting a little field investigation. You're procrastinating. Move it. Jake sighed. He checked his side mirror, then swung away from the curb. I'll come back in my trunks, he decided, as soon as I've checked out the damn restaurant. Nothing better to do, and who knows, I might learn something. When he turned onto Latham Road, he began to tremble. His heart quickened. The steering wheel became slick in his sweaty grip. He wished Chuck was with him. Some company would be nice, and his partner's banter always had a way of keeping the mood from getting too heavy. Why did Barney reassign Chuck? What difference would it make anyway, if one more person knew what was going down? Why the hell can't Barney be riding with me? Who does he think I am, the lone fucking ranger? Calm down. Try to think about something pleasant. Like what? Like Kimmy. And how you were cheated out of being with her yesterday? Great. Pleasant thoughts. You had to work yesterday anyway. After today, four days until Friday, and she'll be with you. Four days. Seems like forever. And what if all this crap is still going on? We're letting it all out of the bag on Tuesday. After that, it won't be on my shoulders anymore. Anything still going on by Friday, someone else can handle it. Jake glanced right as he drove past Cardiff Lane. On the way back, maybe he would make a detour past the house. Not much chance of seeing her, though. If she was outside, she'd be in the backyard, behind the redwood fence. Maybe I could drop in. Barbara hates surprise visits, but she shouldn't begrudge me this one. After all, I gave up my rightful time yesterday so Kimmy could be there for her birthday. Maybe give Kimmy a ride. Not much traffic along here. Let her turn on the siren and the lights. She would love that. Tell her, don't turn on that siren. She'd get that look on her face and reach for the switch. Jake's smile and good feelings faded as he spotted the sign for the Oakwood Inn. He turned on to the narrow road. Kimmy, he thought, would like this road with its rises and dips. If he took it fast, the car would drop out from under them after each crest, and she'd experience what she called fluffies in her stomach. This was one road she'd never know about. Not a chance. At the top of a rise, Jake saw the restaurant and felt something similar to a fluffy himself, 
a sinking sensation in his stomach, but there was nothing fun here and now. This one made him feel sick and didn't go away. It got worse as he drove closer to the restaurant. The parking area was deserted. What did you expect? A frat party? He had hoped, he realized, to find at least one car on the lot. The car belonging to the guy, or maybe girl, who had the thing up his back. Go in and maybe find him down in the cellar, kneeling over the smear of demolished eggs. Just a faint hope. He hadn't actually expected that kind of luck. He stopped his car close to the porch stairs. He wiped his sweaty hands on the legs of his trousers. He stared at the front door. Nobody's here. What's the point of going in? To see if anything has changed since yesterday. Maybe someone was inside after you left. Jake rubbed a sleeve across his lips. You made it this far. Don't chicken out now. Take a quick look around and get out. He tried to swallow. His throat seemed to stick shut. At least go in and get a drink. You can use the kitchen faucet. He saw Peggy Smeltzer sprawled headless on the kitchen floor, Ronald tearing the flesh from her belly. He saw the way the skin seemed to stretch as Ronald raised his head. Just do it. He levered open the driver's door and swung his left leg out. As he started to rise from the seat, the car radio hissed and crackled. Sharon, the dispatcher, said in her flat voice, Unit 2, Unit 2. He picked up his mic and thumbed the speaker button. Unit 2. Call in. 10-4. Jake jammed the mic onto its hook. The Oakwood has a phone, he remembered but he'd tried to use it Thursday night and it hadn't been connected. It wouldn't be working now. Too bad, he muttered. He shifted to reverse and shot his car backward away from the restaurant. He had passed a gas station about two miles back on Latham. It had a payphone. He swung his car around and sped out of the lot, feeling as if he'd been reprieved, but tense now with a new concern. The message from headquarters could only mean one thing, a new development. Any other matter was to be handled by Danny in Unit 1. He floored the accelerator. The car surged over the road, flying off the rises. Some real fluffies for you, honey. And hitting the pavement hard on the downslopes. You're flying, he thought, flying away from that damned place. But toward what? maybe toward something worse. A car ahead. He gained on it quickly and raced past it. Seconds later, Jake spotted the service station. He slapped a front pocket of his uniform trousers to make sure he had change. Coins jangled. Of course he had change. He'd made sure before leaving home, knowing that he would need to phone Barney if he got a call-in message. The procedure seemed excessive to Jake but Barney had insisted that, for the sake of keeping a tight lid on the matter, the car radio was not to be used. For some reason, Jake had expected to get through the day without needing the coins. I was wrong, he thought. Well, the timing was good. Shit. Someone probably turned up dead, and all you care about is getting saved from having to go in the Oakwood Inn again. He swerved across the opposing lane cut sharply onto the station's raised pavement, and stomped on the brake. The car lurched to a stop beside the pair of public phones. He killed the siren, rammed the shift lever to park, and threw open the door. He fished a quarter from his pocket as he ran to the phones. The phone on the right had a scribbled, Out of Order note taped to its box. He muttered, Shit. He grabbed the handset of the other phone and listened. A tone came out, indicating this phone was operational. Because of the tremor in his hand, he knew he would have trouble poking the quarter into the coin slot. So he jammed the coin to the metal plate and skidded it sideways, pressing its edge hard against flat surface until it dropped in. The sound of a ding came through the earpiece. 
He dialed as fast as he could. The phone didn't finish its first ring before Barney answered. Jake, it might be nothing. I don't want you jumping to conclusions. Barney didn't sound right. His voice seemed stiff and tightly under control, and he wasn't pronouncing his words like a thug. This is bad, Jake thought. Very bad. I don't want to hear this. Barbara phoned in. She's concerned about Kimmy. Apparently, Kimmy has been missing since about 1,300 hours. Jake looked at his wristwatch. For a moment, he had no idea why he was looking at it. Then he realized that he wanted to know what time it was. 2.35. Kimmy had been missing for... Jake? He didn't answer. Kimmy had been gone for... 1300 was one o'clock, right? She probably just wandered off, Barney said. You know, kids, there's no reason to think this has anything to do with... the other matter. Jake? Yeah, I'm on my way. Keep me posted. Jake hung up. In a numb haze, he returned to the patrol car. He started to drive. Kimmy. She's all right. She has to be all right. Just wandered off. Maybe got lost. He saw Ronald Smeltzer in that dark kitchen, down on his knees, teeth ripping flesh from the belly. But it wasn't Smeltzer's wife. It was Kimmy, shrieking, No! He blasted the man dead. She's all right. Nobody got her. She just took a walk or something. Gone more than an hour and a half. He saw Harold Standish open the door, playfully stick up his hands and say, Don't shoot! Jake shoved his piece against Harold's forehead and blew out the fucker's brains. Barbara came running. She wore the blue silk kimono. She cried out, It's not our fault! Three bullets crashed through her chest. Then Jake stuck the barrel into his mouth and pulled the trigger. That's how it's gonna play, assholes. Better calm down. Fuck that! You bastards! Why weren't you watching her? He swung onto the driveway behind B.B.'s toy, resisting an urge to slam into it. Then he was out of the car, striding toward the front door. His right hand was tight on the walnut grip of his Smith & Wesson 38. He unsnapped the safety strap on his holster. What am I doing? He pulled his hand away and clenched it in a fist. The door of the house opened before he could ring the bell. Barbara, pale and red-eyed, threw herself against him and wrapped her arms around him. He pushed her away. She looked surprised. Hurt. Accusing. Okay, how'd it happen? Barbara shook her head. I don't know. Her voice was whiny. She was sitting on the front step. We'd come back from brunch. At the lobster shanty. And she was pouting all the way home because I wouldn't let her have ice cream. She'd already had chocolate cake. I didn't want her to make herself sick. Don't look at me that way. Sorry. Jake muttered, glaring at her. He wasn't sorry. He wanted to grab the front of her blouse and smash her against the door jam. Ice cream. Kimmy wanted ice cream, and Barbara had to play boss mommy and tell her no, and now she's gone. Barbara sniffed. She backhanded a slick away from under her nose. So Kimmy was pouting, and she plonked herself down on the stoop and said she wouldn't come in. So I left her there. I mean, you know how she gets. What was I supposed to do, drag her in by the ears? So I left her. I figured she'd come in in a couple of minutes. But then when she didn't, I came out to get her and she was gone. I'm sorry, all right? We can put that on her tombstone. Mommy wouldn't let me have ice cream. You shit! she cried out. She swung at Jake, fingers curled to claw his face. He caught her wrist and clamped it tightly. When he saw her other hand flashing toward him, he gave her wrist a quick twist and she dropped backward, 
Her rump hit the marble floor. Clutching her face, she rolled onto her side and curled up. Jake stepped inside, kicked shut the door, and stood over her. Where's that dickhead you married? He's looking for Kimmy. Jake stared down at her. She was sobbing so hard that her whole body shook. I hope you're happy. Wasn't enough for you to run out on me. You had to... Did you want her dead? Is that it? I'm sure she was in the way a lot, always underfoot. Well, now maybe you won't have to put up with her anymore. You'll like that. Barbara curled up more tightly. Why don't you just kick her a few times? Jake thought. He suddenly felt sick. What am I doing? Kimmy's out there, and maybe she'll be okay if I get to her in time. And I'm standing here, tormenting this woman I used to love. He felt as if a terrible blackness had cleared away from his mind. He put a hand on Barbara's bare shoulder. She flinched. Hey, I'm sorry. She kept on sobbing. You couldn't have known. I know you love Kimmy. I know you'd never do anything to hurt her. I'll, I'll kill myself, she gasped. Kimmy will be all right. She was upset. She probably decided to run away from home. You know, kids. Jake realized he was echoing Barney's empty platitude. Maybe she went to a friend's house. Barbara shook her head. We, no, we called everyone. She'll be all right. I'll find her. I promise. You think someone took her? That was exactly what he thought. Someone took Kimmy. Someone with a beast up his back. Let's not jump to conclusions. I'm sure Kimmy's fine. Did you check everywhere in the house? She might have come in when you weren't looking and... Everywhere. Her room. Closets. Everywhere. Barbara rolled onto her back. She wiped her wet cheeks with open hands, then let her arms flop to the floor. She stared at the ceiling. She was no longer sobbing, but she was struggling to breathe. Her green blouse had come untucked in front. Her short skirt was twisted around her thighs. She looked as if she had been the victim of a recent assault, except that she wasn't bruised and bloody. Not where you can see it, Jake thought. He took hold of her hand and gently squeezed it. She glanced at him, then quickly shifted her eyes away. We looked all around for her. I walked around to all the neighbors. Nobody saw her. Harold went out in his car. She used her other hand to wipe her eyes again. I kept thinking he'd come back any minute with Kimmy. I kept praying. But he came back without her. That's when I called the police. Barney talked to me. He, he was very nice. I always thought he was such a jerk, but he was very nice. What was Kimmy wearing? A short-sleeved blouse. Pink. A green skirt. Pink socks and, and black shoes. And, uh, that necklace you gave her. The one with the snap-together beads. And she had Clue. And her Minnie Mouse purse. She kept Clue in the purse while we ate, and she snuck some pieces of cracker into the purse. For... for Clue. Barbara's voice trembled. She... she looks... so beautiful. I'll be right back. In the living room, he placed a call to headquarters. Barney said that he had already contacted all the off-duty officers. They were on the way to help in the search. Jake gave him a description of Kimmy. We're all pulling for you, Barney told him. Jake said thanks and hung up. Barbara was still on the floor of the foyer, but now she was sitting up, knees raised, arms wrapped around her shins. Jake crouched beside her. In a few minutes, the whole department will be out looking for her. We'll find her. Don't worry, okay? She answered with a bleak nod. I'll bring her back to you. She lowered her forehead against her knees. Chapter 23
Allison became more nervous as she approached home. She had hoped that Evan would show up while she was sunbathing on the grassy quad and save her from the necessity of calling him. It would have been so much easier that way. Naturally, he hadn't put in an appearance. He'd probably spent the whole afternoon in his apartment, waiting for his phone to ring. I've got to call him right away, Allison thought as she climbed the outside stairway. The longer I put it off, the worse it will be. When her foot made the top step, she looked up and found the front door standing open. She stepped inside and took off her sunglasses. A horror movie was playing on the TV. In it, a teenage girl was running through the woods, being chased by a maniac. Helen was asleep on the sofa, wearing only a white bra and panties. The panties were so old that the fabric had torn away from the elastic waistband at one hip, showing a crescent of skin that looked like raw dough. Allison walked over to the TV and turned it off. Hey, what are you doing? I thought you were asleep. Just resting my eyes. Allison turned it back on again and stepped out of the way. The door was wide open. Good thing I'm the one who came in, and not some nut off the street, she said. Had to get some breeze. In case you didn't notice, it's hotter than a hooker's twat in here. And he calls. You mean lover boy? Nope, he didn't call. I suspect that's intended to be your move. No doubt, she said, the knot in her stomach growing tighter. Celia back yet? Guess she can't get enough of that freshman meat. Did she call or anything? Nope, Allison frowned. I hope she's all right. She must be raw by now. This is a long time to be gone. Maybe it's love. Didn't you want that for her? Sure, Allison said. Any minute she'll come limping in. So, you gonna give Evan a buzz or what? I think I'll get cleaned up first. Keep putting it off. He'll forget who you are. Oh, I don't think so. With a smile, Allison turned away. She went up to her room, grabbed her robe, and trotted down the stairs again. In the bathroom, she hung her robe on the door and took off the oversized shirt she had worn as a cover-up. Her bikini was damp with perspiration and stained by suntan oil. She thought she might want to wear it again before laundry day, so she left it on when she stepped into the shower. The hot, pelting spray invigorated her. She turned slowly beneath it. As her bikini became wet, the thin fabric clung to her. She liked the way it hugged her breasts, groin, and rump, so she left it on while she shampooed her hair. With sudsy hands, she rubbed the bikini to clean it. Tonight, the hands on me will be Evans, she thought. What happened to celibacy? We'll see. If you go at it with him, you'll be back where you started. You'll never find out if there's anything more. I'll try to hold off. Rinsing the shampoo from her hair, Allison thought, it's like going to a party where you know there's going to be drinking. You have to make up your mind, before you start out, that you won't get drunk. If you just go unprepared, it sneaks up on you. One drink leads to another, and before long, you're blotto. Or before long, as the case may be, you're naked and he's slipping it into you, which might not be all that bad. Allison untied the wet cords of the bikini top and peeled the clinging fabric off her breasts. She held it up close to the nozzle. The spray caught it and tugged at it. After a few moments, she turned away from the nozzle, wrung out the excess water, and draped the swimsuit top over the curtain rod. She had never even thought about sunburn, but without her bikini top, she now noticed that her skin had a light pink hue, a glow that seemed almost sprayed on. But where the top had covered her, the skin was bleached. Real cute, she thought.
boobs like bugging eyes. I don't think Evan will complain. Evan ain't gonna see them, is he? You'd better decide. Later. If I try to decide now, it won't bode well for abstinence. She untied the cords at each hip. The triangle of fabric in front was so small that the weight of the side ties, swollen with water, was enough to pull it down. Reaching around, she plucked the seat away from her buttocks, and the garment came away. She rinsed it, wrung it out, and hung it on the rod beside her top. Allison picked up a slick bar of soap and began to lather her body. If you see Evan tonight, he'll expect you to come across, she thought. Nice phrase, come across. Too bad you're not here right now, Evan. There wouldn't be much of a fight. Hell, there wouldn't be any fight. You might be the wrong guy, but you do in a pinch. Just catch me any time after I've been lying out in the sun for a while. Maybe the sun is an aphrodisiac. Or maybe it's the feel or smell of the oil. Or maybe it's just that you're lying there, nearly naked, and the sun is hot on your bare skin, and you can feel it through your bikini, and sometimes a breeze comes along, caressing you. I ought to write a paper on it for Dr. Blaine next time he asks for a descriptive passage. Give the guy a hard-on. He'd put it in me if I gave him half a chance. Horniest prof I've ever seen. Let's not disparage horny. But let's get over it before we make the big call to Evan. How's about the old cold shower trick? Thanks. I'd much prefer to stay horny. But the house was hot. If she didn't force herself to undergo the torment of a cold shower, the sweat would pop out as soon as she had dried herself. Laughing a little, Allison turned off the hot water. The spray became cool, then chilly. She clenched her teeth. She felt goosebumps rise on her skin. She stood rigid with her back to the cold shower, buttocks flexed tight, her fists pressing her cheeks. After a while, the cold deluge didn't feel so bad on her back. She turned around and shuddered. Finally, she lowered her head into the spray. She felt as if someone had dumped a pitcher of ice water on her. When she stepped out, the towel felt wonderful. She hugged it, savoring the warmth and softness. As she started to dry her hair, a knock on the door made her flinch. Telephone, Helen called. Allison felt as if her breath had been knocked out. Who is it? It's Helen, who do you think? Very funny. Who's on the phone? Three guesses. Oh, Jesus, she muttered. Wrong. One down, two guesses to go. Tell him I'll be right there. I could tell him you'll call back. No. Allison threw the towel over her head and ran to the door. She jerked the robe off its hook and put it on. The velour clung to her wet body. Helen stepped out of the way as she hurried into the hall. Slow down. I'm sure he isn't going to hang up on you. Using the damp towel, Allison rubbed her hair as she darted across the living room. She hunched over and swept it up and down her legs as she neared the phone. Breathing hard, she picked up the handset. Hello? Hi. Allison heard tension and weariness. It was a side of Evan she had never seen. How are you doing? she asked, trying to keep her own voice calm, in spite of the tremor she felt inside. Water drops ran down the back of her legs. She sat down in a chair. Her robe blotted some of the trickles. I'm okay, I guess. I was planning to call you in about five minutes. Allison said. The flowers are lovely. I'm glad you like them. She tried to think of what to say about the letter. Her mind seemed hazy. She rubbed her wet thighs with the towel. Helen came in from the corridor, 
grinned and made an O sign with her thumb and forefinger, then went into her room and shut the door. The silence stretched out. Hmm, I've got to say something about his letter, Allison thought. I suppose you read my... apology. Yeah. What do you think? She felt as if the air were being squeezed from her lungs. Arching her back, she managed one deep breath. I don't know. I was such a jerk. About everything. I should have respected your viewpoint. I was just... hurt and confused. But that's no excuse. There is no excuse. Temporary insanity? she offered. Faint laughter came from the handset. I'll come over, if you want. Allison could hardly believe she had said that. There had been no decision, at least, not a conscious one. Really? He sounded alive again. Tonight? What time? Allison asked. Oh, God, Allison, I can't believe it. We'll see how it goes, she said. Uh, it'll go great. I, I promise. How about five? Okay, five. I'll make us something terrific for dinner. I'll pick up some champagne. It'll be great. You're incredible. Did you know that? I don't want any hassles, though, okay? We'll just have a friendly dinner and talk and see how it goes. I've missed you so much. Her throat tightened. I've missed you, too. A lot. See you at five. Would you like me to pick you up? No, thanks anyway. I think I'll walk over. I need to stop by Baxter Hall on the way. The freshman dorm? I just need to talk to someone. Don't worry, I haven't thrown you over for a freshman. Or for anyone else. Well, that's good to know. Not that I'd blame you after the way I treated you. No more apologies, all right? Let's just start out, from right now, with a clean slate. All that other stuff is water under the bridge, or over the dam, or wherever the hell the water is supposed to go. Like down your chest, she thought, and slid the towel over her wet neck and breasts. That's fine with me, Evan said. Okay. See you in a while. If you can make it over sooner than five, that'd be fine. We'll see. Take it easy, Al, he said. Yeah, you too. She hung up the phone, leaned back in the chair, and pulled her robe shut. A moment later, Helen's door opened. Did you catch all that? Allison asked. Catch what? Helen asked. So, what's the verdict? I'm going over for dinner tonight. Well, say hey. Score one for love and true romance. I don't know about that, but I'm going. What was that about Baxter Hall? You were listening. No. Who? Me? I, I couldn't help catching a word here and there. You think Celia's over at Baxter? I don't know. But maybe someone knows what's up. Gonna drop in on Roland? Allison wrinkled her nose. He's Jason's roomie. If anyone knows where they are, he should. That'll be loads of fun. Yeah, fun like the dry heaves. You could phone instead, Helen said. The next best thing to being there. It's on the way. Helen lowered her bushy eyebrows. You don't think anything's wrong, do you? I'm starting to get a little worried, aren't you? Celia's a big girl. She's been gone a long time. You want me to go with you? Moral support? You'd have to get dressed. Neither of them smiled. It's all right. I can handle it, Allison said. Well, don't let him get you alone. Stay out of the room. Yeah, I'll keep that in mind. She pushed herself up from the chair. I'd better get a move on. Allison ascended the creaky stairs to her room in the attic. Sitting at her desk, she pulled open the drawer and took out the photographs of Evan. We used to have great times together, she thought, looking at the pictures. 
Maybe it isn't over. Maybe this will be a new start, and everything will be wonderful from now on. Let's hope so. But don't count on it. She pinned each photo onto her bulletin board and stared at them. In one, he was holding her hand. In another, they were kissing. In a third, they were seated on a blanket on the grass beneath an oak tree. Evan looked very pleased with himself. Though the photo didn't show it, Allison remembered that his right hand was inside the rear of her shorts and panties, pressed tight against her rump. Soon after, they had gone to his apartment and made love on the living room floor. It was the only time they ever did it with Allison on top. She sat astride him, leaning forward and bracing herself up with stiff arms, Evan fondling and squeezing and sucking her breasts as she squirmed on him, impaled. The memory of it sent a warm shimmer through Allison. You have to get through tonight without any of that, she told herself, even if it's only tonight. One night without sex, no matter how much you might want it. Sex is like the knot that's been holding us together. I've got to untie it, just once, just to see whether we come apart, just to see if there's another knot in the rope that binds us to each other, a knot like love. Chapter 24 Jake drove past the elementary school where Kimmy would be attending kindergarten next fall if... Don't think it, he warned himself. To die before she even... Stop! He rubbed his forehead. He felt so damn tired. If only he could somehow make all this go away. When they'd met briefly at headquarters to organize the search, the other six men had all been full of assurances but their eyes gave them away. They expected the worst, and except for Barney, they didn't even know the true scope of the danger. Jake saw a blonde girl on a swing at the school playground. His heart lurched. He hit the brake. From a distance, the girl looked a lot like Kimmy. A man stood behind the swing, pushing her. She wore blue jeans and a white T-shirt. Kimmy was supposed to be dressed in a pink blouse and a green skirt, but Jake remembered a news story about a girl who disappeared in a shopping mall. Her mother alerted security. The mall exits were immediately sealed, and the girl was recognized by her mother when the abductors tried to take her past the guards. Only she no longer looked like a girl. After grabbing her, the two men had rushed her into a restroom thrown away her dress, put her into jeans and a boy's shirt, cut her hair short, and put a ball cap on her head. The guy pushing the girl on the swing is her father, Jake thought. Maybe, maybe not. She was about Kimmy's size, with pale skin and hair that looked almost white. The man pushed her higher and higher. When she flew forward, her hair streamed behind her. When she swung back, it blew across her face. Fighting a tremor in his foot, Jake kept a light pressure on the brake. His police car was crawling forward. He squinted at the girl and this man, his body at once electrified, brimming with hope, desperate. Don't kid yourself, he muttered. At the intersection ahead, he made a slow U-turn. Now the swing set was just ahead, beyond the sidewalk and behind a chain-link fence. Jake could only see the girl from the back. Please. He drove past the swings. Looking over his shoulder, he saw the girl surge forward, down and up. As the hair blew away from her face, Jake's hopes fell apart. He sped away. Okay. It wasn't Kimmy but I'll find her. I will, or one of us will. Including Harold and Barney, eight men were searching for her. One of us... Where are you, honey? Where? Jake was at least a mile away from the house. Surely she wouldn't have wandered this far, but he had been up and down every street and alley, 
working his way outward in an ever-widening circle. A long time has gone by. She certainly could have come this far. He turned into an alley. Near the far end, a red pinto was pulling over to the side. A lanky man in a plaid shirt climbed out. His hand went to his face, and he tugged on his long nose. The man was far away and out of uniform, but the nose pull gave him away. Mike Nelson. Of course, Jake thought. I'm in Mike's sector. Mike didn't see the approach of Jake's cruiser. Jake watched him yank the lid off of a trash can. He bent down, peered in, then snapped the lid back in place. Stepping over to an adjacent can, he repeated his movements. Jake groaned. Hugging his belly, he pushed his forehead hard against the upper rim of the steering wheel. He couldn't stop groaning. He raised his head a few inches and pounded it down on the wheel. Then he did it again. Chapter 25 Roland snapped his checkbook shut. At the start of the semester, his parents had given him $350, in addition to the cost of tuition, room, and board. Whatever was left after buying textbooks could be used for incidentals, such as entertainment, extra food, clothing. Knives and handcuffs, he thought, grinning. And so on. He had one forty-two fifty-five left in the account. In the morning, he would withdraw it from the bank and use it for escape money. It didn't seem like a whole lot. Roland got up from the chair, stepped over to Jason's desk, and sat down. He found Jason's checkbook in the top drawer. He flipped through the check stubs until he found the last total Jason had entered, then worked his way forward, subtracting the approximate amounts of the several checks Jason had written since then. It looked as if Jason had close to $400 left in the account. A goodly sum. Roland would have to practice Jason's signature. You dumb shit. You flushed his driver's license down the toilet at the Oakwood. Remember? Not only that, you didn't even take whatever cash he had in his wallet. He wondered if Celia had any money in her purse. He had left her purse in Jason's car. Go back and get it? No. Too risky. Bending down, he pulled open the bottom drawer of Jason's desk. He lifted the penthouse and hustler magazines, removed the envelope containing the snapshots of Dana, why not take them along as a souvenir, and searched under a few more magazines until he found Jason's roll. The money was folded in half and fastened into a packet with rubber bands. He took it out. Though its thickness was encouraging, he discovered that most of the bills were ones. Still, the total came to eighty-seven dollars. He carried the money and the envelope over to his desk and stuffed the bills into his wallet. On the corner of his desk stood a framed eight-by-ten photograph of himself. He'd had it blown up from the negative of a picture taken at Halloween. It was a great shot showing him wrapped in a vampire cape that he'd rented for the occasion. His plastic fangs were bared. His mouth and chin were smeared with blood. Roland patted the envelope of Polaroids and grinned as an idea came to him. He slipped his photo out of its frame. He removed the Polaroids of Dana from the envelope. Then he took scissors and glue from his drawer. He snipped Dana apart. A fine, fine way to while away the time, he thought. He glued pieces of her to the vampire photo. Soon, his leering face was surrounded by floating body parts. A work of art, he thought when he was done. I ought to name it. I'll call it Private Dreams. He grinned, enjoying the pun. As he picked up the scraps, someone knocked on his door. Roland's heart kicked. Quickly, he slipped his new collage into a desk drawer. Who is it? he asked. Allison Sanders, 
I'm Celia Jamerson's roommate. Just a second, he called. His pulse beat fast. Celia's roommate, one of the girls who'd been with her at the mall. What if this is the great-looking one who'd been wearing that jumpsuit? Quickly, he grabbed his jeans and put them on. Crouching, he closed the suitcase on the floor and pushed it under his bed. He rushed to the closet, took out a sport shirt, and slipped into it. With trembling fingers, he fastened a couple of buttons before opening the door. It was the jumpsuit girl, and she looked even better than Roland remembered. She must have been out in the sun. Her face had a glow that made the white of her eyes and teeth striking. Wow, Roland thought. Even in the shadows of the corridor, her hair shone like gold. She wore a short-sleeved blouse, powder blue. It was buttoned close to her throat, and it was, he noticed, sheer. Through it he could faintly see the contours and lace of her bra. Pockets covered each breast. The blouse was neatly tucked into the waist of billowy white shorts with rolled cuffs midway down her thighs. She wore knee socks that matched her blue blouse and bright white athletic shoes. In one hand, she held the strap of a leather purse. The purse swayed, brushing the side of her calf. Why don't you take a picture? It lasts longer, she said. Cal Tabor chose that moment to walk past. He laughed at Allison's remark, looked over his shoulder and said, You bite, Rolades. Roland flipped him a finger. Real cute, Allison muttered. Sorry, some of these guys are such pigs. You want to come in? No, I was just passing by. Do you know where Celia and Jason are? Try the Oakwood Inn, he thought. Frowning, he shook his head. I don't know. The last I saw of Jason, he was taking off from here to pick her up. He planned to take her to the lobster shanty. Has he called you or anything? No. He wondered if Allison always wore her blouses buttoned that high. He imagined slicing off each button with his knife and spreading open the blouse. Allison's eyes narrowed. Mind reader? Roland wondered. So you don't have any idea where they might be? She asked. Well, not really. Maybe. I don't want you thinking I'm a snoop, but don't worry about what I think. Well, yesterday afternoon I saw a note on Jason's desk. Two telephone numbers. He wasn't around, and I was a little curious. So I called each number. You know, just for the hell of it. One of them was for the lobster shanty. When I called the other number, I got the registration desk of a motel in Marlow. A motel? What name was it? Roland frowned. The, uh... He shook his head. Geez, what was it? I really can't remember. It'll probably come to me later. Anyway, I guess Jason was thinking about taking her there. Why all the way to Marlow? You'd have to ask Jason. I don't have any idea. He did take an overnight bag with him when he left. It still seems pretty strange that they'd be gone this long. Roland smiled. They must be having a good time. Allison didn't look amused. I'm sure there's no reason to be worried. They'll probably be back pretty soon. Unless they decide to stay over another night. Yeah, Allison muttered. From the look on her face, she wasn't convinced. Shit, Roland thought. I should have told her Jason had phoned and said they'd be staying over. I could call her later and tell her that. But would she believe me? It doesn't matter. Allison won't be with us long enough to cause any trouble. I wouldn't worry, Roland said. Unless they don't get back by tomorrow morning. Jason has a ten o'clock class. I'm sure he'll be back in time for that. Allison nodded. You're sure you can't remember the name of the motel? I might remember it later. 
I could call you. Okay. I probably won't be there, but you can leave the message with Helen. Do you have something to write down my number? Uh, it's in the student directory, right? Yeah. And so is the address. I'll call if I remember. Thanks. She turned away. Roland watched her walk down the corridor, the loose fabric of her white shorts pulling lightly across her buttocks with every stride. She began to twist around for a glance over her shoulder, so he stepped back and closed the door. He rushed over to his bed and stepped into his shoes. Seconds later, he had them tied. He felt under his hanging shirt front and touched the knife case on his belt, then patted a pocket to make sure he had his room key. By the time he opened his door again, Allison was out of sight. He pulled the door shut and raced down the hall. He bounded down the stairs. Slow down, jerk off! Todd Brewster warned as Roland dodged him and his girlfriend on the landing. What a dip, he heard the girl say. Three steps from the bottom, he leaped. Through the glass doors ahead, he saw Allison outside. She was on the walkway alongside the dorm's north wing. Roland waited in the lobby until she disappeared around the corner. Then he followed. He stayed a distance behind Allison as she headed through the center of the campus. She took the walkway along the western side of the quad. Some guys were playing touch football on the lawn. In spite of the late hour, several girls were scattered about, most of them wearing bikinis, some reading, others apparently asleep, some talking in small groups, a few watching the football game. Here and there, couples were sprawled on blankets. One couple was tangled in an embrace. One girl, alone near the walkway, had her top unfastened and was braced up on her elbows engrossed in a book. Roland slowed down to stare at the pale, exposed side of her breast. He felt a stir of arousal. I wonder who she is, he thought. Forget it. You've got other plans for tonight. And you're hitting the road as soon as you're done. No time for this one, even if you did know who she is. Things are getting too hot around here. If you really wanted to play it safe, you'd leave right now and forget about Allison. Oh, I can't do that. No way. Allison first, then I'll take off. Though it's a pity to leave all this behind. Don't let it worry you. The world is full of delicious young flesh. At the far end of the quad, Allison turned to the left and made her way through the shaded area between the Doheny Hall and the Gunderson Memorial Theater. She walked directly to the street, and then she crossed. Roland watched from behind a tree until Allison rounded the corner of the block. Then he rushed to the other side of the street. When he reached the corner, Allison was no more than twenty yards ahead. If she turned around now... He quickly backstepped and ducked behind the shrubbery bordering the lawn of the Alpha Phi sorority house. He waited for a few minutes, then peered around the bushes. Allison had stopped midway down the block. She was gazing at something high and off to the side. She raised the strap of her purse onto her shoulder. Her back arched, and she seemed to take a deep breath. She touched the top button of her blouse. Her hand dropped to the bottom of the blouse and felt around as if to make sure she was tucked in. Then she left the sidewalk. Roland hurried forward. He spotted her. She was inside the courtyard of an old apartment building. Ivy vines covered walls of rust-colored brick. As he watched her, she climbed a flight of stairs to a balcony that ran along the upper story. She walked past two doors and stopped at number three. After a pause, Allison backed away from the door and leaned on the wrought iron handrail. She lowered her head. For a while, she didn't move. Then, stepping away from the railing, she lifted an arm and twisted around as if trying to see the back of her shorts. 
She wiped her seat briskly a couple of times. Finally, she stepped to the door and knocked. A man opened the door. He was bigger than Allison, probably six feet tall at least. He wore slacks and a clinging knit shirt. Even from this distance, Roland could see that he was powerfully built. He had a flat belly, a big chest, pecs, a thick neck, and bulging upper arms. This was not a guy to mess with. The man backed out of sight, and Allison entered the apartment. The door swung shut. Now what? Roland wondered. Go up now and take on both of them? Don't be stupid. Wait till she comes out and nail her while she's walking home. No, if the guy is any kind of gentleman, he'll walk her home. Besides, I want her inside somewhere, so I won't have to worry about intrusions. I'll want a long time alone with her. Go back to the dorm and look her up in the directory. Yeah. Roland rubbed his sweaty, trembling hands on his shirt. Hurry home, Allison, he whispered. Then he hurried away. Chapter 26 Jake saw a blonde girl on a tricycle behind the chain-link gate at the end of a house's driveway. She wore a white blouse. Kimmy? He could only see her back. What would she be doing here, riding a trike? Maybe this is a friend's house. Barbara said she'd phoned all of... The right front of the patrol car tipped upward. Jake forced his eye away from the girl. He jammed the brake pedal down, but not in time. And the car slammed into the trunk of an oak tree. His body lurched. The safety harness locked, caught him across the shoulder and chest, and threw him back against his seat. The girl, hearing the crash, looked over her shoulder. She wasn't Kimmy. Smoke or steam began rolling out from under the hood. Jake turned off the engine. He released the harness latch. Trembling, he opened the door and got out to see what had happened. He shook his head. He couldn't believe it. Watching the girl, he'd let the car turn. The right front tire had climbed a driveway approach, and he'd smacked into a tree on the grassy stretch between the curb and the sidewalk. He staggered to the front of the car. It was hissing. The white cloud pouring through the caved-in grill and around the edges of the hood smelled wet and rubbery. He didn't need to open the hood to know what had happened. He'd ruptured the radiator. Dropping onto the driver's seat, he reached for the radio mic. Twenty minutes later, he was climbing out of another squad car in front of his own home. Hey, Jake. Grab some rest before you start looking again, Danny suggested. Sure. Jake swung the door shut. The cruiser pulled away. He walked up the driveway toward his car, digging into a pocket for his keys. He felt exhausted and sick to his stomach. His head throbbed. He needed badly to urinate. On wobbly legs, he turned away from the driveway and crossed his lawn to the front door. He let himself in. Though it was dusk outside, the house was dark. He turned on a light in the living room. After using the toilet, he swallowed three aspirin. He rubbed the back of his stiff neck. In the medicine cabinet mirror, he looked as bad as he felt. His hair was must. His red eyes seemed strangely vacant. His face had a grayish pallor. Under his arms, his uniform blouse was stained with sweat. He washed his face, then went to his bedroom. He started to take off his damp clothes. You thought it was bad yesterday. You thought searching the oakwood was bad. You didn't know the meaning of bad. He peeled off his wet socks and underwear and left them on the floor. He took fresh ones from his dresser, knew he would probably fall if he tried to step into them, sat down on his bed, put on the fresh underwear, then the socks. Groaning, he stood up again. He went to the closet for a clean shirt. He slipped it on, tried to button it, and gave up. He took a pair of brown corduroy pants off their hanger and carried them to the bed. 
Sitting down, he pulled them up his legs. Yesterday was nothing. He thought, yesterday it was your goddamn imagination working overtime. He remembered checking under his bed for the snake thing and almost blasting Cookie Monster. Me want cookie! His eyes burned, and tears blurred his vision. He turned his head to the nightstand where he had placed Cookie, after coming so close to putting a bullet between its bobbly eyes. The doll was gone. Jake knew he'd left it there. His eyes quickly scanned the carpet around the nightstand. Then he was on his feet, all the weariness and pain washed away by a cleansing surge of hope on his feet and pulling up his pants and rushing from his room and across the hall and hitting the light switch and finding Cookie Monster on Kimmy's bed, snug against Kimmy's neck, held there by her tiny hand. Then Jake was on his knees, his arm across her hot back, his face resting against her shoulder. Barbara, she's here, and she's fine. Oh, my God! For a long time, Barbara said nothing more. Jake listened to her weeping. Finally, she found enough control to ask, Where is she? Here, at my house. Where did you find her? Right here. I came back to the car and... That's impossible. It's miles. A little more than three, I guess. Oh, damn you! Why didn't you look there first? I thought about it. I just, it seemed, it, it's so far. I didn't even think she'd know the way, much less walk that far. I still can hardly believe it. But she's here. Do you have any idea the hell I've been going through? It's over now. She's safe. Let me talk to her. She's asleep. Wake her up, goddammit! In a while. Now! Calm down. I have to call headquarters and get the search called off. Then I'll wake her up. She's probably starving. I'll get her something to eat and bring her over to you in an hour or so. Have a drink or something. Get a hold of yourself. I don't want you all hysterical when she shows up. Hysterical? Who's hysterical? I had her dead in a ditch somewhere, and all the time she's off paying a fucking surprise visit to her fucking daddy? I have to call headquarters, he repeated. We'll be along in a while. Then he hung up. He called the station to cancel the search. Then he returned to Kimmy's side. She was still sleeping. Jake knelt beside her and stroked her head. Her hair was damp. He put a hand on her back. Her skin was very hot through the fabric of her blouse. She snored softly. Jake tickled the rim of her ear. Without waking up, she rubbed the itch with Cookie Monster's furry blue head. He smiled. Earlier, he'd fallen completely apart. Fortunately, she had slept through all that. Hell, the kid could sleep through almost anything. He put a hand on her shoulder and gently shook her. Honey, wake up, he said. He shook her again. Hello? Anybody home? Kimmy? She moaned and rolled onto her side, her back to Jake. Armpit attack, he said, and wiggled his fingers under her arm. Twisting away, she buried her face in the pillow. Butt attack! She reached back and slapped his hand off her rump, then rolled and faced him. That's not nice, she protested. So sorry. Want to go to Jack in the Box? Can I have nachos? Sure. Let's go. You don't have to rush me. If we don't get out of here fast, Mommy might show up and take you home, and you won't get the nachos. Kimmy sat up. Searching under the pillow, she found Clue. Is Mommy mad at me? I wouldn't be surprised. We were both terribly worried about you. What you did was very dangerous. I was very careful. Come on. He took her hand. She hopped down from the bed.
looked back at Cookie Monster as if considering whether to bring him along as well, then let Jake lead her across the room. Can I stay here tonight? I don't think so. Mommy will want you at home. Isn't this my home too? Sure it is. Don't you want me to stay with you? I'd love it, but this wouldn't be a good night for it. Besides, I'm on a very important case. Somebody toes up? She asked and grinned at him. That's right. Outside, Jake lifted her into the car and strapped her into the child seat. He hurried around to his side of the car, started the engine, and turned on the headlights. As he backed out of the driveway, he told Kimmy, We looked all over town for you. The whole police department was looking for you. Does that mean I'm in trouble? I don't think we'll put you in jail this time. If you ever do it again, though, I'm afraid it'll be slammer time. Why'd you do it? Mommy wasn't being nice. Because she wouldn't let you have ice cream? No, cause she socked me. What do you mean, socked you? Gave me a knuckle sandwich. Right here. She bumped Clue's small gray head against her upper arm. It really hurt. You're not supposed to hit little girls, you know. So you ran away because she hit you? You never hit me. Well, that's only because I know you'd pound me if I ever tried. He smiled at her, but blood was seething through him. Kimmy never lied. That bitch had punched her. Didn't even have the guts to admit it. So you got mad because she hit you, and you decided to pay me a visit? How did you find Daddy's house? Oh, I knew where it was. And you walked all the way? Sure, but my foots got tired. There were a lot of people looking for you. I'm really surprised that none of them found you. Well, you see, I hid. I'm a good hider. What did you do? Duck into the bushes every time a car came along? Sometimes there weren't no bushes. I got behind trees and cars. Very clever. Well, you see, I got scared about the man with the cat. He didn't have a cat, for real, cause it got smooshed. But he wanted to pet Clue and I ran away. What man? Jake asked. My God, he thought. Somebody did try to pick her up. Daddy, you should have listened the first time. I do not repeat. I was listening, he assured her. You said that a man wanted to pet Clue. Only that was just a story. He was going to grab me and take me in his car. Jake's heart pounded. Did he tell you that? No. Then what makes you think he wanted to grab you? You can't fool Shira. When did this happen? Today. After you left Mommy's house? Well, of course. He was driving a car? Yes. And he stopped near you while you were on the way to Daddy's house? Yes. What did he say? I already told you. Press rewind. Kimmy made a buzzing sound. Okay, all done. What did the man say? His cat got smooshed by a car, and he felt sad. I don't think it really did, though. Do you? I don't know. I wouldn't let him pet Clue. I ran away. Did he drive after you? Well, you see, I ran to a house. That was very smart. And what did he do? He drove away fast. What did he look like? Are you going to put him in jail? I might. Good. But I need to know what he looks like, or I won't be able to find him. Maybe you should shoot him. I think that might be a good idea. How old was he? I don't know. Was he younger than Daddy? Yeah. 
But he was grown up. Did he look old enough to be a student at the college? Kimmy shrugged. He was kind of the same as George. George was the boyfriend of Sandra Phillips, who used to babysit for Kimmy before the marriage broke up. At that time, George was a senior in high school. What did he look like? Well, he didn't have a shirt on. In a sly voice, she added, "I saw his beeps. Did you see his back? And did his back have a bulge?" Jake wondered, as if he had a snake under his skin. Kimmy shook her head. What color was his hair? Black. How about his eyes? I don't know. Kimmy said, sounding a bit impatient. Are we almost to Jack in the Box? Just a couple more blocks. Was he skinny, fat? Oh, skinny. Did he wear glasses? Nope. Sunglasses? Daddy, she sighed. I'm tired of this. You want me to shoot him, don't you? Well. What kind of car was he driving? Oh, that's easy. It was just like mommy's. A Porsche? What's a Porsche? The car that Harold bought mommy. Oh, that. Huh? Uh. It was like her old car. Maybe it was her old car. Was it exactly the same? The color and everything? Yeah. Only it had a thing on it. What kind of a thing? A pointy flag. What color was it? Red orange. Like your red orange crayon. Well, of course. Kimmy rolled her eyes. Where was this flag? Was it glued to a window or? It was on that thing. Kimmy pointed through the window at Jake's radio antenna. That's great, honey. That'll be a real help. Anything else you can remember about the guy or his car? I don't think so. His cat's name was Celia. Only I don't really think he had a cat. Do you? I think it was just a story to make me let him pet Clue and grab me. I bet he wanted to do something bad to me. Only I outsmarted him, didn't I? You sure did, honey. A moment later, Jake swung the car into the crowded lot of a Seven Eleven. Hey, you promised Jack in the Box. I need to make a phone call. Parking spaces close to the public telephone were full, so he had to settle for a spot near the far end. Are you going to call Mommy? Nope. You want me to? No. I'm calling the police. He unbuckled Kimmy. She scurried down from her high seat and followed Jake out the driver's door. Taking hold of her small hand, he led her across the parking lot. I'm going to tell Barney all about the creep in the Volkswagen. Kimmy's eyes widened with excitement. Really? Yep. We're going to nail that guy. Can we eat before we nail him? I'm starving. We'll eat as soon as I'm done calling. Well, make it snappy, Buster. Chapter Twenty Seven. Roland parked Dana's Volkswagen at the curb halfway down the block and climbed out. He walked past two houses. In the glow of a streetlight, he checked the address he had copied from the student directory: three six four B Apple Lane. He was on Apple Lane. The porch light of the house across from him revealed the numbers three six four on the front door. The B on the address undoubtedly meant that Allison had an apartment on the property, either in a different section of the house or in a furnished garage out back. Light shone through windows on the ground floor and upstairs. Whoever lives in the main part of the house must be home. Roland thought, "I'd better keep it in mind." A walkway led straight to the front door, but flagstones curved away to the right. 
Roland cut diagonally across the lawn. Stepping onto a flagstone at the corner of the house, he saw a wooden stairway to the second story. A door at the top was lit by a single bulb. A row of potted plants sat on a handrail. Girls would have potted plants, he thought. Near the bottom of the stairs, a mailbox was mounted to the house. Roland stopped beside it. The address on the box, 364B. He slowly ascended the stairs. Hearing voices, he stopped and turned around. The sound came from an open window. Though the window overlooked the stairway, it was far to the side so he couldn't see in. He listened a few moments. The voices had a flat quality and background music. A television. So, Helen is here, just like Allison said, watching the tube. Alone? She might have a boyfriend with her. Possible. I'll have to be careful, Roland thought. At the top of the stairs, he tugged a plastic bag from a front pocket of his jeans. It was a sturdy, translucent wastebasket liner. He had taken it from his dorm room while planning tonight's activities. Confident that the noise from the television would prevent Helen from hearing such quiet sounds, he unfolded the bag and puffed into it. The bag expanded with his breath. He took out the keys he had taken from Celia's purse, chose one that appeared most likely to be the door key, and slipped it silently into the lock. He bit the edge of the bag to free his other hand. Then, using both hands, he slowly turned the key and knob. He eased open the door. The sound from the television increased. He smelled the pleasant odor. Popcorn. With one eye pressed to the gap between the door and frame, he could see only a slice of the living room. No one was there. He swung the door open a little wider and sidestepped in. He saw the top of her head above the sofa back. Her hair was in curlers. The furniture arrangement made it easy. The sofa had a wide space behind it, apparently so people could cross the room without passing in front of anyone who might be sitting there watching TV. He could sneak up right behind her. Roland considered shutting the door. He decided not to risk making a sound that might disturb her, and left it standing open a few inches. He took the bag in both hands. Holding it open, he began to walk slowly over the carpet. A slight breeze stirred the bag. This'll be a cinch, Roland thought. Unless there's a guy lying on the sofa with his head in her lap. Then he was close enough to see that nobody else was there. On the cushion beside Helen rested a big white bowl of popcorn. She reached into it and scooped out a handful. She was wearing a red bathrobe. Her legs were stretched out, feet resting on top of a coffee table. The robe was hanging open, revealing thick white legs. Too bad she's such a pig, Roland thought. This would be much more pleasant if she looked like Celia or maybe Allison. There's no thrill in this. Creeping forward in slow motion, he lifted the bag. Behind and to his side, he heard a thump. He looked. The door had blown shut. Helen looked, too, her head turning enough to see the door, then turning more and tilting back. Her eyes bugged out when she saw Roland. Half-chewed popcorn spewed from her mouth, some spattering the inside of the plastic bag as he swung it down over her head. She lunged forward. Roland flung an arm across her face to hold the bag in place. Hugging her head, he was dragged over the back of the sofa. She reached back and tore at his hair. Pain erupted from his scalp. Helen's shoulder slammed the top of the coffee table. Roland's side hit the surface, knocking her drink out of the way. She squirmed and kicked. Her wild struggle scooted Roland along the table. Its other end flew up. 
He dropped to the floor, Helen smashing down on top of him. Pinned beneath her writhing body, Roland clutched the bag tight to her face. With his other hand, he jerked open the snap of his knife case. No, no blood. He threw his free hand across Helen. Her robe had come open. He grabbed a breast and twisted it. She squealed into the plastic over her mouth. Letting go, he pounded a fist down hard into her belly. Again. Her body flinched rigid with each blow. Then she seemed to quake. He heard heaving noises. The bag pulsed warm and mushy against his hand, and he realized she was vomiting. He fought an urge to pull his hand away. He pressed the bag even more tightly to her mouth. Convulsions racked Helen's body. She twisted and bucked on top of him, finally throwing herself off. He rolled with her, but lost his grip on the bag. Vomit erupted onto the carpet. Her hand slipped in the mess when she tried to push herself up. Roland scrambled onto her back. She was choking and gasping beneath him, but breathing, at least enough to stay alive. As he straddled her and reached for the bag, she tugged it off her head. Roland wrapped his fingers around her slick neck and tried to strangle her. As he squeezed her throat, Helen pushed herself up. She got to her hands and knees. Whimpering, she began to crawl. Roland rode her. His grip grew weaker. He felt a tremor of fear. Letting go, he scrambled off Helen's back. He staggered a few steps, got his balance, then rushed at her and kicked the top of his shoe up into her belly with such force that she toppled onto her side. She hugged her belly and sucked breath. She had lost her glasses. Her face was scarlet where it wasn't smeared with vomit. Roland danced back and forth, looking for the best target. He wondered for a moment what one of those mammoth breasts might do if he punted it. That wouldn't be lethal, and he needed to finish this business. She had already proven herself almost too much for him. He aimed a kick at her throat. It missed, but knocked her jaw crooked and threw Helen onto her back. Roland jumped, bringing his knees up high and shooting his feet down stomping her crossed arms and belly with all his weight. Breath exploded out of her, and she half sat up. Roland bounded off her. Whirling around, he kicked the side of her head. Her arms flopped onto the floor. He kicked her head again for good measure. Then he retrieved the plastic bag. He sat on the soft cushions of her breasts, pulled the filthy bag down over her head, and held it shut around her neck. As he sat there, he hoped Allison would be spending a long time at her boyfriend's apartment. It would take a long time to clean all this up. The pig had made a real mess. Chapter 28 They were nearly done eating, and Allison grew uneasy about what might happen once they left the table. To postpone the moment, she asked for coffee. Evan got up to prepare it. Don't worry so much, she told herself. So far, everything has gone fine, reasonably fine. She had been terribly nervous on her way to Evan's apartment, had even come close to backing down, but somehow she found the courage to knock on his door. She had half expected Evan to look wild-eyed and desperate. If he'd been that way when he wrote the letter, however, he'd had time to recover. The man who opened the door seemed composed and cheerful. Perhaps a bit too cheerful. Ah, la belle dame son merci, he greeted her. Uh, make that avec merci. That's better, Allison said. Come in, come in. He didn't try to hug or kiss her. He backed into the apartment, smiling. You look terrific. You don't look so bad either. You got some sun. I spent some time out in the quad. Evan lifted a glass off an end table. It was empty except for a few ice cubes that had melted down to nuggets. What can I get you? 
How about a margarita? We're having Mexican. Great, Allison replied. She inhaled deeply, relishing the aromas that filled the apartment. I'll be just a minute. Make yourself cozy. He walked past a wall of bookshelves, stepped around the table in the small eating area, and disappeared into the kitchen. The table had been cleared of the typewriter and pile of books and papers that usually covered it. Places had been set. In the center of the table stood a single red candle. Allison heard the blender whine. She stepped over to an armchair and sat down. The distance between the chair and the sofa, in this small room, seemed enormous. This is no way to start things fresh, she thought. Evan's not contagious. So she moved to the sofa. On the seat of a folding chair straight ahead was an oscillating fan. It sent waves of mild warm air at her, cooling the damp skin of her neck and face. She leaned forward. The top button of her blouse pressed against her throat. She unfastened it. Arching her back, she reached around and plucked the clinging fabric away from her skin. It hadn't been that hot outside, she thought. Nerves. Confronting Roland. Then coming here. It can only get better. What makes you so sure? It's already better, she thought. I'm done with Roland. Evan seems all right, and the fan feels terrific. Allison looked around. She had been here so many times before. Nothing looked different, yet nothing seemed quite the same. This might have been a movie set cleverly made up to look like Evan's apartment, and she was an actress in the role of Allison, a role she didn't quite know how to play. Need a script. She thought, that'd certainly help. Evan came in with a margarita in one hand and a bowl of tortilla chips in the other. After placing them on the table in front of Allison, he returned to the kitchen. He came back with a bowl of red salsa and another margarita. He put them down, then sat on the sofa beside her. Beside her, but about two feet away. A good sign, she thought. He isn't trying to pretend that everything is like it used to be. They lifted their drinks. To new beginnings, Evan said. They clinked their glasses together and drank. How is your dissertation coming along? Allison asked. Evan spoke with enthusiasm about its progress. He hoped to develop a study of flight imagery in Finnegan's Wake into a full book. It could gain him recognition as a scholar of Joyce and help ensure tenure a few years down the road. While he talked, Allison dipped chips in salsa, ate them, and drank. Occasionally she made comments or asked questions. When Evan finally lapsed into silence, Allison asked if he had heard, yet, from any of the universities to which he had applied for teaching positions. He gave her a strange look. You mean, since Thursday? Seems like longer, Allison said. Seems like weeks, Evan replied. God, it's good to have you back. Not all the way back, she thought. Not yet. I'm here, but I'm not back. Evan took the empty glasses into the kitchen. While he was gone, Allison dipped another chip into the salsa cupped her hand beneath it in case it dripped, and ate it. Better stop gobbling these things, she thought, and licked a smear of red sauce off her fingers. Evan came back with the glasses refilled. Allison was already feeling somewhat lightheaded from the first margarita. Drink this one more slowly, she cautioned herself. Keep at it with the booze and chips. You'll be bloated and drunk by dinner time. You build a mean margarita, she said. Wait till you try my enchiladas. He sat down beside her. Beside her, and now only about one foot away. That's okay, Allison thought. We are closer than we were when I got here. Still not like we used to be, 
but getting better. What have you been doing with yourself? he asked. Not much. She didn't want to say that she had spent the past few days thinking about him, often with bitterness and sometimes with longing. I went to Wally's one night, she said. Any luck? he asked. I didn't go for that, she said, and took a drink. Saw this far-out video, a woman dancing with a snake. Have you seen that one? I've caught it on MTV. Blue lady doing squirm on me. Pretty far out, Allison said again. Erotic. Helen and I played Trivial Pursuit last night. I landed on the arts and literature spaces whenever I got a chance. I mopped up the floor with her. Sounds like your Saturday night was better than mine. This keeps straying into areas I don't like, she thought. I must have gained five pounds. Between the two of us, we polished off a bag of potato chips and a bag of taco chips, not to mention a six-pack. If I keep spending Saturday nights with Helen, I'll start to look like her. Impossible. You could gain a hundred pounds and you'd still be beautiful. Oh, sure. Your mama could beat you with an ugly stick from now till doomsday. You'd never look like Helen. Allison laughed, then shook her head. Come on, she's my best friend. I didn't start it. She's a great gal. It's not her fault she looks the way she does. If she cared, she could fix herself up. Not by much, Allison said, and immediately regretted it. I mean, there's only so much that a hairstyle and makeup and clothes can accomplish. Shit, I don't mean it that way. Evan was grinning, laughing softly. No, of course not. Anyway, we had a great time. Then today, I took a long walk, and I picked up a copy of the new Travis McGee, and spent most of the afternoon with that. McDonald's great to read when you're lying out in the sun. What were you wearing? My white bikini. Ah. She took another drink. The second margarita was getting low. I like all the McDonald's, she said. McDonald, John D. McDonald, Gregory. McDonald, Ross. McDonald, Ronald. I love how you look in that white bikini. Is dinner almost ready? I'll check. Shall I get us refills? Not for me, thanks. No problem. Champagne with dinner. I promised champagne, remember? Leaving his own empty glass on the table, he stood up. He turned and walked away slowly, and it struck Allison that his gait was slow and deliberate. How many drinks did he have before I even got here? Allison wondered. Don't worry about it. Just make sure you don't get looped. Sighing, she settled into the sofa. So far, so good, she told herself. She sighed again. It felt good to sigh. She felt pleasantly lazy and light. She and Evan were together again, and it was working out. Pretty fine. He didn't get my McDonald's joke. Too busy thinking about me in my bikini. Who can blame him? She laughed softly and closed her eyes. Hey, Sleeping Beauty. She opened her eyes. The room was dark except for the glow of a single candle. The candle was on the table in the dining area. Food was on the table. Evan was standing above her. I understand it is traditional to awaken the princess with a kiss, he said. However, I showed remarkable restraint and took no advantage of your somnolent condition. Allison sat up. How long was I asleep? Oh, perhaps an hour. Geez, it didn't seem possible. I'm sorry. No need to apologize. You're beautiful when you're asleep. Or when you're awake, for that matter. I hope dinner isn't ruined. I'm sure it'll be fine. In fact, it's just now ready. Do I have time to use the john? Help yourself. She made her way through the darkness and down a short hallway. Though she was embarrassed about falling asleep, the rest had left her feeling refreshed. 
She turned on the light. She used the toilet. At the sink, she cupped up cold water with her hand and took a few sips. She studied herself in the mirror. Her eyes looked a little pink. The middle button of her blouse had come undone. She fastened it, then washed her hands and left. The kitchen light was on. The enchiladas on her plate were steaming and looked wonderful. Evan pulled out the chair for her, and she sat down. He filled her glass with champagne. Before taking his seat, he turned off all the room lights. Remember our spaghetti dinner? he asked. You were wearing your good white blouse and claimed you didn't want to spill anything on it, so you took it off? Evan, you were so lovely in the candlelight, your golden glowing skin, your dusky nipples. Stop it. Sorry, he muttered. He lowered his head, cut into an enchilada, and began to eat. Allison's appetite was gone, but she took a bite. She had a hard time swallowing and washed the food down with champagne. For a while, they both remained silent. This is lousy, she thought. What was the real harm in what he'd said? They had a wonderful time that night. It shouldn't be a crime to remember it, to mention it. Good grub, she said. He looked up from his plate. Try some sour cream on it. She spooned a large glob of sour cream onto her enchiladas. It was a good thing, too, that I took off my blouse, she said. I slopped all over myself that night. She saw Evan smile. On purpose, I believe. Yeah, I'm not, after all, a slob. No, indeed. They resumed their meal. Suddenly their food was delicious. The cool sour cream added a tangy flavor to the enchiladas. She drank more of her champagne. Evan was quick to refill her glass. You're really a terrific cook. I have my specialties. One of them is chocolate mousse pie, but I think we should save it for later. Give us time to digest. Maybe we should take a walk when we're done, Allison suggested. Evan said, maybe. He didn't sound thrilled by the idea. I've got a tape of To Have and Have Not I thought you might want to look at on the VCR. Hemingway? Bogart and Bacall? Giving her a sidelong glance, he said, You know how to whistle, don't you? Sure, I haven't seen it in years, Allison said. I thought you might like it, Tweetheart, he said, flexing his upper lip. He would turn it on and sit with her on the sofa. Soon, his arms would be around her. We'll be right back where we started before Thursday in Bennett Hall, before the ultimatum, before his date with Tracy Morgan, before the flowers and the letter. And maybe that's not such a bad thing, Allison thought. Why fight it? What's the point? But what were the last three days all about if you give in tonight? You won't have learned anything. Sure, you'll have learned that, no matter what, it all comes down to fucking. It shouldn't have to be that way, damn it. She pushed her fork under the small portion that remained of her dinner. Running out of time, kiddo. She chewed. She swallowed. She drank the rest of her champagne. Evan lifted the bottle. Polish it off? No thanks. He emptied the bottle into his glass and quickly drank the last of the champagne. I could use a little coffee, if you have some, Allison said. Sure, no problem. Minutes later, Evan carried two mugs of coffee into the living room and set them on the coffee table. Then he crouched near the VCR and pushed in his tape of to have and have not. When he started to get up, he staggered a few steps found his balance, and grinned over his shoulder at Allison. I meant to do that, he said. He's pretty polluted, she thought. He walked carefully into the kitchen. While he was gone, Allison pushed herself off the sofa and turned on a lamp. The kitchen went dark. She was seated again by the time he wandered in. He had a loose-jointed, unsteady walk. 
He had a bottle of whiskey in one hand, a can of whipped cream in the other. How about some Irish coffee? He asked, and dropped heavily onto the sofa beside her. Beside her, and now no more than three inches away. I think I'll take my coffee straight, she said. Fine. Do not let it be said that I attempted to ply you with liquor. When all is written and the story told, let it not be reported that Evan attempted to cloud that fair lady's mind with spirits, opiates, or sorcery. You are bombed, Allison said. I'm semi-bombed, talking out of a side of his mouth in a fairly good impression of W.C. Fields, he said. She was a gorgeous, delectable blonde, and she drove me to drink. It's the only thing I'm grateful to her for. Allison took a sip of her coffee. If you barf, I'm on my way home. Barf, and the world barfs with you. But he left the whiskey on the table. He took a drink of coffee. Then he turned on the movie. Allison sat on the front edge of the sofa cushion, leaning forward, until her mug was empty. Then she leaned back into the cushion. She pried off her shoes, propped her feet on the edge of the table, and stared between her knees at the television. She couldn't focus on the movie. Her mind was on Evan. She sensed that he was paying no attention to the movie either. He was slumped beside her, his legs stretched out beneath the table, his left arm not quite touching Allison, but so close that she thought she could feel the heat of it against her arm. His hand rested on his thigh. The lighted red numbers of the VCR's digital clock showed 9.52. We've been sitting like mannequins for almost twenty minutes, Allison thought. She had an urge to shift, but she didn't move. A move might trigger something. This is crazy. She lowered her feet to the floor, sat up straight, and stretched, arching her back. She rolled her head to work the kinks out of her neck. Here, Evan said. He reached up with one hand and began to massage her neck. The fingers felt good, plying her stiff muscles. Allison turned her back to Evan, sliding a leg onto the cushion. Now it starts, Allison thought. Both of Evan's hands were on her shoulders and neck, rubbing, squeezing, caressing her. Allison closed her eyes and let her head droop. She felt weak and lazy. He worked on the bare sides of her neck, beneath her collar. Nice. Why not nicer? She unfastened a button. Evan's hands moved outward from her neck, kneading her skin, widening the bare area. Allison felt her blouse grow looser, less restricting. She realized, suddenly, that her middle button had popped open on its own. Evan tried to spread the blouse open more. It pulled at her. She tugged, untucking it, and the loose blouse rose and opened, exposing her shoulders. She swayed under the soothing motions of Evan's strong hands. She felt powerless to lift her head or to open her eyes, or to protest when he slipped the bra straps off her shoulders. His hands no longer massaged but glided over her bare skin, caressing her from neck to shoulders. He stopped for a moment. The sofa cushion shifted. Evan must be changing his position, Allison thought. Getting onto his knees? Yes. His breathing now came from up higher. He stroked her shoulders, eased his hands under her blouse and inside the sleeves to caress her upper arms, then slid his hands out and down, down over her collarbones, down her chest, fingers gliding away instead of touching her through the filmy fabric of her bra, and opening the last buttons. He slipped the blouse down her back. The sleeves bound her wrists, but she made no effort to free them. For a while, his hands roamed her back and sides. Then they unfastened her bra. Evan kissed the side of her neck, 
He nibbled, making her squirm. Her heart quickened, desire pushing away the lazy, weak feeling. He caressed her sides. His hands moved beneath her arms, slipped under her bra, and lightly cupped her breasts. Her nipples stiffened, pressing into his palms. Reaching back, she rubbed his thighs through the soft fabric of his pants. He squeezed her nipples. A hot tremor pulsed through Allison. She caught her breath. She reached higher, intending to caress his penis through his pants, but she found it rigid and bare. Her hand flew from it. She heard him chuckle quietly. Surprise, he whispered. How long had he been that way, his penis secretly exposed while he caressed her? It seemed wrong, deceitful, almost perverted. But he rubbed and squeezed her breasts. And what did it matter if he jumped the gun a bit? He saved me the trouble, Allison thought. She reached up and stroked him. Then she turned around. Evan was on his knees. As he slid down his pants, Allison removed her blouse. She glanced down at herself. Her bra was draped over the tops of her breasts like a flimsy scarf. She began to sweep its strap down her left arm and saw a smudge of red on the white, translucent fabric of one rumpled cup. She stared at the red stain. It looked like a smear of the salsa they'd been dipping their chips into before dinner. I must have spilled. It's on my bra. Wait. She had gone to the bathroom and found the middle button of her blouse undone. After waking up, Evan, naked from waist to knees, lifted his knit shirt to pull it over his head. It was covering his face. Allison jabbed a fist into his belly. Air whooshed out of him. He folded at the waist. Allison flung herself off the sofa just in time to avoid being struck by his crumpling body. She rammed her feet into her shoes. Behind her, Evan was gasping for breath. You shit, she muttered. Shaking with rage, she shoved her bra into the handbag. You filthy shit! You felt me up while I was asleep! She whirled around to face him. He was on his knees, his forehead pressed into the sofa seat. That really stinks! Stinks! She thrust a hand down the sleeve of her blouse. It's sick is what it is. I'm sorry, he gasped. You rotten bastard. Her one bare arm flailed in search of the other sleeve, found it. Then her shoulders hitched and the blouse fell into place. She slung the purse strap onto a shoulder. With palsied fingers, she tried to button her blouse as she rushed for the door. Allison! She jerked the door open and glanced back at Evan. He was still on the sofa, his ass in the air. Don't go, he called. Please! She stepped out and slammed the door. Chapter 29 I got him good, Allison told herself as she hurried along the sidewalk. I got him real good. Oh, sure, you got him good. Maybe he'll have a sore gut for a while, maybe even a bruise, but by morning he'll be almost as good as new, and you won't be. How could he do a thing like that? How could I sleep through it? He probably just slipped his hand in for a quick feel, nothing more. Yeah, sure thing. A feel here, a feel there. If he had cleaned the goddamn salsa off his hand, I never would have been the wiser. What the fuck was he doing, eating while he groped me? Allison heard an engine. Headlights brightened the road on her left. A car moved slowly ahead of her, close to the curb. I'm sorry, Evan called through the open passenger window. Please, can't we at least talk? She kept walking. Evan's car stayed beside her. At least let me drive you home. We can't leave it like this. Oh, yes, we can. I didn't do anything. Oh, no. 
Allison strode across the grass and stepped off the curb. Evan stopped his car. She crossed in front of the headlights and went to his door. The window was down. She peered in at him. You didn't do anything. How do you figure that, huh? What do you call grabbing my tit, not to mention whatever else you might have grabbed? I didn't know you were asleep, damn it. I came back from the kitchen and sat down with you, and you looked at me. You opened your eyes when I sat down, and gave me this look as if everything was okay, and I put my arm across your shoulders. You didn't tell me to get lost, so I thought you liked it. I thought everything was okay again. That's when I put my hand in your blouse. I didn't know you were asleep. You didn't act asleep. My God, you moaned when I touched you. I don't believe you, Allison muttered, but her outrage had turned to confusion. What if he's telling the truth? She lowered her head. Her grip on the car door seemed necessary to hold her up. I thought you were awake. I never would have done those things if I didn't think you were awake. What things exactly? You really don't remember any of it? You did more than touch my breast? Yes. Allison groaned. You seemed to like it. Christ, she muttered. You were breathing hard, Evan continued. You were kind of writhing. My God, I don't... Then suddenly you snored. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I was in shock. I couldn't believe you'd been sleeping the whole time. But I thought, what if you were? I mean, what if you suddenly woke up and found me all over you? So I buttoned your blouse as fast as I could and decided I'd better pretend the whole thing never happened unless you brought it up first, which you didn't. It was just going to be your dark little secret. It was a mistake, Allison. Yeah, uh-huh. I'd planned to tell you about it, but not until later. I figured that once everything was patched up between us, it'd be safe to tell you about it. Hell, you probably would have laughed yourself silly. Uh-huh, right. I can certainly understand your being upset. I mean, I know how it must look, but look at it this way. If you hadn't noticed that sauce on your bra, we'd be making love right now, wouldn't we? Probably, she admitted. So what I did, it wasn't exactly bad. The timing was just off. If it had happened before last Thursday, or after tonight, it wouldn't even be an issue. Murder isn't a fucking issue if you put a bullet through someone's head a minute after he's already dead. What the hell does murder have to do with anything? I'm just making a point. About timing. I've said I'm sorry, Allison. I've explained that it was a misunderstanding. I thought you were awake. Did I start to undress you? He didn't answer. Wouldn't that be the standard procedure if I'd been a participant in your little grab fest? I thought you were just relaxed and enjoying it, like the way you just relaxed and did nothing while I was giving you the massage. Sure, she said. She felt so tired. I just want you to understand. I want you to come back with me. Everything was going great, Allison. We owe it to ourselves to give it another try. No, she shook her head slowly from side to side. It's over. It's done. We'll talk about it tomorrow, all right? Good night, Evan. She pushed herself away from the car door, staggered backward a few steps, and rubbed her face. Tomorrow, Evan said. Get out of here, she muttered. He drove away slowly. Allison stood in the street for a while. Finally, she willed herself to move. She shuffled her feet along the pavement and managed to step over the curb. She was still several blocks from home. She felt drained. Instead of continuing down the sidewalk, she wandered onto the grass. Soon, the cool dew soaked through her shoes. She wanted to lie down, 
to shut her eyes and forget, but not on the wet grass. She went to a concrete bench that surrounded the trunk of an oak near Bennett Hall. At the far side, where she couldn't be seen from the road, she lay down on the bench. She folded her hands beneath her head. Her legs dangled from the edge of the circular seat. She closed her eyes. This is fine, she thought. If Evan comes around again, looking for me, he'll never spot me over here. The concrete hurt the backs of her hands and her shoulder blades, so she used her purse for a pillow and folded her hands on her belly. That was much better. Something skittered noisily among the leaves overhead. Squirrels, she thought. She wished she had a sweater, or maybe a blanket. If she had a blanket, maybe she would just stay here all night. Evans got one in the trunk of his car, his make-out blanket. Shit, he got a lot of use out of it with me. Never again. Thought I was awake. Sure he did. The concrete had a chill that seeped into her skin through her blouse and shorts. She felt a cool breeze sliding over her bare arms and legs. It smelled moist and fresh. Her attic room would be hot. Another good reason not to move, Allison thought. I couldn't move if I wanted to, and I don't want to. Fuck it all. Fuck everything. Okay, not the squirrels unless one lands on my face, and not Mom and Dad, and not Celia and Helen, and not Pizza, or John D. MacDonald or Ronald MacDonald. That shit didn't even get my joke. Fuck him. Fuck Evan Forbes. And fuck Roland whatever. And how about Professor Blaine because they both look like they want to rip my clothes off. And who else? How about all of them? How about every man everywhere? Helen's right. They're nothing but walking cocks looking for a tight hole. Okay, just most of them. Allison realized she was gritting her teeth and shivering. She wrapped her arms across her chest. Stick around here, she thought, and they'll find you in the morning like the frozen leopard on Kilimanjaro. They'll stand around you in awe and say, What's she doing here? And some asshole will probably stick his hand in your blouse. Rigor mortis makes it easy to steal a feel. You're going nuts, Allison. She rubbed her face. With her arms no longer hugging her chest, the breeze slid under her blouse and stole away her body heat. Her attic would be warm, her bed soft. Enough of this. She got up and walked the remaining blocks to her apartment. The second-story windows were dark, but the light at the top of the stairway had been left on. Allison, still shivering, hurried up the stairs. When she stepped inside, the warm air embraced her. Helen must have been burning incense. In spite of the breeze coming in through the open windows, a faint pine odor still hung in the air. No room light came from the crack beneath Helen's bedroom door. Allison had expected Helen to be waiting up, eager to hear about her and Evan. It was probably after 11 p.m., though. Helen had an 8 o'clock class in the morning and had probably decided to quash her curiosity and turn in. By the dim light from the windows, Allison made her way into the corridor and entered the bathroom. She washed her face. She brushed her teeth. Standing in the bathroom doorway for a moment, she got her bearings, then turned off the light and felt her way across the dark hall. She slowly ascended the stairs, gliding a hand up the banister. Her room at the top, illuminated by a gray glow from its single window, seemed almost bright after the blackness of the staircase. The curtains rippled as a cool breeze crept in the open window. At this distance, Allison felt the breeze around her ankles. The rest of the room was stifling, even worse than she had expected. No middle ground, she thought. You're either shivering or sweating.
She lowered her purse to the floor, pushing it under the bed with her foot so she wouldn't trip over it. Then she took off her blouse and dropped it to the floor. She unfastened her shorts. She drew them down, along with her panties, and stepped out of them. The room was still uncomfortably hot, but she could feel a hint of the breeze on her bare skin. With a glance over her shoulder, she stepped backward to the door of her closet. She leaned against it. The door banged shut. She flinched and caught her breath, shocked as much by the support giving way behind her as by the sharp noise. She took a deep, slow, deliberate breath. She bumped the door with her buttocks. Now it was shut all the way. The smooth painted wood felt cool on her skin. Braced against it, she raised one leg and pulled off her shoe and sock, then the other. Standing at the dresser, she opened a drawer. Her hand played over the textures of the unseen garments. Her fingers glided over the filmy fabric of the new negligee. The silky feel promised her escape from the heat, a caress that would cool and soothe. She carried it to the open window and stood between the whispering curtains. A faint breeze drifted in, tickling her skin. Not long ago the cool air had chilled her to the bone. Now it teased, playing between her legs stroking her arms with cool, willowy fingers, caressing her belly and breasts, rolling her head back, breathing deeply. She surrendered to its embrace. Chapter 30 After hearing the toilet flush, Roland counted slowly to sixty. He made the count again and again, then his mind wandered. He pictured Allison in her attic room, taking off her clothes, getting into bed. In his fantasy, she wasn't covered by a sheet. She wore only a pajama shirt. He saw himself standing over her, carefully unfastening the buttons as she slept, spreading open the shirt. In the dim light from the window, her skin looked like ivory. He reached down to touch her, and suddenly she was obese. She was Helen, and she was dead, and she grinned up at him. He lurched, bumping his forehead on the box springs. He lowered his head to the floor and held his breath. He listened, half expecting Helen to moan or turn on the mattress above him, awakened by the jolt. Don't be ridiculous. She's dead as shit, he told himself. But I'm right under her. His ears strained. There was only silence. Helen's eyes were open, though. He could see them open. She knew he was under her bed. Roland must have spent hours in the narrow space only a couple of feet below her corpse. It seemed unfair that his mind should start turning against him now, when he was nearly done with the wait. He still heard nothing. But Helen was listening as she gazed with dead eyes at the ceiling. And she could hear Roland under the bed. His quick heartbeat and shaky breath. You're dead, he whispered. Helen rolled over, got to her hands and knees, ripped open the mattress with crooked fingers and tore out great clumps of stuffing. Then she was staring down at him through the mattress tunnel. She bared her teeth. She snarled and thrust her hand down the hole, clawing toward his face. It isn't happening, he told himself, but he trembled and gasped. He had to get out. He felt as if spiders were scurrying over his body. He scooted sideways over the carpet. Helen was waiting up there, waiting to grab him when he emerged. With a stifled whimper, he thrust himself into the open and rolled clear. He sat up. In dim light from the window, Helen was a motionless mound beneath the covers of her bed. Watching her, Roland got to his feet. He kept his eyes on her as he sidestepped to the bedroom door. He opened it, stepped out, and pulled it shut. He backed away from it. No longer in the presence of the body, the fear subsided. 
He felt angry and embarrassed for letting his imagination torment him. Why, he wondered, had his friend allowed him to lose control that way? It could have stopped the horrid thoughts, given him a nice zap to remind him of Allison. Did it enjoy his suffering, or did it simply not care? He touched the bulge at the back of his neck. I'm doing it all for you. Then he felt ashamed. This was his friend, who had turned his secret fantasies into reality, who had led him into a new life even more bizarre and thrilling than his most lurid dreams. The fear was his own fault. He had no right to blame his friend. As if stirred by the reassurance, his friend sent a small tremor of pleasure through Roland. Had enough time gone by? He wanted Allison to be asleep before he went up to her. Otherwise, she might cry out. Her window. Roland had seen it ajar after returning the living room to the appearance of normal. She wouldn't have closed it. The house was still too hot. With that window open, a scream could be heard by someone outside, or even by the people who live downstairs. Roland needed to catch her asleep. Then there would be no scream or struggle. He went to the sofa, sat down, and waited. He savored the waiting. Last night with Celia had been incredible, but Allison had stunning beauty, along with an innocent, alluring quality that Celia lacked. She would be overwhelming. It would be like a dream. All night with her. But he needed to wait. Settling back into the sofa, he folded his hands behind his head and stared at the dark screen of the television. He called up an image of Allison at the mall, wearing the jumpsuit with a zipper down the front. How he had longed to lower that zipper. She'd had a bag in her hand. So had Celia. He wondered what they had bought that day. Roland grinned. Whatever they'd bought, it cost plenty. Their lives. And Helen's. If he hadn't met them at the mall, he would have chosen other victims, not the three musketeers. Big enough to share with a friend. His stomach growled. Desire pulsed through him. Roland writhed, gasping until it faded. Okay, he thought. I get the message. Leaning forward, he pulled off his shoes and socks. He pulled off his shirt and spread it on the top of the table. Standing, he slipped the knife from its case and placed it on the shirt. He tugged out his handcuffs from a front pocket of his jeans. Digging into the other front pocket, he took out a smashed and flattened roll of duct tape. The handcuff key dangled from a thin chain around his neck. He touched it. His hands shook badly as he peeled off a six-inch strip of the broad metallic tape. He sliced it off the roll with his knife and stuck one end of the tape to his chin. It hung down like a strange beard. He lowered his jeans and stepped out of them. This time, there would be no problem of blood on his clothes. Leave them down here. Put them on again after you shower. Leave here clean. I'm learning. I'm getting good at this, he thought. He sat on the sofa, picked up his jeans, and pulled the belt out of its loops. He put the knife case back onto the belt, then stood and buckled the belt loosely around his waist. He folded the knife, pushed it into the case. Now he would have both hands free to cuff her and tape her mouth. The belt was cool against his skin, the weight of the knife in its pouch pressing his hip. A naked savage. Drape a small hide over the belt, and he would have a loincloth. Better like this, he decided. He slid a hand down the length of his engorged penis, then picked up the cuffs. He stepped around the end of the sofa. His feet were silent on the carpet. He heard only his pounding heart. He began to tremble. 
With each step, the tremors grew. He wasn't cold. He wasn't frightened. He was shaking with excitement, with delicious shivers of anticipation. Before ascending the stairs, Roland shifted the cuffs to his left hand. He curled his right hand over the railing. Slowly, he began to climb. The staircase was black, but a patch of gray showed at the top. A step suddenly creaked when he put his weight on it. He stopped, listened. His throat made an odd, dry clicking sound in time with every heartbeat. He swallowed, and the sound went away. He began climbing again. After a few more steps, his eyes were at floor level. Near the foot of the bed was a pile of blankets. The top sheet hung off the side of the mattress, almost at the end, but still on the bed, ready to be pulled up in case Allison should grow chilly in the middle of the night. Roland was still too low to see Allison. He climbed. The bed seemed to descend, and there was Allison, sprawled on her back. He crouched until he could no longer see her. Staying low, he made his way up the final stairs. On elbows and knees, he crawled over the carpet. He stopped near the side of the bed. He listened to Allison's soft, slow breathing until he was certain she was asleep. Then he stood and looked down at her. She was bathed in a glow of moonlight. Her nighty seemed glossed with silver except for the areas over her breasts. There it had no sheen, but was transparent. He could see the creamy skin of her breasts, the dark flesh of her nipples. Roland licked his dry lips. He could almost feel the nipples in his mouth, almost taste them. Allison's pillow lay crooked against the headboard, as if she had found it too hot to sleep on, and shoved it away. Her face was turned toward the window. A few wisps of her hair curled over her pale ear. Her left arm was extended toward Roland, her hand at the very edge of the mattress, palm up, fingers curled. Her other arm lay close to her right side. Her long bare legs were spread. The moon-slicked nighty clung to her thighs. He bent over caressed the slick fabric between her legs, pinched a bit of it and lifted, drawing it gently upward. A hot surge suddenly ripped Roland's breath away. He shuddered with an agony of need, tugging briefly at the gown before it slipped from his fingers. Allison moaned. Her head turned. Roland, quaking and fogged, but somehow alert in spite of the ecstasy, made a quick grab for her left hand. He slapped a cuff around her wrist. Her arm jerked, yanking the other cuff from Roland's grip. Gasping, she started to roll. He grabbed her shoulder and hip, stopping the roll, pulling until she was on her back again. He threw himself onto her. He straddled her hips. She bucked and writhed beneath him. He caught her right hand as it lashed at his face. He pressed it to the mattress. He tore her tight left hand away from his throat and forced it down. She flung her head from side to side. She crashed a knee into his back. Roland grunted from the impact. He jerked down her cuffed hand, pinned it under his knee to free his right hand, and punched her hard in the face. She jerked rigid beneath him and suddenly stopped struggling. She made soft, whimpering sounds as she gasped for air. Roland peeled the duct tape off his chin. He pressed it across her mouth. The sounds of her breathing changed to a frantic hiss as she sucked air through her nostrils. He should cuff the other hand now. But Allison wasn't fighting anymore, and he could feel the mounds of her breasts between his thighs. He put his hands on them. The fabric felt like netting. Her skin was hot beneath it. He no longer heard Allison's hissing struggle for air. She was silent. Roland squeezed her breasts. Her right hand rose off the bed. Suspicious, 
He watched it. It pressed his hand more tightly to her breast and held it there. She squirmed, moaned. My God, Roland thought. What's going on? Does she like it? Her hand moved upward, caressing his arm, curling gently over his shoulder. She stroked the hair on the side of his head. She stroked his cheek. The shriek drove spikes into Allison's ears. Her wrist was grabbed and forced down, and her thumb popped out of his eye socket with a wet sucking sound. He didn't try to hold her. He clapped a hand to his face and swayed above her. Allison thrust his knees upward. He tumbled onto the mattress between her legs. She rammed her feet against him, turning him and shoving him away, then kicked a leg high over his body and flung herself off the bed. She backed away, ripping the tape from her face. In the moonlight, Roland's naked body looked gray and cadaverous. He was writhing, clutching his face, digging his heels into the mattress and thrusting his pelvis up as he squealed. Allison whirled around. She grabbed the railing and rushed down the dark stairway. At the bottom, she tried to call out to warn Helen, but her voice came out like a choked whisper. She ran down the hallway, rounded the corner, threw open Helen's door and slapped the light switch. Helen! Helen, under the covers, didn't move. Allison hurried toward her. Quick! We gotta... Roland's upstairs! Attacked me! She jerked the covers down. Helen stared dull-eyed through crooked glasses. Her face was torn, scraped, swollen. Her chin had a crust of dried mess. Allison squeezed the dull, gray-blue skin of her shoulder. Helen! She shook the shoulder. Helen's head wobbled and her huge breasts quivered. Helen, come on! Allison let go of the shoulder. The skin stayed dented where her fingers had been. Numb. Allison backed away. He'd killed Helen. No, this is some kind of a sick joke. Helen isn't dead. Not Helen. It's a joke. She's dead. Allison stepped backward to the doorway. She looked down the dark hall. You bastard! She cried out and heard quick thuds of footfalls on the attic stairs. They triggered a blast of white-hot fear that sent Allison running to the door. She flung it open, lunged outside, slammed it, and fled down the stairs. The painted wood of the steps was wet with dew and slick under her bare feet, so she slowed down, dreading a fall that might give Roland a chance to catch her. Four steps from the bottom, she leaped. She dropped through the chill night air her nightgown billowing up, and landed staggering over the flagstones and grass. She looked back. Roland wasn't on the stairs. Stepping sideways, she saw that the door at the top was still shut. She stumbled around the staircase to the side door. Professor Teal's kitchen was dark behind the glass panes. She tried the doorknob. The door was locked, so she pounded the wood hard, shaking the door. Dr. Teal, she shouted. Then she yelled, Fire! Fire! She hammered on the door. The kitchen was still dark. With a flick of her right hand, she caught the dangling cuff, clenched it in her fist like a knuckle duster and smashed the glass. She reached in, being careful not to rip her arm on the pointed blades of glass, and turned the knob. Door ajar, she eased her arm out. She glanced up the stairway. Still no Roland. She gave the door a shove. Shards of glass clinked and scraped as the bottom of the door swept over them. Clinging to the door jamb, Allison swung inside and stretched out a leg as far as she could before placing her foot down. She felt no glass under it. With her weight on that foot, she pivoted and found herself clear of the door. She bent over, fingered its edge, and whipped it shut. A sudden light blinded Allison. Squinting, she whirled around. Under the entry, Kane raised like a club, stood Dr. Teal. His white hair was must. He wore baggy, striped pajamas. 
Frowning, he blinked, and his mouth started to move. Turn off the light, Allison commanded in a sharp whisper. He didn't ask questions, just hit the light switch. Allison turned away from him and stared out the door windows. Still, no Roland. He killed Helen, she said. He, I hurt him, but he's up there. Oh, my dear God, the doctor muttered behind her. Allison heard a quiet clatter. She looked over her shoulder. Dr. Teal's cane was clamped between his knees. He was holding the pale handset of a wall phone as he spun the dial. Police, emergency, he said, his voice firm and vibrant. Allison suddenly pictured him standing at the lectern in a hall packed with students. They sat frozen, silent, paying absolute attention. He waited a few moments, then said, We have a bloody murder at 364 Apple Lane, and the cur is among us. Get here immediately. He hung up the phone. Come away from the door, he ordered. Allison backed away, unwilling to take her eyes from the windows. She halted when the professor's hand curled gently over her shoulder. It's all right now, darling. He won't hurt you. The police will be here shortly, I'm sure. He killed Helen, she said. Her voice came out squeaky. Tears filled her eyes. Professor Teal patted her shoulder. Stay here. He slipped past her. He walked toward the door, his cane swinging at his side like a nine iron. Glass crunched under his slippers. He eased open the door. Maybe you shouldn't do that, Allison whispered. Ignoring her, he leaned his head outside. His head turned, tilted back. You say that you injured him? I gouged one of his eyes. Bully for you. Perhaps you incapacitated the rotter. I'll bash his head to pulp if... What about Celia? She's not home. Thank God for that. I don't know. I'm... I think maybe he got her last night. Dear God, no. She went on a date with his roommate and never came home. Two of my girls. Two of my sweet, dear... Oh, he shall pay dearly. Dearly. The professor threw the door open wide and stepped out. No! Allison yelled. She ran after him, leaped the area of broken glass, and came down on the flagstone outside the door. The professor was already at the bottom of the stairway. Wait inside. Wait for the cops, please, Allison cried out. Ignoring her, he began to trot up the stairs. Allison darted beneath the stairway, reached between the risers, and grabbed the old man's ankle. Unhand me. He'll kill you, too. We shall see about that. He tried to shake his foot free. Allison almost lost her grip. She wrapped her other hand around the man's bony ankle and hung on. Brakes screamed. Through the gap in the stairs, Allison saw a squad car lurch to a stop, red and blue lights spinning. A man in blue exploded from the driver's side door. He pulled a pistol from his holster and he ran straight over the lawn toward Allison. You win, the professor said. She didn't trust him. She kept her grip on his ankle until the policeman jangled to a stop, crouched, aimed at him, and shouted, Freeze, cocksucker, or I'll blow your fucking brains from here till yesterday. He's not the one, Allison yelled. She stepped out from under the stairway. Professor Teal turned around slowly. I am the owner of this house, he said. We have every reason to believe that the killer is upstairs. Who'd he kill? My roommate, Allison said, and he tried to get me. Is he armed? the policeman asked. Allison noticed he was burly, gruff, ready for action. I don't know, not that I saw. He's still up there? Without waiting for an answer, he started up the stairs. Professor Teal stepped out of his way and came down as the officer continued to the top. Allison went to the professor's side and put an arm around his back. Silly old bear, she said. He smiled, sadly. They both flinched as a gun blast shocked the night. 
Allison's head jerked sideways. She saw Roland at the top of the stairs, arms out. The policeman flopped backward over the rail, yelling with alarm, flapping through the air. His yell stopped short when he hit the ground. For a moment, he performed a weird headstand, legs kicking at the sky. Then he toppled. He lay on his back, twitching. There was a knife in his chest. Roland, at the top of the stairs, turned slowly. He was no longer naked. He wore jeans and an open shirt. The empty socket oozed a red shine over his cheek. It dribbled onto his shirt and chest. With zombie-like slowness, he lifted his left hand to study it with his one eye. The policeman's bullet hadn't missed Roland completely. Allison saw that his forefinger was gone entirely. His middle finger dangled by a strip of flesh, swinging like a pendulum. He clutched at it with his other hand, tore it loose, and sailed it down at Allison like a blunt dart. It dropped into the grass at her feet. He began to descend the stairway. Professor Teal pushed Allison away and stepped almost casually to the foot of the stairs. He raised his cane overhead, prepared to strike when Roland came into range. Allison rushed toward the policeman. He looked dead. She pictured him falling. Had he been holding his revolver? She didn't know, but it was not in either of his hands. She scurried around his body, trying to find the gun. Where is it? She looked toward the stairway in time to see Roland leap. He dove from high above Professor Teal. The old man swung his cane at the flying body. It missed Roland's head and broke across his shoulder. Roland slammed Dr. Teal to the ground. Allison jerked the knife from the policeman's chest, whirled, and ran at the sprawled, struggling men. Using a fist, Roland hammered the professor's nose. He rolled off. He was on his back, pushing himself up with his right arm. He raised his injured hand as if signaling Allison to halt. Allison flung herself onto him. He fell back. He tried to push her away, fingers and stumps thrusting at her face. She drove the knife down hard. Roland squealed. Then his right hand clubbed her ear. Stunned by the impact, she felt herself being shoved off him. On her side, she saw Roland grab the knife handle. The blade had pierced his left nipple, but it hadn't gone deep. A rib must have stopped it. Roland yanked the knife out. His ravaged hand reached for Allison. She rolled, scurried to her feet, and ran. She ran for the street. The dewy grass was slippery, but she ran all out, flinging her legs out with long, quick strides, pumping her arms. The loose cuff on the end of its chain whipped across her knuckles, her forearm, sometimes lashed her side or breast. She heard Roland gasping and whimpering behind her. Not very far behind her. She didn't dare to look. Faint white plumes puffed from the exhaust pipe of the police car. One foot pounded the sidewalk. The other foot landed in the grass at the other side. She sprang from the curb and rushed toward the driver's side door of the squad car. Turning, she glanced over her shoulder. Roland hit the hood belly first and slid across it, teeth bared, ruined hand reaching for her, knife clenched in his other hand. Allison spun away from the reaching hand. Its two fingertips grazed her belly. Stumbling backward, she grabbed the handle of the driver's door. She jerked open the door leaped inside, and slammed the door shut while Roland was squirming off the hood. The window was open. She started to crank it up. Roland stumbled toward her. The glass slid higher. He stabbed. His knife blade pounded the window and skittered down with a grating whine like fingernails on a chalkboard. Allison released the emergency brake. Roland opened the door. Allison cried out, No! How could she not have locked it? She rammed the shift lever to drive and stomped the gas pedal to the floor. The car surged forward. Roland yelled. The door bumped against its frame. 
Allison swerved away from the curb to miss a parked Volkswagen. She looked at the side mirror. Roland was sprawled face down on the pavement, half a block away. Chapter 31 Jake entered the dispatcher's cubicle, nodded a greeting to Martha, who looked back at him with grim eyes, and turned to face the girl. She was sitting on one of the molded plastic chairs that belonged in the waiting area outside the cubicle. It must have been brought in so she wouldn't have to wait alone. She held a plastic coffee cup in both hands. The left side of her face was red and puffy. She wore Martha's old brown cardigan over a blue nightgown. She looked up from her coffee as Jake approached. I'm Jake Corey, he said. I'm in charge of the investigation. She nodded. Would you like to step this way? She glanced at Martha, who nodded that it was all right. She stood up. Jake held the door open for her. She walked stiffly, staring down at her coffee as if concerned about spilling it. Though she must have been about twenty years old, she had the look of a hurt and frightened little girl. Jake pulled the door shut and stepped to her side. Where are we going? she asked. Just over here. He gestured toward Barney's office. We can't talk about this in front of Martha. She walked beside him. Are you all right? he asked. Yeah. He opened Barney's door and flicked the switch. Overhead fluorescent lights came on. He followed the girl into the room. You can sit in the chief's seat, he told her. Behind the desk? It'll be more comfortable. She stepped around the desk, set her coffee cup on the blotter, and sat down. The stuffed chair bobbed and squeaked. She rolled it forward as if to take shelter behind the big protective desk. Her hands curled around the sides of the coffee cup. Jake sat in a folding chair across from her. You're Allison? Yes, Allison Sanders. Dr. Teal told me what you did. You're a very brave young lady. Is he all right? He's fine. He's very upset, of course. The policeman. Is he dead? Yes. I'm sorry. So am I. You didn't get him, did you? It wasn't a question. Not yet, but we will. It was Roland, she said in a steady low voice. I don't know his last name, but he lives in room 240 of Baxter Hall on the campus. Jake took a notepad from his shirt pocket. He quickly scribbled the name and room number. Was he a friend of yours? She shook her head. I've only seen him around. He's a freshman. Do you have any idea why he might have done this? I don't know. Allison rubbed her forehead. He was somehow involved in... His roommate took Celia out last night. That's Celia Jamerson. She was living with... Celia Jamerson? Jake asked, surprised. He saw the slim girl sitting by the road, scuffed and bleeding, holding her trembling arm. A van tried to hit her Thursday, Jake said. Allison nodded. She went out with Roland's roommate last night and she didn't come home. I went over to the dorm this afternoon to ask Roland about it. That was the only time I ever really talked to him. He said they'd gone to some motel in Marlow, but I didn't really believe him. She met Jake's gaze with weary, knowing eyes. I think Roland killed her. Maybe he killed Jason, too. Jason is the roommate. Maybe he's in on it, but I don't think so. What happened after you spoke with Roland? I went over to a friend's house. We had dinner. Then I walked home. The place was dark. Helen's door was shut. I thought she'd gone to bed, but I guess she must have already been dead. Roland must have been hiding somewhere. I went up to my room and went to sleep. He woke me up. He got a handcuff on me, and he put tape on my mouth. He was naked. I thought that what he wanted to do was, you know, rape me. I mean, I'm sure that is what he wanted to do, not just kill me, or he wouldn't have bothered with the cuffs and tape. Anyway, we fought, and I... 
I blinded him in one eye. Her right hand left the coffee cup. She lifted her thumb and stared at it. I washed. Martha let me wash up. She found a key that opened the cuff and gave me her sweater. She's very nice. You said that Roland was naked. He had on a belt, that's all. Did you notice anything peculiar about his appearance? She looked at Jake and raised her eyebrows. You mean, like a tattoo or birthmark or something? Did you get a look at his back? Or feel it? I don't think so. Why? I just wonder if he had any kind of a bruise or bulge down his spine. I don't know. Not that I noticed. Why? It's a long story. I'd rather not get into it right now. After you gouged his eye, what happened? I got away. I ran downstairs to warn Helen, but she was... Allison caught her lower lip between her teeth. She shook her head. Then you went outside? Jake asked. Yeah, I went down and broke into Dr. Teal's kitchen, and he came out to help. Okay, fine. He's filled me in from there, up to the point where you ran for the patrol car. Well, that's about all. Then Roland almost got me, but I drove away and... He was lying in the street the last time I saw him. I drove here to the police station and told Martha what happened. She sent a car and ambulance to the house and phoned someone. She called our chief of police. He phoned me and I went over. Could you describe this Roland? He's... 18, I guess. Skinny. About 5'7", black hair. He's minus his left eye and two fingers of his left hand, and he's got a knife wound on his left nipple. He won't get far in that condition. I guess not. Did you notice if he had a car? I don't know. There was a VW bug on the street by the house. I almost hit it with the police car. It might not have been his, but... A yellow bug with a banner on its aerial? Jake asked. He felt excited. He felt sick. I don't know about the banner, but I'm pretty sure the car was yellow. My God, he muttered. What? It was him. He tried to pick up my daughter this afternoon. A corner of Allison's lip curled up. Your daughter? She could tell there was something wrong with him, and she ran away. Jesus. But she's all right? It threw a scare into her, but she's okay. How old is she? Four and a half. She lives with her mother. Jake wondered why he added that. He stood up. It's time I go after the guy. Allison, do you have a place to stay? The house? I don't think so. Well, Professor Teal has a spare room downstairs. The odds of Roland showing up again are slim to none, I think. But until he's accounted for... You mean I need to disappear for a while? Just to be on the safe side. I don't know. I guess I could check into a motel. I don't have my purse, though. You're welcome to stay at my place. I'll be out anyway. Thank you, but... It's comfortable. There's food and drink in the fridge, and that way I'll know where you are and I won't have to worry about you. She made a small, slightly crooked smile. You'd worry about me? Yes. That's nice. Jake felt his face redden. Well, you're also our main witness. Allison picked up her coffee cup. It was still full. They left Barney's office and returned to the dispatcher's cubicle. Allison will be coming with me, Jake said. Allison set her cup on Martha's desk. Thanks for the use of the sweater, she said, and for helping. No problem, honey, Martha said. Allison started to unbutton the sweater. Martha held up a hand. You keep that on or you'll catch a chill. Grinning, she added, And you don't want to give Jake any ideas. Not that he's not a perfect gentleman. You can just send it back to me when you're done with it. Allison thanked her again. They left and went outside to Jake's car. Allison climbed into the passenger seat. Walking around to the driver's door, 
Jake scanned the area. He saw no cars moving on the nearby streets. He saw no parked Volkswagens. He got in and started the engine. You didn't notice anyone behind you on the way over, did you? He asked. No, and I was looking. I was afraid he might come after me. The shape you left him in, he's probably not coming after anyone. He might very well be dead or dying by now. I hope so, she muttered. I'd like to find him alive, Jake said. Find him dead, he thought. And you probably won't find the damned snake thing. It's got no use for a dead man. The fucker will pull a disappearing act and turn up in someone else, and you'll be back to square one. Jake watched the rearview mirror as he drove. The road behind him was clear, but Roland could be following far behind and driving with his headlights off. Jake turned onto a side street, killed his lights, and swung to the curb. We'll wait here for a while. Okay. He shut off the engine. The silence that suddenly followed seemed strange. He smiled at Allison. I'm sure we're not being followed. This is just a precaution. He glanced at her bare legs. Her negligee was very short. Her open hands rested on her thighs as if to hold the gown down. An awareness came to Jake, suddenly, that he was alone in the car with a very attractive young woman who was no doubt naked except for the skimpy nightgown and Martha's sweater, and he was taking her to his home. The awareness gave him a warm feeling that threatened to become more than that. Watch yourself, he warned. The last thing she needs is to get the idea that you're getting turned on. Turned on? Forget it, Corey. He rubbed his sweaty hands on his pants and looked at the side mirror. Looks all right, he said. Though he felt sure that Roland wasn't tailing them, he decided to take a roundabout course to his house. He knew that he should make the trip as fast as possible, drop her off, and start searching for Roland. But he wasn't eager to find Roland. And he wasn't eager to get rid of Allison. She was very quiet. Jake wondered what was going on in her mind. Nothing pleasant, probably. She'd gone through hell tonight. Most people never have to face such an ordeal. If they do, they don't often survive to cope with the emotional trauma. Things must look pretty bleak, he said. Allison turned to him. I'm alive, she said. I feel pretty lucky. It took a lot more than luck. I don't know if I deserve it, though. I mean, why me? This must be how people feel when they survive an airline crash. Kind of guilty that they're still alive when so many others aren't. I suppose so, Jake said. Do you have classes tomorrow? I'll probably cut them. I don't think I could handle sitting in a classroom. That's probably best. I hope this will all be over by then. But if it's not, I won't want you going anywhere. You and I will be the only ones who know where you are. And I'd like to keep it that way until further notice, okay? That's the only way we can be certain you're secure. No one to tell, she said. What about your parents? They're in Marin County. You could call them if you want. No reason to stir them up. They'd go hysterical on me. Boyfriend? Smooth, Jake thought. Slipped it right in. He felt vaguely ashamed of himself. We broke up, she said. Tonight, as a matter of fact. It's been a banner night. After a few moments of silence, she added, I should probably phone him in the morning. Let him know I'm okay. Fine. Just don't tell him where you are. Fat chance of that, Allison said. Jake saw his house just ahead. He decided to circle the block before taking Allison in. Just as a precaution, he told himself. You don't think someone sent Roland over? No, nothing like that. He could get to someone, though. If nobody knows where you are, nobody can tell him. There's more to this than you're letting on, isn't there? Jake hesitated, then answered, Yes. And it has something to do with Roland's back. You're sharp, Jake said, smiling at her. 
Must be pretty bad if you're afraid to tell me. It's a long story, Jake said. And we're almost home. Maybe it's something I should know. Jake didn't answer. He steered around the final corner, checked once more to be sure there was no Volkswagen in sight, then swung into the driveway of his house. Allison held the hem of her negligee to prevent it from sliding up as she scooted off the car seat. Jake shut the door after she was out. He walked backward across his yard, a hand resting on his holstered gun, his head turning slowly, eyes scanning the neighborhood as if he expected Roland to charge out of the darkness. He didn't seem nervous, though, just careful. Allison felt safer in his presence. She didn't like knowing that he would leave in just a few minutes. He opened the door to his house. Allison followed him inside. The lights were already on, the curtains shut. The warmth of the house felt good after the chill outside. Just make yourself at home, Jake said. The kitchen is over here. He led the way. Allison began to unbutton her sweater, but stopped when she remembered what she was wearing underneath. Jake turned on the kitchen light. There's some food, soft drinks, and beer in the refrigerator. Help yourself. He pointed at a cupboard. Hard stuff in there, in case you get the urge. What's your daughter's usual bedtime? Oh, Kimmy's not... <laughs> What's your hourly rate? In my prime, five bucks per hour. For Kimmy, no charge. Well, that's good, since she isn't here. They exited the kitchen. Sofa, he announced, walking in front of it, where I'll stretch out when I get back. Television? He bent over the coffee table, picked up the remote control, and turned the TV off and on, demonstrating. He smiled a bit self-consciously. Allison followed him to the bathroom. He turned on the light. Fine if you want to take a bath or shower or something, he said, and suddenly blushed. I could use one. There's towels and stuff in the closet here. He nodded as they passed a dark doorway. Kimmy's room. Her bed's a little small for you. He opened the door of a linen closet and pulled folded sheets and a pillowcase down from the shelves. Then he stepped into his own bedroom. He turned the light on. The bed was unmade. Allison guessed that he had been sleeping when the call came that night. He walked over to the bed. Want to give me a hand with the sheets? I'll take care of that, Allison told him. Well, no problem, she said. It'll give me something to do after you're gone. It was a small lie. She had no intention of taking his bed, forcing him to sleep on the sofa when he returned from hunting down Roland. Jake set the sheets and pillowcase on the end of the bed. He entered his closet. When he came out, he was holding a shotgun. Have you ever fired one of these? he asked. Allison nodded. I've gone duck hunting with Dad a few times. Hell, more than a few times. He handed the shotgun to her. It was a bolt-action 12-gauge. She opened the bolt enough to see a shell in the chamber, then closed it. There are three more in the clip, Jake said. Okay. Keep it close to you. Just don't shoot me when I come back. Allison smiled. The color suddenly drained from his face. What is it? Maybe that wasn't such great advice. He sat on the end of the bed and frowned up at her. I want you to brace the bedroom door shut before you turn in. If I try to force my way in, use the shotgun. Are you crazy? I don't expect anything like that to happen, but when you come out in the morning, Keep me covered if I'm here and have me take my shirt off. Then take a good look at my back. If there's a bulge going up my spine as if I've got a snake under my skin, blow me away. Try to hit the bulge. If you don't nail the thing, it'll probably come out as soon as I'm dead and it might come after you. She stared at Jake. He meant it. Jesus Christ, she muttered. Invasion of the body snatchers, Jake said. But it's for real. This snake thing was up the back of the guy who tried to run down Celia. 
He'd got into Ronald Smeltzer over at the Oakwood Inn Thursday night, just before he blew off his wife's head. And now I'm pretty sure it's in Roland. It's some kind of parasite that takes control and turns people into killers. It's conceivable that it might get into me when I catch up with Roland. I certainly don't intend for that to happen, but do us both a favor and blast me if I come in with a bulge in my back. And try to kill it, too. Or at least make sure it doesn't get close to you. Allison was numb. Jake stood up. You okay? She stared at him. He stepped close to her. He put his hands on her shoulders. I'm sorry, I had to tell you. The weight of the shotgun pulled her arms down. He lifted it away from her, took her gently by one elbow, and led her down the hall to the living room. He guided her to the sofa. She sank onto it. He propped the shotgun beside her, went away, and came back. Maybe this will help, he said. He placed a mug of beer with a white frothy head in her hands. He ripped open a bag of potato chips and set it on the cushion so it leaned against her thigh. She smelled the pleasant aromas of beer and chips. From the odor, she knew that the chips were sour cream and onion flavor, one of Helen's favorites. She looked up at Jake. He managed a thin smile, but his eyes were sad. Everything will be okay, he said. Then he crouched in front of her. Allison? Huh? You're acting zoned. I'll be all right. In a while. What I just told you? It's a secret, right? At least until Tuesday. Then we'll be going public. Nobody will believe it. You do. I wish I didn't. Jake put a hand on her knee. Get a good night's sleep. She pressed a hand on top of his. Watch out, she said. Come back safe. Chapter 32 The second floor hallway of the dorm was deserted. Only a few of the overhead fluorescent lights had been left on for the night, giving off a cool, desolate illumination that added to Jake's uneasiness. Bands of light showed beneath some of the doors. Jake heard music coming from one of the rooms and the sound of a shower from the bathroom. He stopped in front of Roland's door. No light came through the gap at its bottom. Taking out his wallet, he spread the bill compartment and removed a thin plastic case. He slipped the lock pick and torque wrench from the case. The burglary tools were a gift from Chuck, who had provided lessons for the price of a six-pack. Jake had never quite planned to use them for an illegal entry. Nevertheless, he'd carried them in his wallet for the past two years, mostly to please Chuck, but also telling himself they might come in handy if he ever locked himself out of his house. Lately, he'd picked the house lock several times for Kimmy because she got a kick out of it. The recent practice paid off. In less than a minute, the lock of Roland's door clicked, and Jake eased the door open half an inch. He put away the burglary tools. He didn't expect Roland to be in the room. He'd found no yellow VW in the dorm parking area, and Roland had to know that Allison would tell the police where he lived. But the guy was hurting. He might go to ground anywhere, even in his own room. Jake drew his revolver, stepped up against the wall for cover, and shoved open the door. It swung open and bumped the wall. He listened and heard nothing. Reaching around the doorframe, he found the switch plate. Light spilled into the hallway. He lunged into the room. Saw no one. The room had a linoleum floor with a tan-fringed rug spread across the center. Jake saw no blood on the floor or the rug. There was a bed along each of the long walls. One bed was made. One wasn't. Beyond the head of each bed stood a desk with a straight-backed chair. The far wall had shelves part way up, then windows to the ceiling. Jake swung the door shut. 
He was standing between two wooden partitions which he guessed were the sides of twin closets. If Roland was here, he was hiding. Under a bed or in one of the closets. Keeping his back to the door, Jake dropped to his hands and knees. Under each bed he found a suitcase. That left the closets. Jake sprang to his feet. He rushed forward and spun around, sweeping his revolver from one closet to the other. The sliding doors of both were open, which left half of each closet out of sight. Jake stepped to the one on his left, ducked, and peered in beneath the hanging clothes. Nobody there. He sidestepped to the other closet. The hangers were empty, giving him a good view through the dim enclosure. Satisfied that the room was safe, he holstered his revolver. If this was Roland's closet, where were the clothes? Had Roland already been here, packed up and fled? It hardly seemed likely that someone in his condition would return for his clothes before taking off. And there was no blood. Remembering the luggage, Jake crouched beside the nearer bed and pulled out the suitcase. It wasn't latched. He opened it. The case was stuffed with folded clothing. The T-shirt on top was printed with a message. He lifted it, shook it open, and read, Ghouls just want to have fun. Jake put down the shirt and pushed the suitcase back under the bed. Roland had been planning a trip. Planning to get out of town before the heat came down on him. Planning, maybe, to travel the roads like the John Doe in the van. Killing whenever the opportunity presented itself, leaving a trail of half-eaten bodies in shallow graves. But he hadn't come back for the suitcase. Not yet. He won't be back, Jake decided. He's blind in one eye, maybe brain-damaged from Allison's thumb, and less two fingers thanks to Rex Davidson's bullet. He's got a stab wound in the chest though it sounded as if that might be superficial. At the very least, he has to be in shock and weak from blood loss. The last thing he'll be concerned about is picking up his suitcase. If he's concerned about anything at this point, if he's not already dead, Jake sat on the edge of the bed. On the wall across from him was a poster of the actress Heather Locklear. He stared at her slender, bare legs. His mind drifted to Allison. Maybe leaving her alone wasn't such a good idea. She's safe, he told himself. You can't be sure of that. Maybe I should go back. The best thing you can do for her is to nail Roland. Before he dies and the damn snake thing gets into someone else. On a shelf below the poster stood a framed family portrait. The young man in the photograph was probably Roland's roommate, Jason, the guy who'd disappeared with Celia. Maybe Roland has a photo of himself, Jake thought. He looked over his shoulder. The wall was covered with grim pictures that looked as if they'd come from magazines. Most of the subjects weren't familiar to Jake, but he recognized one that showed Janet Lee in the shower scene from Psycho. Another was Freddy the killer who wore a battered fedora and a glove with long blades on its fingers. Nightmare on Elm Street, Jake remembered. There was a hideous fat guy holding a chainsaw overhead. There was a group of decomposed zombies, too, one munching on a severed arm. Jake shook his head. The snake thing had certainly chosen a compatible host. Coincidence? He remembered that he was looking for a photo of Roland. Knowing what the guy looked like would help. He stood and wandered to the end of the room. The desktop was clear, except for a bottle of glue and a pair of scissors. Dropping onto the chair, Jake slid open the middle drawer and stared. He'd found his photo of Roland. He felt sickened by it. Body parts floated around the leering face. Numerous breasts, torsos, buttocks, vaginas, and a few arms and legs. These were not cut from magazines. They were too thick. These were snapshots. 
The only part of the girl's anatomy not cascading around Roland's head was her face. Maybe Celia Jamerson, Jake thought. A drop of sweat fell onto Roland's left eye. Jake blotted it with his sleeve, then wiped his face. He lifted the photograph out of the drawer. Beneath it lay the frame. So Roland hadn't slipped it back into the frame after finishing his project. Jake stared at the scissors and glue. The wastebasket was midway between the two desks, close to the wall. Jake crouched over it. The bottom of its white plastic liner was littered with scraps. He upended the wastebasket, sat on the floor, and searched. Most of the shots didn't include the girl's face. The photographer, obviously, had been more interested in views of her lower areas all of which had been snipped out, usually leaving the limbs intact. Jake found three pictures showing the girl's face. The face in all three belonged to the same girl. She wasn't Celia. She wasn't dead, at least not at the time she posed. She smirked. She licked her lips. In one, she sucked her middle finger. Jake slipped a view of the girl's face into his shirt pocket. He scooped up the remaining scraps and dumped them into the wastebasket. In the morning, he would get a search warrant. The room would be photographed and gone over, inch by inch, every item studied and cataloged, every surface closely inspected and checked for prints, the whole area vacuumed for stray bits of hair, fabric, and other particles that might incriminate Roland. Jake took the 8x10 with him and left. After leaving Roland's room, Jake cruised the streets around the campus, looking for the yellow Volkswagen bug with the banner on its aerial, not really expecting to spot it, wanting to return home and make sure that Allison was safe, but knowing that his duty was to search. First the streets near the campus, then the Oakwood Inn. He dreaded the thought of driving out there and entering the dark restaurant. The longer he prowled the streets, however, the more certain he became that the Oakwood was where Roland must have gone. The damned creature seemed to have an affinity for the place, and that's where it had left its eggs. Jake knew that he was procrastinating. He turned onto Summer Street, which bordered the campus on the north. What I'll do, he thought, is go home and get into my gear before heading out there. I'm not going to the Oakwood without my boots and leathers. Roland might be dead. That thing might be loose. And that'll give me a chance to see Allison. He wondered if she was asleep yet. He glanced down a side street, spotted a Volkswagen at the curb, and hit the brakes. He checked the rear view. Clear. He backed up, stopped, and gazed at the car. It was parked beneath a street lamp but the light above it was dead, leaving it in darkness. Jake couldn't make out the color of the VW, but it had a banner on the aerial. This is it. Heart thudding, he turned. He drove straight for the car, his headlights pushed toward it, slowly lighting it up. Yellow. Someone was in the driver's seat. Jake gazed through the windshield, stunned. The man in the VW didn't move. The left side of his face looked black in the glare of the headlights. This had to be Roland. Jake opened his door. He crouched behind it, pulled his revolver and took aim. Step out of the car, he yelled. Roland didn't move. Jake repeated the command. Roland remained motionless. He was dead, unconscious, or faking. Jake stepped away from the door. Keeping his handgun pointed at Roland, he walked slowly forward. He tried to watch Roland through the windshield, but found his gaze drawn downward to the pavement. He wished he had his boots on. His ankles felt bare in spite of the socks. He remembered the machete in the trunk of his car. He considered going back for it. The front bumper of the VW was no more than two yards in front of him. He stared into the darkness beneath it. Glanced at Roland. The right eye was open. It seemed to be watching him. 
This guy is dead. The fucking snake might be anywhere. Like under the car, just waiting for me to get close enough. The skin prickled on the nape of Jake's neck. He backed away, sidestepped at the rear of his car, and dug into his pocket for the keys. He found the trunk key. He fumbled it into the lock and twisted it. The trunk popped open, blocking his view. He snatched out the machete and rushed clear. Roland hadn't moved. Jake saw nothing squirming toward him on the pavement. With the machete in his right hand, the revolver in his left, he hopped onto the curb and approached the passenger side of the VW. When he could see that the windows were rolled up, he dashed to the middle of the street. The windows on the driver's side were shut too. Whether Roland was alive or dead, the snake thing was still in the car. Probably. Either inside Roland, or writhing around loose, trapped. Jake stepped close to the driver's window and peered in. He glimpsed the gaping hole where Roland's left eye should have been, and quickly looked away from it. Roland was reclined in the seat, the front of his shirt bloody, his head tipped back slightly against the headrest. His position prevented Jake from checking the back of his neck. The head beams left the lower areas of the car's interior in darkness. If that creature was on a seat or the floor, Jake couldn't see it. There was only one way to find out whether it was still up Roland's spine. Open the door, shove him forward, and look. No way. Not a chance. Jake holstered his pistol. Watching Roland, he walked backward to his car, slid in, and took a pack of matches from the glove compartment. He got out. He backstepped to the trunk and picked up the can of gasoline. He poured gas onto the curb beside the VW, onto the pavement behind the car and near its driver's side, then passed the front to the curb again, completing the circle. Then he splashed the car dousing it with the pungent liquid and running trails out to the surrounding gas. Finally, he crouched and flung gas into the space beneath the undercarriage. He stopped when the can felt nearly empty. He wanted to save some gasoline, just in case. He capped the can. Hurrying into the road, he stepped over the wet path of the circle. He set the can down behind him, squatted, struck a match, and touched it to the stained pavement. A low bluish flame with flutters of yellow and orange stretched out in both directions. It met intersecting paths and rolled toward the car. Jake picked up the can and backed away. By the time he reached the far side of the street, the car was a blazing pyre. He could feel its heat warming his clothes and face. The fire lit the night shimmering on the leaves of nearby trees, glowing on the walls and windows of the apartment house beyond it, shining on the hood and windshield of his own car. A car parked behind the VW seemed to be safely out of range. He wondered if he should move his own car, or himself. Hissing popping sounds came from the fire. Then a sharp crack made Jake flinch. He heard glass crash on the pavement. Christ, he muttered. He rushed forward until the wall of fire stopped him. Shielding his eyes, he squinted through the flames at the wide, wedge-shaped gap in the driver's window. Nothing came out. As he watched, flames enveloped Roland. They crawled up from below, sweeping up his face and igniting his hair. Jake gagged as the face blackened and bubbled. Then dense smoke covered the horror. Jake heard distant shouts of, Fire! He heard more windows burst. Then he was rushing around the car, brandishing his machete, peering through the blaze at one broken window after another. Smoke poured from the openings, but nothing else came out. Not yet. The car's gas tank went up with a muffled boom. Jake staggered back as heat blasted against him. A spike of glass flew past his cheek. Another stabbed his thigh. He pulled it out. 
The car was still rocking from the impact. Now it was an inferno. The fuckers cooked, Jake thought. Cooked. It's a goner. For the first time, he noticed a few people watching from the other side of the street. He turned around. More were on the lawn in front of an apartment house. He took a step toward two young men, probably students. One wore a robe. The other wore only boxer shorts. Both men backed away. No wonder, Jake thought. I'm not in uniform. I've got this machete. I'm a policeman, he called. One of you guys call the fire department. I already called, said a brunette woman in pajamas. I hope nobody's in that car. Nobody alive, Jake said. How'd it start? asked the guy in the boxer shorts. Jake shook his head. Then he turned away. The fire was still blazing. Several of the spectators from the other side of the street were inching forward for a better view. When Jake rushed into the road, some of them backed off, and one young couple turned and fled, the woman shrieking. Apparently, they had missed the news that he was a cop, or couldn't bring themselves to trust a guy, cop or not, who was running at them with a machete. Everybody stand clear! Jake yelled. The fire department is on the way! Somebody's in that car, a man shouted, pointing. Get back, Jake warned. A woman turned away, hunched over, and vomited. Everybody move back, back to the sidewalk. There'll be fire trucks coming in. One couple ignored his warning. They were standing over Jake's gas can, frowning at it and muttering to each other. The girl wore a pajama shirt. The guy wore pajama pants. The girl crouched and reached toward the can. Oh, shit, Jake thought. Don't touch that, he snapped. It's evidence. The arsonist might have left prints. Hmm, clever, he thought. Dumb asshole, why didn't you put the can back in your trunk? As the girl backed away, Jake slipped the blade of his machete through the can's handle, raised it, and carried it to his car. No point leaving the thing in sight. The fireboys might not be so easily fooled, and he would have a rough time trying to explain why he torched a vehicle with a suspect still inside. The gas can and machete were locked safely in his trunk by the time he heard the sirens. The firemen rushed at the car with chemical extinguishers. Blasting flames out of the way, they pulled Roland's carcass off the seat and dragged it into the road. Two firemen fogged it with their extinguishers, then left it there and joined those trying to knock down the car fire. Jake looked at the corpse. It was still smoking. It was a charred, featureless hulk. It hardly resembled a human being. If he hadn't watched the body being removed from the car, Jake wouldn't have known whether it was face up or face down. He knew it was face up, but it had no face or ears, or genitals. The surface was a black, cracked crust, flecked with frothy white from the extinguishers. Fluids leaked from cracks in the crust. When the honking blast of the extinguishers went quiet, Jake heard the sizzling sound that came from the body. It sounded like a rib roast. It didn't smell like one. Jake stepped back, struggling not to vomit. A fireman showed up and spread a blanket over the body. Smoke began to seep out from under the edges of the blanket. Jake kept watch. The fire was out, the car a smoldering ruin, by the time the coroner's van arrived. The men stayed inside the van, smoking cigarettes, waiting for Applegate to show up. Soon, Steve arrived in his Lincoln Continental. He climbed out, wearing a warm-up suit and carrying a doctor's bag. He joined Jake. What's going on? This is our man, Jake said, nodding toward the covered corpse. Earlier tonight, he killed a girl and tried to nail her roommate. He killed Rex Davidson. There's a good chance he had our snake thing up his back when he did it. Oh, terrific. Steve muttered, let me guess, 
You want a little on-the-scene exploratory surgery to determine whether it's inside him. Good guess, Jake said. Shit. Steve went to the van and spoke to the men through its open window. They climbed out. Wearing gloves, they uncovered the body and lifted it into a body bag. They zipped the bag. One man retrieved a gurney with folding legs from the rear of the van. They hoisted the bagged remains onto the gurney, rolled it to the van, and pushed it in. Is this a solo job? Steve asked Jake. Or do I get the pleasure of your company? I'll stick with you. Good decision. Congratulations. Have a cigar. Once the cigars were lighted, Jake followed Steve into the rear of the van. He pulled the doors shut. The lights remained on. The smoke from the cigars drifted up into ceiling vents. Steve knelt on one side of the body bag, Jake at its end with his back to the doors. He drew his revolver. Yes, Steve said. I was about to suggest as much. The thing's probably dead, Jake whispered, if it's in him at all. If it remained between the spine and the epidermis, I would agree with you. But just suppose, when the situation heated up, it took a trip into this fellow's stomach. It passed through Smeltzer's stomach, so obviously it has no problem with the acids. This guy must have cooked for fifteen minutes, Jake pointed out. Steve raised an eyebrow. Charred on the outside, rare in the middle. That's how I prefer my steaks. Jake squinted at Steve through his rising cigar smoke. So if the thing went deep, it might be all right? Mm-hmm. Very likely fit as a fiddle. Jake muttered. Shit. Cigar clamped in his teeth, Steve opened his satchel and pulled on a pair of surgical gloves. He slid the zipper down the length of the body bag. In spite of the van's ventilation system and the aroma of the cigars, the stench that rose from the burnt corpse choked Jake. His eyes teared as he gagged, but he watched the bag's opening and held his revolver steady. Steve seemed unaffected. He bent over the remains. A few inches above the groin, he noticed a blackened crater. He poked at it with the tip of a gloved finger. Was this fellow shot? he asked, his words slurred by the cigar in his teeth. Just in the hand? This might be the creature's exit. Uh, couldn't the fire have made that? Steve shrugged. He pushed with his finger. The charred surface in the center of the crater crumbled and his finger went in deep. He wiggled it around. Nope, he said. He pulled his finger out. Then he grabbed the far side of the body bag, lifted, and pulled it toward him. The corpse rolled out, bumping face down onto the gurney. Black flakes fell off it. Jake switched the revolver to his left hand long enough to wipe his right hand dry on his trouser leg. Steve spent a while looking at the back of the corpse. Then he took a scalpel from his satchel. He turned his eyes to the barrel of Jake's revolver. Try to miss my hands if we have a sudden visitor. They mean a lot to me. What about that exit hole on the other side? Jake asked. If that's what it is, Steve replied. Ready? Jake eased his forefinger over the trigger. No, but go ahead. Steve pressed the blade of the scalpel to the nape of the neck, pushed it in, and slid it downward. Jesus, Jake muttered, watching the crust of skin crumple at the edges of the incision. Nothing came bursting out. Steve brought the blade again to the back of the neck. He inserted its point into the slit and poked around. I think we may be all right, he said. He grinned at Jake. Just watch it don't come popping out his arse. Setting the scalpel aside, Steve used both hands to spread open the incision. The outer layer of black cracked and flaked off with a sound like dry leaves being crushed. Steve dug in with all the fingers of his right hand. 
After probing inside the wound for a few moments, he said, The thing was here, all right. I can feel a definite separation of the lower epidermal layer from the muscle fascia. Picking up the scalpel again, Steve ran the blade the rest of the way down the spine. He did more exploring with his hands. Yep, he said. So it was in him, and now it's gone, Jake said. That's how it looks. Took a powder through the stomach hole. Uh, that's my professional opinion. Of course, the thing might still be inside him, lying low, so to speak. Won't know that, for sure, until I've done a full autopsy. I'll get the boys to bag him up again. We'll keep him in cold storage, and I'll call you over so you can ride shotgun when it's time for the big event. Though, as I said, I'm almost sure it's not in him at this point. If it's not, Jake said, the thing is either ashes inside his car or else it's not. And looking for a new home, Steve said. Or already found one, added Jake. Chapter 33 The ringing of a bell woke Allison up. She raised her face off the pillow and turned her head. After a moment of confusion, she realized that she was lying on the sofa in Jake's living room. The lamps were on. No light came through the curtains, so it wasn't yet morning. The bell rang again. She threw back the sheet and sat up. A strap of her negligee hung off her shoulder. She brushed it back into place. The front door was open a few inches. The guard pulled taut. Jake, she remembered, had warned her to barricade herself in the bedroom. Not wanting to take his bed from him, she had chosen to sleep on the sofa. She had heeded his warning enough, however, to fasten the door chain to prevent him from entering while she slept. Who is it? she asked. Jake. A belt with a holstered revolver swung through the opening and dropped to the floor. I'll step away. Bring the shotgun, unchain the door, then back off and keep me covered. Just a minute. She lifted the sweater off the coffee table and slipped into it. She fastened the middle button to keep it shut across her breasts. The shotgun was propped against the table. She picked it up and went to the door. She pushed the door shut. She glanced down at herself. The negligee was awfully short. Her face heated. He's seen me in it before, she told herself. Hell, he's seen me in nothing else. She slid the guard chain to the end of its runner, let it drop, and opened the door. Jake was standing on the lawn. He shook his head. That's no way to cover me. Shrugging, Allison lifted the butt of the shotgun off the floor. She clutched the weapon in both hands, but she didn't aim at him. She backed away. Jake entered the house and shut the door. A miasma of unpleasant odors came in with him. Though more than two yards in front of him, Allison smelled gasoline, cigar smoke, sweat, and a disgusting, sweet stench that she couldn't recognize. Jake's face and clothes were smeared with soot. One leg of his tan trousers was torn at the thigh and matted with dry blood. What happened to your leg? Flying glass. No big deal. He untucked his shirt, opened the buttons, and took it off. Then he turned around. Allison stepped closer. The odors got worse, but his back looked fine. She reached out with her left hand and ran fingers down his spine. She felt no bulges. His skin was cool and damp. Except for the stink, she told him. You're fine. What happened? Jake turned to face her. I found Roland. He's dead. He was already dead by the time I found him. Allison nodded. She suddenly felt sick and didn't know whether it was the god-awful odors from Jake or learning that Roland had died. I killed him, she thought. It's good that he's dead. I killed him. It was self-defense. He deserved to die after what he did to Helen, what he did, maybe, to Celia. 
Her eyes locked on to Jake's eyes. Did I kill him? By gouging his eye? He had a bad stomach wound when we found him. I suspect that was the finishing touch. A stomach wound? So it wasn't me who killed him? Wasn't you. Thank God. I'd better take a shower before you pass out on me. You're looking a little green around the gills. She nodded. What is that odor? I found Roland in his car parked on a side street near the campus. I didn't want to take the chance of... Remember that snake thing I told you about? I don't think I'm likely to forget that. Well, I doused Roland's car with gasoline and torched it. With him in it. Christ! The idea was to burn the snake thing. Afterward, I had the coroner cut Roland open to see if we could find it. Jake shook his head. Wasn't in him. We think it left from his stomach. That's what made the wound that probably polished him off. It knew that Roland was on his last legs. Wouldn't be any more use. It broke out of him? Like that monster in Alien? Something like that. We're hoping Roland was inside the car when it happened. All the windows were rolled up, so if the thing was trapped in the car, it almost has to be dead. I searched the rubble afterward. Couldn't find any trace of it. But that doesn't mean much. Might have been nothing left but a heap of ashes. It might be dead then, or it might not? We're going to assume it's alive until we know otherwise. And if it is alive? Then it'll try to find someone else to get in, and we're pretty much back to where we started. I'm sorry. I wish I could tell you the whole mess is over. But maybe it is. I'd bet four weeks of my salary that the damned thing is dead, but I won't bet your life on it. He rubbed the shirt sleeve across his face, smearing sweat and soot. I'd better take that shower now. He stepped past Allison and headed for the hallway. When she noticed the sound of the water running, she realized that she hadn't moved since Jake left. She dragged the shotgun over to the door and propped it against the wall. She attached the guard chain. The disgusting odors still filled the room. In the kitchen, she searched until she found candles in a drawer. She lit three of them, dripped wax onto paper plates, and stuck them upright. She carefully carried all three to the living room and arrayed them in a line on the coffee table. Sitting on the sofa, she leaned back and propped her feet on the table between two of the candle plates. She wondered if Jake would come back into the room after his shower. Maybe they could have a drink together. He'd been through a nightmare of his own tonight. Burning Roland, watching while the coroner cut him open. That one odor, the really bad one. And he apologized to me for not having better news. Maybe he won't like seeing the candles. They might remind him of what happened earlier. Allison sniffed. The nasty odors seemed faint. She puffed out the candles and carried them back into the kitchen. Then she went to the front door. She opened it enough to peer out, then shut it again, removed the guard chain, and swung the door wide. The breeze smelled wonderful. It blew her hair. It felt cool and good on her body. She opened her sweater. The breeze caressed her through the negligee, moved up her bare legs. It felt just as fine as before, when she was standing naked at her bedroom window. And then it stopped feeling fine, as the memory surged in of waking to find Roland above her. Moaning, she swung the door shut. She leaned against it, head against her crossed arms. Allison? She turned around. Jake was standing in the hallway entrance, wearing a robe. Are you all right? he asked. Not very. How about you? Better. I was just letting in some fresh air. She saw his gaze stray downward, then back to her face. Just in time to catch my blush, she thought. I guess I'd better hit the sack, Jake said. Don't you want to trade places? 
I'm sure my bed would be a lot more comfortable for you. The sofa's fine. Really. It's up to you. He rubbed his chin. Well, see you in the morning, Allison. Sleep tight, huh? Yeah, you too. He turned away. Allison looked down at herself. You sure gave him an eyeful, she thought. He noticed, too, but he didn't get funny. That's good. Would have been awkward if he'd decided it was some kind of an invitation. Was it some kind of an invitation? She wondered. How come I didn't bother pulling the sweater shut before I turned around? He probably thinks I did it on purpose. I bet that's why he ran off so fast. He came in, maybe to spend a while talking, saw me like this, and decided he'd better beat a quick retreat. Scared him away. Don't flatter yourself, she thought. He left because he's had a long, rough day, and he's tired. Probably didn't care, one way or the other, about me and my nightie. She took off the sweater. Standing there, she folded it slowly and looked down the hallway. Jake was probably in bed already. Allison moved quietly through the room, turning off lights. There was no need for them now that Jake was here. It felt good, knowing that he was in the house. Allison lay down on the sofa and pulled up the sheet. He didn't have to rush off like that, she thought. We should have talked for a while. She imagined walking down the dark hallway to his room, asking if he was asleep, telling him that she didn't want to be alone, not just yet. Why not crawl into his bed while you're at it? Sure. You just dumped Evan because he wasn't interested in anything but making it, and you're hot to jump in bed with a guy you hardly know. I am not. I wouldn't do that. Why am I even thinking about it? After all that's happened tonight. What do you want to think about? Helen? She saw Helen on her bed, glasses crooked. The image clenched her with cold, tight fists. She lurched up and gazed through the darkness, gasping. When Jake woke up, his room was bright. He squinted at the alarm clock on the nightstand. Almost ten o'clock. But what day was this? Monday. He rolled onto his belly and pushed his face into the soft warmth of the pillow. Need to get up, he thought. Need to... What? Go back to where you found Roland. Check around. Talk to people. What for? See if they saw anything. A snake in the grass. Shit. It seemed pointless. Need to do something, though. Need to make sure the thing's dead is what? Cause if it's not dead, Allison, she's here, sleeping on the sofa, and me in my bed. Congratulations, Corey. Missed your big chance. It would have been wrong, taking advantage of the circumstances. I know, he thought. Don't I know? Fell asleep last night telling myself just how wrong it would be. And how nice. Even if we'd done no more than hold each other, it would have been fine. He remembered how small and vulnerable she had looked sitting behind Barney's desk, holding onto the coffee cup as if it were a talisman that would keep harm away. And sitting in the car, that nighty barely covering her legs, and when he came out after the shower and her sweater was open. Jake's penis was pushing uncomfortably against the mattress. He rolled onto his back to relieve the pressure. Real nice, he thought. The knight in shiny armor has a hard-on. Sorry about that, Allison. Allison. A pretty name. Allison Sanders. He wondered if she was still asleep. It would be nice to see her sleeping on the sofa, probably looking as peaceful as a little kid. He couldn't go sneaking in and watch her, though. What would she think if she woke up? Go in and make a pot of coffee. Take a cup to her. We'll sit for a while, talking. Allison will be all sleepy. Her hair must. Maybe she'll have the sheet wrapped around her, so neither of us will have to be embarrassed about her nightgown. 
Take your robe to her. That way, she'll know your intentions are honorable. Jake pushed aside the bedsheet. He rolled off the bed and stood up. He was shirtless and wearing his pajama pants. Though his erection had diminished, the front of his pants still bulged somewhat. He went to the dresser, planning to put on his pajama shirt before leaving the room, but stopped abruptly at the foot of his bed. Allison was asleep on the floor. She lay curled on her side, a pillow under her head, her bare feet protruding from the sheet that covered her to the shoulders. Jake stared down at the girl, bewildered by her presence. Unless she had walked in her sleep, she had come in here on purpose, needing the comfort of being close to him. She must have been suffering, feeling alone in the other room, needed a friend. So she'd snuck in here and made her bed on the floor to be near him. I should have stayed up with her, he thought. I should have realized. He crouched in front of her. Wisps of hair hung over the side of her face. Her mouth was open, its lower corner buried in the pillow. The peaceful way she looked reminded Jake of Kimmy. But unlike Allison, Kimmy had never had a swollen, discolored jaw. But Kimmy did have a bruise on her arm. She'd shown it to him when they got to Jack in the Box last night. Should have given Barbara a bruise for her arm. Ever hurts Kimmy again, it'll be a court order. How could the bitch slug her own daughter like that? How could anybody slug a girl like Kimmy? Or a girl like Allison? The guy who did that is dead. A hunk of burnt meat. Deserved it, the bastard. Pounded Allison, tried to rape and kill her. Reaching out, Jake lightly brushed the hair upward from the puffed and purple side of her face. He slipped it behind her ear. Good morning, Allison said, her voice quiet and husky. She turned her head, rolling back until her rump touched the bed frame. She smiled lazily up at Jake but with only the right side of her face. The swollen left side didn't move much. I didn't mean to wake you, Jake said. You didn't. I've been awake for a while. Playing possum, hmm? A little bit. Mostly too ruined to move. Hard floor, Jake said. Least of my problems. I feel like I've been hit by a Mack truck. You look like you've been hit by a Mack truck. The right side of her lip curled up, baring some teeth. That bad, is it? Not that bad. You look pretty fine, all things considered. Did you sleep well down here? Not bad, all things considered. You snore, you know. Sorry. It, it was nice. Kept me reminded you were there. If you... I would have stayed on my own side of the bed, you know. Kept my hands to myself, especially if I didn't wake up. She smiled slightly with the working half of her face. Then the smile faded, and she studied his eyes. We'll never know, she said. We'll never know. Would you like some breakfast? Sure. You can wear my robe. It's on a chair by the door. Thanks. Jake stood up and went to the dresser. He took out his pajama shirt. With his back to Allison, he put it on and fastened the buttons. Then he turned around. She was sitting cross-legged. The sheet spread over her lap and knees. She hugged the pillow to her breasts. If you've got something more elaborate in mind than tricks or fruit loops, I'd be glad to make it. I might as well do something useful. I'll have you know I'm a pretty fair cook. I haven't burnt anything... Since last night, he thought. I trust you, Allison said. But I'll help. What's a woman for? She asked, a gleam of something that might have been mischief in her eyes. I'll pick you up a toothbrush. Do you need anything else? I could use some clothes, Allison said, and took a drink of coffee. I feel like a convalescent, wandering around in my nightgown and your robe. I could go over to your place and pick up some things, Jake said. How long are you planning to keep me here? 
as long as possible. She raised an eyebrow. Tonight, anyway. It was Roland who was after me, she said. Not that I have anything against sticking around. You've got a nice floor. But he's dead, and he's the one who wanted to get me. So even if that snake thing is still alive, there's no reason to think it would try to find me. I hope you're right. But it was in the driver of the van when he tried to run down Celia. Then it was in Roland when she disappeared. Maybe that's just a coincidence. On the other hand, maybe it's the creature that chooses the targets no matter who it's in. Allison curled up her lip. She could have done without that theory. So, I just have to lay low until you find it. Until it's accounted for one way or the other. Okay. I'm sorry. Did you know that you spend a lot of time apologizing for stuff that's not your fault? Sorry. He grinned. Allison liked his smile. She hadn't seen much of it. When you get back, am I supposed to keep you covered again and look at your back? Yep. At least it's a good excuse to get your shirt off. Jake took a last drink of coffee, set down his cup, and rubbed his mouth with a napkin. I'd better get going. Allison walked ahead of him to the front door. Don't you wear a uniform? Usually. I'd like to see you in it sometime. Betcha look dashing. Hm. The fuzz. I crashed a patrol car yesterday, he said. That was careless. Yeah. Wouldn't look right, I think, driving around in uniform in my own car. What time will you be back? He shook his head. I have no idea. It'll depend on how things go. Well, should I make supper for you? I don't want you starving. Say, if I'm not back by seven, why don't you go ahead and eat without me? Okay. He stepped past Allison and opened the door. Be careful, she said. You too. If there's any kind of trouble, you see someone suspicious hanging around, anything like that, call the station and ask for Barney. He'll be there, and he knows the whole story. All right. You know where everything is? I'll be fine, Jake. Don't worry. Nodding, he hesitated in the doorway as if reluctant to leave. Then he started to turn away. Allison touched his arm. He looked into her eyes. She stepped against him, embracing him, tilting back her head. Jake put his arms around her. Holding her gently, he kissed her mouth. When his lips went away, he cupped the back of her head with one hand. She pressed her face to the side of his neck. I'd better get going. I know. Allison squeezed him hard, then stepped back. See you later, she said. He stared at her. He kissed her once more, then turned away. Allison stood in the doorway, watching him until the car moved off down the road. Then she shut the door and locked it. She slid the guard chain into place. She leaned against the door, closed her eyes, and lingered in the memory of his body against hers, the feel of his lips on her mouth. Chapter 34 After filling Barney in on all that had happened the previous night, Jake returned to his car. He tore up the photograph of Roland. He felt guilty about damaging evidence, but Roland was dead. There would be no trial, and he didn't want to show the picture around with the naked body parts surrounding the guy's head. Once the parts were removed, he drove out to the place where he had burned the Volkswagen. The car had been towed away, leaving only black smears and ashes. Jake searched there first, spreading the ashes with his shoes. He wasn't sure what he hoped to find. The thing's charred body? The tiny remains of its skeleton, if it had one? When he finished there, he wandered around the area looking at the pavement, the grass strip between the curb and the sidewalk, the sidewalk itself. Thursday, the thing had left some blood on the pavement of Latham Road behind the burning van and in the weeds on the other side. Today, there was nothing to see. 
Jake told himself that the creature had probably died inside the Volkswagen. Maybe he should go over to the yard and sift through the remains of the car's interior. In the poor light, last night, he might easily have missed something. Besides, he'd been tense and eager to get home. He needed to make the search again, thoroughly, and in daylight. Picture in hand, he headed for the apartment house on the corner to begin the door-to-door -door inquiries. Allison hung up the telephone after explaining to Gabby that she wouldn't be able to work for the next few days. He'd heard on the radio about the killings and her narrow escape, so he was sympathetic and said she should take off as much time as she needed. She had another call to make. This one wouldn't be so easy. It was necessary, though. She misdialed and hung up before the ringing started. Her stomach hurt. Her heart pounded. The pulsing of it made her face throb. Sweat slid down her sides. She stood up, took off Jake's robe, sat down again on the sofa, and dialed Evan's number. His phone rang once. Hello? He sounded tense. Hi, it's me. Allison! My God! Are you all right? You heard about last night? Of course I heard about last night. Christ! Are you all right? I'm a little beat up, but I'm okay. My God, I couldn't believe it. You could have been killed. I've just been sick ever since I heard about it. I didn't even go to my classes. You should have called. I did. Just now. I've been through hell. I'm sorry. It hasn't been a picnic for me either. Who was it? Who did it? A freshman named Roland. Some guy you know? I'd met him a couple of times. Was he after you, or what? I guess so. What for? I mean... I guess he wanted to rape and kill me. Jesus Christ! Did he... touch you? He didn't rape me. Thank God for that. You... what? Fought him off? Yeah. Christ! It's my fault. I should have been there. If you'd let me drive you home, you shouldn't have left, you know? That business was just a mistake, like I said. You should have stayed at my place last night. None of this would have happened. Would have happened to Helen regardless, she said. And even if I'd spent the night with you, I would have gone home sooner or later. You should have stayed. Well, I didn't. Where are you now? I'm safe. Well, I know you're safe. The guy's dead, right? They said on the news he got killed in a fire. Yeah. So where are you? I'm not supposed to tell anyone. That's a crock. Who told you that? A policeman. Well, shit! What's the big idea? He thinks I might still be in some danger. I don't get it. The bastard's dead, right? So where's the danger? I'm going to do as I'm told. Since when? Don't be a creep, Evan. I need to see you. You can't. Allison, we have to talk. We are talking. Face to face. I'm not up to a confrontation. She heard him sigh. For a long time, he said nothing. Allison finally broke the silence. I just wanted to let you know that I'm okay. I figured I owed you that. When Evan spoke again, he sounded weary. I honestly didn't know you were asleep last night when I touched you. I love you, Allison. When I think what almost happened to you last night, it kills me. Please, I need to see you. Please, tell me where you are. I'll come over and we'll talk. Just talk, I promise. I'll call you in a day or two. No, please. Allison, I'm so wasted. I didn't sleep at all last night. I can't do anything except think about you. I promise I won't give you any trouble. I just need to see you, to be with you for a while. I'm begging you. Allison shut her eyes and leaned back against the sofa cushion. This was worse than she'd expected. Evan sounded miserable, desperate. 
It's my fault, she thought. I've done this to him. I guess we could meet somewhere, she finally said. How about Wally's? Evan said nothing. That all right? Allison heard a faint sound of ringing. Someone at your door? she asked. Yeah, Evan whispered. The ringing came again. You'd better see who it is. I don't care, he whispered. It can't be you, so I don't care. I'll hang on. I can't go to the door. I'm not wearing anything. I just got out of the shower. The bell rang again. Probably just a salesman anyway. After a few moments, he said, Okay, he's gone. I was saying we could meet at Wally's. That's awfully public. That's the idea. I don't want any hassles. Christ. Al. Okay. Wally's. What time? What time is it now? About noon? I'll need some time to clean up and walk over there. I can pick you up. Thanks anyway. How about one thirty? Okay. I'll buy you lunch. Fine. See you then. She hung up. She didn't want to see Evan. Some things, she thought, you have to do. It won't be so bad. It'll be awful. I'll have to tell him it's over. Tell him face to face and make him understand it's final. It'll be awful, but it won't last forever. Then it will be ended, and I'll come back here and Jake will show up, sooner or later. Jake. Just keep thinking about Jake, and the rest won't be so bad. He'll be here tonight. This is getting nowhere, Jake thought. At more than half the doors he tried, nobody responded. The missing occupants, he supposed, were either in class or at work. Of those people he spoke to, several had watched last night's spectacle, but many claimed ignorance of the entire affair. None admitted to knowing the identity of the young man in the photograph, though three were pretty sure they had seen him on campus at one time or another. Nobody had seen anything, last night or today, that looked like a snake. Nobody had seen or heard anything strange except for the uproar over the car fire. It seemed pointless, but Jake didn't give up. He had gone to every door of every apartment building on this side of the block except the one at the corner. Unlikely, he thought, that anyone so far from the scene noticed anything. But he might as well check anyway, before crossing the road and trying the other side. At the first two apartments on the ground floor, nobody came to the doors. At the third, he heard music inside. He rang the bell. A woman in her late twenties opened the door. She was as tall as Jake, with a terry cloth headband around her black hair, thick eyebrows that almost met in the middle, prominent cheekbones, full lips, a jutting jaw, and broad shoulders. Her breasts strained the fabric of a top that looked like two red bandanas knotted together. Her belly was tanned and flat, striped with a few runnels of sweat. Her hips had the breadth of her shoulders. Instead of pants, she wore something that reminded Jake of a pirate's eye patch, a black strap that slanted down from her hips, a black satin triangle not quite large enough to cover her hairless pubic area. I'm sorry to bother you, Jake said. It's police business. He held his wallet open. She glanced at the badge, ignored the ID card, and licked some sweat from the corner of her mouth. Come on in out of the cold, she said. He stepped into the apartment. In spite of the fan and open windows, the heat seemed worse than it was outside. The woman turned away, and Jake watched her walk to the stereo. A slim black strip clung to the center of her buttocks, leaving the flawless cheeks bare. They flexed as she walked. She seemed as casual about her attire as if she were wearing a three-piece suit. Jake wished she would put on something to cover herself. The woman turned the stereo down and turned around. Want some iced tea? No, thanks. I'm Sam, Samantha Summers. Maybe you already know that. 
He shook his head. Jake Corey, he told her. I'm making inquiries around the neighborhood about a situation last night. So you're not here to bust me, huh? For what? Her heavy lips curled into a smile. I'm sure I wouldn't know. Corrupting the staid mentality of miners? You've been doing a lot of that? Some might say so. I'm an associate professor of philosophy at the university. Jake thought, you're joking. Then he thought, why didn't I ever have a prof like this? Maybe I'll sign up, he said. Do that. I'll help open your mind to the imponderables. I could do without imponderables. Sam sat on the carpet in front of him. She lay back, folded her hands behind her head, and began doing sit-ups. Her legs were spread. She touched an elbow to the opposite knee, lowered her back to the floor, curled upward and touched the other elbow to the other knee. How can I help you? she asked without pausing. You could help by stopping that, Jake thought. Did you see this student last night? he asked, and held the photo of Roland above her knees while she sat up three times. He tried to keep his eyes on the back of the picture. Dracula, she said. He thought he was, maybe. He's dead. Sam stopped. She took the photo from Jake and crossed her legs. Dead? He killed at least two people that we know about, maybe more. When I found him last night, he was dead. Well, I saw him. It was sometime after one o'clock, maybe as late as two. Are you sure? He's not a person I'm likely to forget. He used to get on my nerves, following me around the campus. His name's something like Rupert or... Roland, where did you see him? I was out running. I run five miles every night. At one o'clock? I like the night. Where was he? Just up the block. A young man was helping him into his car. The words hit Jake like a blow to the stomach. He seemed pretty out of it. I assumed he was drunk. I see a lot of that around here. Students don't appear very adept at holding their liquor. And somebody was with him? Do you know who it was? Her thick eyebrows lowered. I don't know his name. I do know that he's a graduate student in the English department with a teaching assistantship. Do you know where he lives? Sam shook her head. She handed the photo back to Jake. I have to find him right away. It's urgent. Was he in on the killings? I doubt it. But Roland was... carrying a disease. I need to get to this guy before he infects someone. If I had a school yearbook... You don't have one? Afraid not. Will you be here for a while? I'll stick around. I'll be back in fifteen minutes. Professor Teal didn't come to the door, so Jake hurried around the side of the house and climbed the stairs. He broke the crime scene ribbon, used his lock picks, and let himself inside. Any of the three girls, he thought, might have school yearbooks. But he remembered, from his quick inspection of the house last night, that an entire wall of the attic room was lined with bookshelves. It must be Allison's room, he thought. She had mentioned running downstairs to warn Helen. At the top of the attic stairs, Jake stared at the must bed. This is where it happened, where she woke up and struggled with Roland, where her mauled body would have been found if... Oh, she nailed the bastard good. Hard to imagine that the same girl he found curled at the foot of his bed this morning could be savage enough to inflict such damage on someone. Her purse was on the floor beside Jake's feet. I should get it for her, he thought, and maybe some clothes. There were clothes scattered on the carpet near the purse. White running shoes half covered by knee socks, a rumpled blue blouse, a bra with wispy transparent cups, White shorts with panties still inside them, as if she had pulled both down at the same time. Jake picked up the purse and stood there, staring at the clothes. Less than ten minutes ago, he'd been with Sam. Astonishing Sam in her bandanas and patch. 
but she hadn't affected Jake a fraction as much as the sight of Allison's discarded clothing on the floor. For God's sake, he told himself, this is no time to get turned on. Reluctantly, he looked away. He went to the bed, set the purse down, and searched the bookshelves. In seconds, he found three yearbooks, slim volumes that stood inches taller than most of the other books. He pulled them down. The cover of each was embossed with the title Summit and the Year. The most recent had last year's date. Jake scowled. He wanted the current edition. Then he realized that the summit covering this year probably hadn't been issued yet. The guy better have been enrolled last year, he thought. He tossed the books onto the bed. On his knees, he reached under the bed. He found a suitcase and pulled it out. You shouldn't do this, he told himself. You should get the books over to Sam. It'll just take a minute. If I don't, I'll have to make a special trip. You just want to go through her things, whispered a small voice he didn't like very much. He carried the suitcase to Allison's dresser, set it on the floor, and opened it. In the top drawer of the dresser were nightgowns, panties, and bras. He grabbed a handful of panties, trying not to think about them, and put them quickly into the suitcase. He was tempted not to get any bras for her, felt guilty about that, and took out two. In the next drawer, he found socks, pantyhose, slips. He took only socks. There were sweatshirts, t-shirts, gym shorts, and a jumpsuit in the next drawer. He took a t-shirt, a pair of red shorts, and the jumpsuit. The bottom drawer held sweaters. He didn't bother with them. From her closet, he selected a sleeveless sundress, two blouses, and a pair of faded blue jeans. Then he went to the pile of clothing on the floor. He wanted to see her in the white shorts. He picked them up and shook them until the panties dropped through a leg hole. He watched the panties flutter to the floor. He was proud of himself for not touching them. With the shorts in one hand, he gathered up her shoes and returned to the suitcase. Anything else she might need? He wondered, and scanned the room. He saw the bulletin board on the wall beyond her desk. Snapshots were thumbtacked to it. She won't need those, Jake told himself. Get going. But he wanted to look at them. Wanted to look at Allison. He walked over to the desk. Most of the photos showed Allison, but she was with a guy. The same guy. In one, he was pushing her on a swing. In another, they were sitting on a blanket in the shade of a tree. Another showed them kissing. Jake's stomach hurt. The guy was handsome, in spite of his glasses, and he looked in good shape. This is what I get for snooping, Jake thought. He felt better, however, when he remembered Allison saying she had broken up with her boyfriend last night. This guy had been dumped. Good riddance. Jake hefted the suitcase, picked up Allison's purse and yearbooks, and rushed downstairs. After soaking in the bath for nearly an hour, Allison felt a little better. The hot water had soothed her tight muscles. It had done nothing, however, to take away the deeper tightness, the cold, sick feeling that seemed to grip her insides. If there was only a way to turn off her mind, or change channels, get rid of the bad shows starring Roland and Helen and Celia and the dead policeman and Evan, Turn to the Jake channel. The Jake show was comforting, sometimes exciting. All the others hurt. Allison stepped out of the tub, dripping, and began to dry herself with a soft towel. Everything would be much better if she could just avoid seeing Evan. You have to go. You have to finish it. I don't have any clothes. Allison wanted that for an excuse but she'd had plenty of time to consider the problem and find a solution. She hung the moist towel over a bar and left the bathroom. The air in the hallway felt cool. In Jake's room, the windows were open. A nice breeze came in. She went to the closet, took out a plaid shirt, and put it on. Buttoned, it resembled a dress. 
A short, loose dress, to be sure, but it would have to suffice. She rolled the sleeves up her forearms. Then she found a belt and fastened it around her waist. On the inside of Jake's closet door was a full-length mirror. The shirt didn't look that much like a dress. It looked like a man's shirt. She pulled at it here and there, rearranging the tucks to make it hang more smoothly. Returning to the bathroom, she brushed her teeth using a finger smeared with Jake's toothpaste. Finally, she went into the kitchen. On the wall beside the telephone was a notepad and pen. She tore off a sheet and took it to the table. That's him, Sam said. Jake's heart slammed in his chest. Are you positive? I got a good look at them both. There's no doubt about it. He's the one who is helping Roland into the car. She slid a finger across the page of photographs and stopped it beneath the name. Evan Forbes. Allison's dumped boyfriend. The man in those snapshots on her bulletin board. No need to worry, Jake told himself. They'd split up. But she'd said she would call him, let him know she's okay. What if she tells him where she's staying? I need to use your phone. Help yourself. Jake dialed his home. Come on, pick it up. Come on, Allison, answer the damn phone. It rang fifteen times before he hung up. Do you have a directory? Sam rushed from the room. She ran back, clutching a telephone book, and thrust it at Jake. He flipped through the pages. Forbes was listed. Jake recognized the address, the apartment building in front of which he'd found Roland's car parked last night. He'd already been there, knocking on doors. Thanks, Sam. He ran. He kicked open the door. With a splintering crash, it flew open. The carpet at his feet was crusted with dried blood. Chapter 35 Allison walked the L-shaped parking lot of Wally's, looking for Evan's car. It wasn't there. Nor was it parked along the street. She had left the house at one o'clock, giving herself half an hour to reach the bar. Though she didn't have a wristwatch, she guessed that the walk must have taken no more than fifteen or twenty minutes, and that she was early. To make herself as inconspicuous as possible, she wandered out of the parking lot and headed for one of the elms that lined the street. The grass felt soft and cool under her bare feet. The shade felt good. With her back to the tree, she took a deep, shaky breath. She was trembling badly. She could see her legs trembling. They were out in front of her, knees locked to brace her against the tree, thighs pressed together. From the bottom of the shirt to her kneecaps, her skin shimmied over the fluttering muscles. As she watched the shaking, a corner of her shirt tail was lifted by a puff of breeze. She swept it down and held the shirt front flat against her thighs. Through the fabric, her open hands could feel tremors. Just calm down, she told herself. There's no reason to be so jumpy. I'm just going to have a talk with Evan. It's not like I'm about to get my teeth pulled without benefit of anesthetic. Maybe Evan's already inside. He might have walked over. I could stay here, fretting for an hour, while he's inside, drinking and thinking I stood him up. Well, I'm not going in. Bad enough I had to walk over here dressed this way. Undressed this way. At least I didn't run into anyone I know. But even at this hour... Wally's was bound to be loaded with students, and Allison was bound to know many of them. As if to prove her theory, a station wagon slowed in front of the parking lot entrance and started to turn. She spotted Terry Weathers through the passenger window. Luckily, Terry was looking the other way. Allison quickly sidestepped, circling to the other side of the tree. I should have stayed home is what I should have done. She heard the car crunch over gravel and stop. The doors bumped shut. She heard footsteps heading away. 
Then the windy sound of another approaching car. Her head snapped to the left. Coming up the street was Evan's blue Granada. It swung to the curb in front of her and stopped. Leaning across the seat, Evan opened the passenger door. You're early, he said. Using both hands to hold the shirt tails down, she climbed into the car. The seat upholstery was hot against her bare rump. Raising herself, she swept the shirt down beneath her. She kept her eyes away from Evan. What are you wearing? All I could find. What is that? A guy's shirt? She faced Evan. His hair was neatly combed and he was dressed for the heat in a glossy Hawaiian shirt, white shorts, and sandals. He looked good except for his sallow skin and bloodshot eyes. The eyes had a feverish glaze. Allison didn't like the way they stared down through his glasses, studying her. Take a picture, why don't you? I could use a drink, he muttered. Let's stay here. I really don't feel like going inside. It'll be noisy and... Aren't you hungry? People will ask questions. About last night. You said it was on the radio. It's terrible, he said. What happened to you last night? He peered at her face. You got beat up pretty good. Yeah. But you look great. Sure. You do. A bruise hath no power to diminish the beauty of so sweet a flower. Thanks. Let's at least get something to eat, okay? We can go someplace that has a drive-up window, so you won't have to worry about meeting anyone. Couldn't we just talk here? I'm famished, Al. Really. I haven't eaten all day. He made a grim smile. I didn't have any appetite, but I'm feeling a lot better now. Your being here? I feel like I've been brought back from the dead. I guess it's all right if we pick up something, Allison told him. Great! He started to drive. The front door of Jake's house wasn't chained. He stepped inside, sensing that Allison was gone. He called her name as he hurried through the rooms. In the bathroom, he found his bathrobe and Allison's nightgown hanging from a hook. In the kitchen, he found a note. It was on the table, folded in half to stand upright. Dear Jake, I had to go out for a little while to see my old boyfriend. I know I was supposed to stay here, but he needs to see me. I'm sure it will be okay, since I'm meeting him at Wally's. There will be plenty of other people around. So please don't worry. I'll probably be back before you see this, but thought I'd leave a note anyway, just in case you dropped by early and wondered what happened to me. Please don't worry. I'll be back as soon as possible. Believe me, the sooner the better. This was just something that I had to do. Allison Cold and numb inside, Jake lurched to the kitchen phone and dialed directory assistance. He got the number for Wally's, called, and asked for Allison Sanders to be paged. She doesn't seem to be here, he was told after a long wait. He hung up and raced to his car. The note didn't say what time she had left for Wally's, maybe only a few minutes ago. Maybe hours ago. If she'd walked, she might still be on the way over there. Jake tried to take her most likely route. He scanned the sidewalks for pedestrians. Evan might have picked her up, he thought. No. The note said she was meeting him at Wally's. So she walked. Unless she got a friend to pick her up. That could be it. She called a girlfriend. Asked the girl to bring over some spare clothes and give her a lift to the bar. Maybe the friend will stay with her. Allison's not at Wally's. So maybe she's still on the way over. Please. She might have been there and left. By now, she might be on her way home. Stupid, wishful thinking. Evan has that fucker up his back, and he isn't going to let Allison get away. Maybe Evan's not the guy she went to see. He is.
but maybe he doesn't have the thing in him. Then what was that blood on his apartment floor? Roland, half dead, must have staggered up to Evan's door. When Evan opened up, the thing burst out of Roland's belly and nailed him. It took control, got Evan to haul the dead or dying Roland down to the VW. Sam saw them, just thought Roland was plastered. Why no blood on the sidewalk? The thing is clever. Maybe it got Evan to bandage the wounds before carrying Roland out. The fire took care of the bandages. Evan's got it, all right. And Evan's got Allison. Evan handed Allison the bags containing their soft drinks, cheeseburgers, and french fries. She held them on her lap, glad to have more than her shirt tails for covering. In spite of his frequent glances in that direction, he'd acted all right during the drive over. Allison's jitters had subsided, though she still dreaded telling him that she wouldn't go with him after today. She would postpone that moment for as long as possible. Evan pulled away from the drive-up window. Instead of turning in front of the restaurant to circle around to its parking area, he continued ahead and swung onto the road. Why don't we eat in the parking lot? Allison asked. That'd be kind of dreary. Let's drive someplace nice. We can have a picnic. Evan? Don't worry. I'll be a perfect gentleman. He smiled at her. A corner of his mouth trembled. No more touchy-feely. Not unless you start it. I'm a slow learner, but I finally got the message. I've put our relationship in too much jeopardy already. Here you are, convinced I'm some kind of a sex fiend. Well, I'm not. You'll see. From now on, it's hands off. Consider me a eunuch. Too late for that, Allison thought. I came so close to losing you last night. My boorish behavior, then the attack on you? I had to face how much you mean to me, what it would be like if I never saw you again. I love you so much, Allison. I'll never again do anything to make you doubt me. We'll see how it goes today, she said. A test? I've always passed my tests with flying colors. Allison settled back into the car seat. She believed him. The lunch would go smoothly. He would make the sacrifice today, knowing this was his last chance. Be a good boy, and there would be plenty of future opportunities to make up for it. So he thought. He's no mind reader. He doesn't know that... Regardless of how wonderfully he behaves, this is it. By the time he finds out, it'll be over. He steered onto Latham Road. Where are we going? Allison asked. Just out of town a little way. We'll have a picnic, all right? Just like old times. Except no fooling around. What'll it be? The bartender asked. I called earlier about Allison Sanders, Jake said. Right. She wasn't here. Do you know her? Not the name. Maybe if I saw her. Shaking his head, Jake started to turn away. You said Allison Sanders? Jake faced a slim young man who was seated on the bar stool beside him, nursing a martini. He looked rather old to be a student. Do you know her? I just met her a few days ago. Are you a friend? Jake showed the man his badge. I'm also a friend. I need to find her fast. She said she was coming over here today. Well, she was here. Around one thirty or a quarter till two. I was just arriving. In fact, I'd come here in hopes of seeing her. He shrugged. She was with someone else. I just caught a glimpse of her getting into his car. Did you see who she was with? I wasn't looking at the driver. Did you tear your eyes away from Allison long enough to notice the car? Jake asked, not bothering to hide his annoyance. A dark blue four-door. I'm not good with cars. 
I do know that it wasn't a compact. It had a rather squarish shape along the lines of a Mercedes. License number? I didn't notice. Nothing suspicious was going on. Why would I look at the license plate? Did you see the car leave? Jake asked. It was still sitting at the curb when I came in here. This was about 1.45? Give or take. Jake checked his watch. Ten after two. Rushing out of Wally's, he squinted against the sudden glare of daylight and ran to the street. He looked both ways. No blue car. He leaned sideways against a tree trunk. Twenty fucking minutes. If he'd just been quicker. Groaning, he rammed his elbow hard against the trunk. Evan slowed the car. As he started to turn, Allison spied a sign on the other side of the narrow road. The Oakwood Inn. He's taking me to the Oakwood. Allison felt herself sinking, going down and down, dropping into an abyss. It's happening, she thought. Oh, dear Jesus, it's happening. It is the thing that wants me. I took care of Roland. I can take care of Evan. Jesus, I'm going to die. Maybe Evan just picked this place by accident, just took the first side road that looked interesting. Hey, look, he said. A restaurant. Allison nodded. Looks like we're the only ones here. It's closed, Allison said. Her voice came out a whisper. It's where those people were killed. Really? He sounded surprised. Well then, I guess nobody will mind if we use the parking lot. He steered toward the front of the restaurant. Allison lifted the bags of food off her lap. Leaning forward, she set them on the floor between her legs. Evan stopped the car no more than a yard from the porch stairs. So this is where it happened, he said. I wonder if we could get inside. It might be kind of fascinating, wouldn't it? Explore the scene of the crime? Maybe after we eat. She faced him. She stared into his intense bloodshot eyes. What's wrong? he asked. I've been so rotten to you, Evan. All my dumb nonsense. Not wanting you to... It all seems so stupid and petty now. I mean, I was almost killed last night. That sort of thing. It makes a person... It made me take a long look at what's important and what isn't. All that really matters is caring for another person. Loving another person. So why have I been putting us both through all this... This shit? Will you forgive me? She put a hand on his shoulder. You're kidding, he said, and let out a tiny nervous laugh. This is part of the test or something. Forget all that. There's no test. I want it to be like it was between us. Really? Really? She eased him closer. Clear of the steering wheel, Evan turned to her. She kissed his mouth. She put her arms around his back. The bulge beneath his shirt felt huge. Her whimper of despair must have sounded passionate to Evan. He clasped a hand over her breast and squeezed. His other hand moved up her thigh. She opened her legs. Shuddering as he stroked her, she muttered, I've missed you so much. Missed the feel of you. She caressed his shorts. His penis felt hard and big. He squirmed as she fondled it. His breathing was ragged. I'll get the blanket, darling. Is it in the trunk? He nodded. Allison pulled the key from the ignition. Bring the food, she said. We'll eat afterward. You're something else, he said. I was such an idiot. I never should have screwed things up between us, but that's over. She climbed from the car. 
she stepped behind the trunk. Through the rear window, she saw Evan lean over to pick up the food bags. She whirled and flung the car keys with all her strength toward the weeds at the side of the parking lot. Then she sprinted over the hot pavement, heading for the road out. It was like last night, running from Roland. But this time there was no police car nearby as a goal. Allison could only hope to stay ahead of Evan, to reach Latham Road. Maybe, there, someone in a passing car would stop and help her. She wasn't even out of the parking lot yet. She pumped her arms. She flung her legs out. Her bare feet were slapping the pavement. She knew she was moving fast. She could feel her hair flying behind her, her shirt tails flapping. She could hear Evan's shoes pounding behind her. He had chased her before, always in fun, always catching her easily. But she had never run from him like this. She felt as if she had never run so fast in her life. Now she heard not only his shoes, but his huffing breath. He's gaining on me. Tucking her chin down, she pistoned her arms and tried to hurl out her legs even faster than before. She made it to the parking lot entrance, onto the road that led to Latham. Evan was tight on her back. Leave me alone, she yelled. He smashed her between the shoulder blades. Allison plunged forward in a crazed dance of flinging arms and wild legs. Then she was off her feet. She slammed the pavement, hit it with palms and knees. It knocked away her arms and legs. It punched out her breath. She skidded to a stop. She couldn't get air and her skin burned, but she started to scurry up again. Evan kicked an arm out from under her. She landed hard on her side. Evan grabbed the numb arm and pulled. He lifted her. He swung her over his shoulder, turned around, and stumbled back across the lot. Chapter 36 Jake sat in his car in the parking lot at Wally's, his forehead resting on the steering wheel. Don't just sit there, he told himself. Go after her, damn it! Sure thing. Go where? Try Evan's apartment. He wouldn't take her there. Not enough privacy for what he has in mind. Eating her. God. Think! The apartment is out. He'd take her someplace secluded, where he wouldn't have to worry about neighbors hearing anything. Where he could work on her secretly for a long time. A field, maybe. Or an abandoned building. And which abandoned building would that be, you dumb asshole? You could have been there by now. Evan's shoulder bounced against Allison's belly as he rushed up the restaurant's porch stairs. He stopped in front of the door. One of his arms went away from Allison, but the other stayed clamped like a tight bar across the backs of her knees, pinning her legs against his body. He got the door open and carried her inside. The door banged shut. He took a few steps, then bent at the waist to unload her. Allison felt herself start to fall. As she flopped off his shoulder, she reached up fast and grabbed the back of his head. For a moment, she held herself up. Then Evan knocked her arm away. He kept her legs pinned until her back slammed the floor. Her head snapped down and hit the hardwood. Evan bent over her. He tore open her shirt, spread its front, and stepped back. He stared down at her. His mouth hung open. He was panting for air. Allison lay there, stunned from the blow and straining to breathe. She wanted to close her shirt. She couldn't lift her arms. Beautiful he said, gasping for air. Gotcha now, huh? Beautiful, deceitful cunt. He suddenly flinched, squeezing his eyes shut. He grimaced. His back stiffened, and he writhed as if possessed by a terrible ecstasy. He swayed and moaned. Saliva dribbled down his chin. He rubbed his penis through the bulging front of his shorts. Allison gazed up at him. He was out of it, caught up in his frenzy. Now, she thought vaguely, B-12.
before he comes out of it. Move. She found the strength to roll over. She thrust her burning hands and knees against the floor and pushed herself up. Evan grabbed her ankles. He yanked her legs straight. Her belly slapped the floor. Still holding her ankles, he crossed them, twisting them savagely. Allison flipped onto her back. Oh, you're not going anywhere. No party without you. He took a step backward. He wiped his slick chin with the back of a wrist. Then he unbuttoned his shirt. He shrugged it from his shoulders and it fluttered to the floor. He wore a patch of gauze and tape just to the left of his navel. A band of purple skin at the edge of the patch angled across his belly and around his side. On his belt was a black case. Allison watched his hand move to the case. He popped open its flap. He slid out a folding knife. He pried out the blade. It locked rigid with a metallic click. Staring down at Allison with half-shut eyes, he licked a flat side of the blade. Do I taste Celia? Yes, I believe I do. A saucy wench, but tender. He lapped the other side of the blade. Crouching, he leaned over Allison. The blade was cool and wet on her thigh. He turned it over and wiped the other side on her skin. With a flick of his wrist, he nicked her. She flinched. Ah, oh, did that hurt? For shame. Poor, poor Allison. He rubbed her cut. The back of his hand came up smeared red. He licked it and sighed. Allison felt blood trickle down her inner thigh. Evan stood up. Twisting at the hips, he threw the knife behind him. It thunked on the floor. Plenty of time later for that, Evan said. Gotta ream you with something else first. He opened his belt buckle. He unbuttoned the waist of his white shorts and lowered the zipper. The shorts dropped around his ankles. He was wearing tight red briefs. The front jutted with the push of his erection. He slid his thumbs under the elastic at his hips. Allison lashed out with her foot, catching his left shin. Evan staggered backward, arms waving, feet tangling in the shorts. He started to fall. Allison flung herself over. She shoved at the floor, got to her hands and knees and scurried up, staggering. In front of her was the bar. She threw her hands against its edge to catch herself. She spun around. Evan had freed himself of the shorts. He was crouched. He sprang at her. Allison lunged to the right. Straight ahead was the main dining area. Straight ahead, at the end of a long stretch of bare floor, was a window. Crash through it? That might kill her. But better the window than Evan. Too far, anyway. Evan was already too close behind her, his shoes thudding on the floor, breath hissing. She dodged around the corner, had a moment to see the clutter on the floor. Cans, rags, toolbox, vacuum cleaner, ladder. A moment to wonder if she could leap clear. Evan hit her. His head pounded her rump. His arms wrapped her thighs. His diving tackle drove her forward and down. She cried out as her body crashed to the floor. Cans overturned. One stayed under her hip. Another pushed at her belly. The edges of the open toolbox dug into her chest. Her left breast was inside the toolbox, pressing cold steel. Evan squirmed off her. He pulled her by the ankles. As the edge of the toolbox scraped the underside of her breast, she hooked her left arm around the box. It skidded along the floor. Evan stopped dragging her. He clutched her hips. Growling with effort or rage, he lifted her off the toolbox, swung her sideways and dropped her. Falling, Allison hugged her belly and turned her face away from the floor. The impact wasn't as bad as she expected. For a few moments, nothing happened. Allison lay there, gasping. 
Evan was nearby, but out of sight as long as she didn't turn her face the other way. She heard him move closer. A hand curled over her right shoulder. Another hand hooked her right hip. He tugged at her. She rolled onto her side, rolled onto her back, and kept rolling, opening the arms folded across her belly as she came up onto her left side, facing Evan, who was crouched on the floor naked, who was staring at her breasts, and not at her right hand, not at the screwdriver she'd taken from the toolbox. She rammed it into him. It hit him just under the sternum and punched in deep. The force of the blow sent him tumbling backward. Knees in the air, he stared bug-eyed at the ceiling. His mouth was a rictus of agony. He made whiny, sucking noises, struggling to breathe. A palsied hand pulled at the screwdriver. Its blade started to slide out, but was still deep inside him when his hand gave a spastic jerk wrenching the screwdriver sideways. His body lurched, heels driving against the floor, thrusting his pelvis high and higher as he yanked the blade the rest of the way out. Allison had begun to get up while she watched his contortions. She was still on the floor, turning his way, braced on a stiff arm, drawing in her legs, when Evan freed the screwdriver and hurled himself over, twisting trying to grab her. She lurched back. Evan's arm swung down as his side struck the floor. The tip of the screwdriver buried itself in the wood an inch from her hip. Allison scooted farther away. Turning over, she crawled toward the toolbox. She watched over her shoulder and saw Evan yank the screwdriver from the floor. He was flat on his belly, writhing. She took a claw hammer from the toolbox. Evan still squirmed on the floor. She crawled back to him. His twitching arms and legs shuddered against the floor as if he were trying to push himself up. Stay down! Allison was gasping. She raised the hammer overhead. Stay down or I'll bash your fucking skull! She stared at the bruise that curled around from his side to his back. The discolored skin over his spine all the way to the nape of his neck, bulged out almost an inch. It's that... thing, Allison thought. She remembered Jake's warnings. If Evan dies, the thing will come out, and come after me. Well, he's not dead yet. The screwdriver dropped from his hand. He tried to pick it up again, but his jumpy fingers flicked it and sent it rolling. Allison got to her feet. She was trembling badly and her legs threatened to give out. Ready to fall, she staggered backward to the ladder, dropped the hammer, and grabbed one of the upper rungs to hold herself up. Evan still writhed on the floor, but not so much anymore. She would need to go around his body to reach the front door. He was in no shape to stop her now. She let go of the ladder, took a single step, and flinched rigid as blood exploded from the nape of Evan's neck. The creature surged up through the red spray, sliding out of Evan, darting across his shoulder blade, dropping to the floor, streaking toward Allison's feet. She lurched backward, bumped the ladder, got a heel onto its first rung, grabbed the side rails behind her with both hands and climbed. The ladder wobbled. She was only two steps up by the time the creature reached the foot of the ladder. Gazing down at the monstrosity, she moved one rung higher, then clung there, gasping. The creature slowly circled into a coil. It resembled a snake, but with its slimy, undulating flesh. To Allison, the thing looked more like a two-foot length of intestine, where Evan's blood had rubbed off. It was pale yellow and webbed with veins. One end of the thing rose from the center of the coil, not a head so much as an opening, a garden hose with teeth. The opening flattened shut, and Allison saw the dull gray globs of its eyes. The eyes seemed to gaze up at her, 
seemed to desire her. Allison's skin crawled. She glanced at herself. The open shirt hung off one shoulder. She had never felt so naked, so exposed, so vulnerable. She ached to close the shirt and clamp a hand between her legs, but stood frozen, clutching the sides of the ladder. The creature stretched upward, uncoiling, and half its length dropped onto the ladder's bottom rung. Its lower end squirmed and flipped. In an instant, the entire length of the creature was stretched along the aluminum step. Whimpering, Allison climbed higher. As Jake's car shot over the crest of the road, he saw the Oakwood parking lot. A blue car was parked near the restaurant's front door. Let me be in time, please. His car flew and dropped, pounding the downgrade. Let me be in time, his mind shrieked. Please! It had taken so damn long. He'd driven as fast as he could, sped through intersections without regard for red lights or stop signs, twice barely avoiding collisions. But it had taken so long. Five minutes? Closer to ten. Oh, God, please, let her be all right. The thing kept coming. It kept coming. Allison climbed higher, but so did it, and it seemed to get better at swinging itself from one rung to the next. Allison sat on the head step at the ladder's peak and clutched its edges and stared down between her knees. She was sobbing. The thing was a vile, jaundiced blur through her tears. It flopped onto the next rung. With a whine of despair, Allison carefully let go of the edges and stood up. She climbed backward, arms out for balance. One step, then one more. Then she was standing on the very top of the ladder. She teetered as it wobbled from side to side. When the motion eased, she spread her feet apart and bent her knees to keep her balance. Peering down, she watched the creature mount the rung where her feet had been only seconds earlier. One more, and it would be on the step below the top. From there, Allison heard the roar of a car engine. A car! It was coming here! It had to be! Somehow, Jake had figured out. God, I hope it's Jake! Her mind flashed an image of him bursting through the door and blasting the worm fucker to hell. Brakes squealed. The corner of the wall blocked her view of the front door. Help! she yelled. Then she looked down. The creature was already on the next step. The ring of its mouth flattened shut, and its gray phlegm eyes seemed to peer up between her legs. The body stretched and contracted. The head slowly lifted from the rung. The mouth reopened. The body tensed. The head swayed, ready to strike. Allison leaped. She kicked her right leg far out, shoved off with her left foot, hoping to knock the ladder over, and dropped. She fell for a long time, fell toward Evan's sprawled body. Her feet hit the floor. Her knees folded. She tumbled forward, outflung hands slapping Evan's back. Her left hand slipped on the blood. As she smashed down on him, something slopped onto her back. Something long and squirmy. Rushing up the porch stairs, Jake heard a wild scream. He threw open the door. The restaurant seemed dark after the brilliant afternoon sunlight. He snapped his head from side to side. He saw no one, just a knife standing upright, blade embedded in the floor near his feet. But he heard someone sobbing, then quick footfalls. He whirled to the left, swinging up his revolver. Allison charged around the corner. Her face was twisted with panic. She clawed the air with one hand as if reaching for Jake. Her other arm was up. Elbow high beside her head, hand behind her back. Her open shirt followed her like a fluttering cape as she ran. Jake lunged sideways to get a clear shot past Allison.
but nobody chased her around the corner. It's on me, she cried out. In me. She twirled around in front of Jake. The thick, yellowish thing at the small of her back whipped from side to side like a grotesque, misplaced tail. Jake dropped his gun. He clutched Allison's shoulder to hold her still. With his left hand, he caught the flipping creature and tugged. His hand slipped off its slimy, yielding flesh. He caught it again. Wrapping his hand around it, he felt it moving deeper into Allison. He clenched it with his fist and yanked. Allison shrieked in agony and staggered backward. The creature didn't come off. No! Jake shouted. He threw Allison to the floor. He jerked the shirt from her shoulders and flung it aside, then dropped onto her writhing body. Sitting on her buttocks, he tore the knife from the floor. He grabbed the beast, wrapped his left hand around its flaccid, slick body, and pulled it taut. The length of it stretched and thinned, but it kept moving into Allison. The lump under her skin was three inches long and growing longer. He stabbed Allison in the back. She yelped, went rigid, dug her fingernails into the floor. The tip of the blade entered the tunneling front of the bulge. Jake was careful not to stab deep. Half an inch, no more. Blood and a thick yellow syrup flowed from the gash. He drew the blade down, splitting Allison's skin until it parted at the hole, then tore the creature from her back. Got it! He yelled in triumph. Allison, crying, rolled onto her back and looked up through her tears as Jake leaped to his feet. In one hand was the bloody knife, in the other was the beast. He whirled around, swinging it overhead like a whip. Yellow stuff flew from its ripped body. He lashed it against the wall near the door. It left a dripping smear. He swung it high and whipped it down against the floor. He stomped it with one foot, then with both feet, jumping up and down on the thing until it was mashed flat. Bending over it, he scraped it up with the edge of his knife. He carried it through the door. Jake? He didn't answer. Allison pushed herself up. She crawled to the doorway, wincing as pain swarmed from her ripped back. She grabbed the frame and rose to her knees. Holding on, she watched Jake run to the rear of his car, the flat thing swaying and dripping at his side. She was hurting and still frightened. She felt blood streaming down her back and buttocks, running down the backs of her legs. She didn't want to be left alone. Take care of me, Jake. I need you. Shit, she told herself. Don't be a baby. He saved your ass. Let him finish this. He took a red can of gasoline from the trunk of his car. He carried the mashed carcass a few yards, dropped it, and doused it with gas. He emptied the can onto it. A puddle spread over the pavement. Wait! Allison called. She pulled herself up. She staggered onto the porch. Jake waved her away, but she shook her head. Setting down the gas can, he rushed toward her. He leaped onto the porch and put an arm around her back. Allison, he said. She held on to him. With Jake bracing her up, she climbed down the stairs. He led her to his car. She leaned against the driver's door, then slid down it and squatted as Jake hurried over to the wet patch on the parking lot. He struck a match and touched it to the gasoline. As the pale flames rose, he came back to Allison. He squatted beside her. She put a hand on his knee. He looked at her. What happened to Evan? I killed him. Jake nodded and turned his gaze toward the fire. Greasy black smoke swirled up from the remains of the creature. Allison heard sizzling, popping sounds. When a breeze tore away the shroud of smoke, 
she glimpsed a bubbling black smear on the pavement. Jake curled a hand behind Allison's head and softly stroked her hair. They watched until the fire burned out. Chapter 37 Jake bent over the bed and kissed her. He stroked the back of her head. Nighty-night, honey. Do you want a record on? Not now, Kimmy said, arching an eyebrow. We are not ready. We're busy. Busy, huh? Well... He leered at her ear and licked his lips. Some mayo. No! She hunched up her shoulder. She pressed Clue to her ear. No, ear witch! I mean it! But I'm hungry. You're going to have popcorn, and you'd better save me some. We'll see. She turned to Allison, who was sitting beside her on the bed. I'll get saved some, won't I? Sure, Allison said. Kimmy gave Jake a haughty look. Allison will make sure of it. Grinning, Jake said, Good night, honey, and left the room. Allison lifted the open book off her lap. Now, where were we? Let's see. Pooh and Piglet were tracking the woozle through the snow. She started to read, but Kimmy placed a small hand on the page, covering the paragraph. She looked up into Allison's eyes. Are you going to be here all the time? she asked. I don't know. Well, all your stuff's here. Yeah, it is. Allison put a hand on the girl's back. As long as my stuff's here, I guess I'll be here. Do you think that's okay? I think so, she replied, frowning and nodding. Cause, you know, I like how you read. You read a lot better than Daddy. And you know what else? When Daddy used to take me to the Muji's and I had to go pee, she covered her mouth and tittered. Pressing a tiny shoulder against Allison, she tilted her head back and took her hand away and whispered, He made me go in the wrong John, and there were men peeing in the sinks. It was so gross. In the sinks? Yes! Well, I guess I'd better not let him take you to the Muji's anymore without me. No more without you. Allison closed the book. Now I'd better let you get some sleep. We need to get up bright and early for the zoo. Think we'll see a woozle? One never knows about woozles. Allison got up. She slipped the book onto the shelf while Kimmy crawled between the sheets. Allison tucked her in, then knelt beside the bed. Kimmy tucked Clue into the top of her nightgown. Gonna say your prayers? Allison asked. Kimmy grinned. No, you. Do that one you told me, the spooky one. Maybe you should do a nice one. I don't want to be a corrupting influence. I want the spooky one, Kimmy insisted. Well, all right. Allison shut her eyes and folded her hands on the mattress. From ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties and things that go bump in the night, oh, Lord, deliver us. I like it, Kimmy said. Sleep tight. She started to get up. You forgot to kiss me. Allison bent over Kimmy. The girl's arms wrapped around her neck pulling her down with a tight hug. From the force of it, Allison expected a hard, mashing kiss, but Kimmy's lips pushed against her mouth with such lingering tenderness that tears came into her eyes. See you in the morning, sweetheart, she said as she stood up. Don't forget to save me some popcorn. Never fear. Do you want the record on? Side two. Allison flipped the record and turned on the stereo. She dimmed the lamp on Kimmy's table, looked back at her with Clue tucked into the neck of her nightgown and one arm around Cookie Monster, waved, and left the room. 
At the entrance to the living room, she saw Jake on the sofa. A huge bowl of popcorn rested on the cushion beside him. There were two glasses of cola on the table at his knees. Instead of joining him, she went into the kitchen. She took one of Kimmy's cereal bowls from a drawer. It had Charlie Brown and Snoopy on it. She carried it into the living room, bent over the large bowl and started scooping popcorn in. Boy, she's got you well trained, Jake said. My word is my bond. She carried Kimmy's serving into the kitchen, left it on the counter, and returned. She'd been hot in her robe. Jake watched as she took it off. She was wearing a red jersey nightshirt she had bought that day at the university store. What do you think? She asked, turning in front of him. Nice, though I have a certain attachment for your blue negligee. It brings back some bad memories. Not for me. Then I'll wear it once in a while. She lifted the popcorn bowl and sat down beside Jake. The nightshirt was very short. She felt the sofa upholstery against her bare skin. Her stomach fluttered. For an instant, she was sliding into the seat of Evan's car, the shirt tails too short to cover her buttocks. What's the matter? Jake asked. He was so quick to notice the slightest changes in her moods. A little flashback. I'm sorry. She mugged at him. It's not your fault. I just hate to see you upset. I know. She set the popcorn bowl on her lap. It felt warm against her bare thighs. It's just that you look so woebegone when you sorry me. Have some popcorn. He dug in a big hand and took out a fistful. So what's our double feature? Halloween and the hills have eyes. Fantastic! I bet you've already seen them. Of course, Allison said. They do have such things as comedies at the video store. They're not nearly as much fun. Jake grinned, shook his head, and tumbled some popcorn into his mouth. Amazing, he said, after chewing for a moment. It really doesn't bother you, watching this kind of thing, after what happened? The movies are pretend. I'd think they might give you flashbacks. They do, sometimes, but all kinds of things do. It's only been three weeks. Three great weeks, Jake said. Yeah. She watched Jake munch some more popcorn. She took a handful, tossed some into her mouth, and flinched. Ow! Jake looked at her, startled. It's too damn hot to eat. Now he looked perplexed. Allison lifted the bowl off her lap, leaned forward, and set it on the table. I think we'd better let it cool off for a while, don't you? We don't want to burn our tongues while we watch the movies. Oh, right. Jake blushed. Allison pulled the nightshirt over her head. Facing him, she began to open the buttons of his pajama shirt. He swallowed the remains of his popcorn. He stared into her eyes. His gaze roamed downward, lingering on her naked body. Allison watched his hands move slowly toward her until his fingertips trembled against her breasts. The hand that had held the popcorn felt grainy with salt and slick. Whoops, he whispered. He took the hand away and rubbed it on his pajama pants, leaving an oily smear. The oil and butter on Allison's breast gleamed in the lamplight. You'd better lick it clean, she said. He did. As his tongue lapped and swirled, Allison slipped the shirt down his arms. She gasped and arched her back when he sucked. Then his mouth went to her mouth, and his arms went around her. Allison fell sideways against the sofa back and stretched her legs under the table. Jake pushed his tongue into her mouth. She tugged the waistband of his pajamas. The snaps popped open, and she pulled at the pajamas until he was bare against her, smooth and hard. His tongue left her mouth. 
He kissed her lips, her chin, the side of her neck. His hands roamed, caressing her shoulder blades, gliding down, curling over her buttocks, moving up again. They stayed away from the middle of her spine. Gently clutching his hair, Allison eased his head away and looked into his eyes. You never touch me. There. His eyebrows lifted slightly. Where it was. I guess not, he whispered. Allison could feel his penis shrinking against her thigh. Does it disgust you? No. God, no. <laughs> Nothing about you disgusts me. It was in me. Nothing's in there now. I watched the doctor clean the wound and... But you're afraid to touch me there. No, I'm not. Scared you'll catch something? I don't want to hurt you. It's healed. All but the scar. You want me to touch it? Not if you don't want to. It isn't that, he muttered, looking miserable. What is it? I did it to you. I stabbed you, cut you open, I hurt you. And when I see the wound or touch it, it all comes back. How you cried out and jumped and dug your nails into the floor. It all comes back how much I hurt you. You mean it's guilt? Just guilt? You might say that. Dipshit, you saved my life. Allison pressed her cheek to his and held him tight. I look at it in the mirror. It's special, Jake. It's you cutting into me and taking out the nightmare. His fingertips trembled against the flesh of Allison's wound. They gently followed the length of it. They tickled, and she squirmed. Does it hurt? No. Does this? Jake moaned. Let's knock off all this small talk, Allison said. The popcorn's getting cold and we've still got a double feature to watch. <laughs> what am I? Jake asked. The coming attraction? Allison laughed and swung a leg over his hip. The preceding audiobook presentation was produced and copyrighted by Audio Realms Inc. and may not be copied, reproduced, nor distributed in any way without express written permission. For additional titles by this author or others, specifically in the genres of science fiction, fantasy, and horror, please visit our website at www.audiorealms.com or for downloadable products, www.theaudiobookshop.com. Audio Realms, sci-fi, fantasy, and horror for your mind. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.